with an heavy tidiness, for which I called upon the house and the nation. When war broke out in 1939, as Nazi tanks stormed across the Polish border, it would have been virtually impossible to predict just how far-reaching the consequences of Adolf Hitler's actions would be. By the winter of 1943, from the north, south, east and west, the battle cries rang out across the globe and the atrocities visited upon innocent civilians, particularly those of the Jewish faith, became ever more horrifically apparent. But as Hitler's Axis powers crushed and subjugated entire populations, news of Nazi and Japanese crimes against humanity served to fuel Allied determination to win the war as quickly as possible. The plight of those held in concentration camps was no longer hidden from view. And although it would still be some considerable time before surviving inmates would be liberated, there was now at least hope for some of them. What's more, as October 1943 drew to a close, a formal Allied agreement to set up a United Nations Commission on War Crimes was put in place. Those responsible for atrocities would be called upon to account for their actions and following orders would be no defence. The months of October, November and December 1943 saw the culmination of many campaigns and the foundations were laid for many more. Events in the Pacific were rapidly gathering momentum two years on from the surprise Japanese attack on the American naval fleet at Pearl. Without doubt, the devastating efficiency of Japan's air force makes this one of the most well-known offensives of the entire Second World War, but through the course of this chapter, you'll discover that there were also many less well-known skirmishes in the Pacific that were equally fascinating. As well as considering these events in the Pacific, we'll also be focusing on the Allied campaign in Italy, following on from victory over Hitler's troops in North Africa. And all the while, the conflict in Russia was becoming ever more significant, particularly as alliances shifted in the build-up to the Cairo and Tehran conferences as the blueprint for the Allies' endgame took shape. So, beginning on October 1st, 1943, new challenges take us to Italy, where Allied forces entered the harbour city of Naples. The complex politics of Italy and the nation's position in World War II meant that the people of Naples had already revolted against the German army of occupation before the Allies arrived. However, to get a true understanding of the events in Italy in 1943, we really need to backtrack to the end of the First World War. Just as Adolf Hitler rose to prominence in Germany in the aftermath of World War I, in Italy, Benito Mussolini followed a very similar route to power. 
born in 1883, the son of a blacksmith, Mussolini moved to Switzerland in 1902 in search of work and it was here that he became involved in socialist politics. When he returned to Italy in 1904, it was to become a journalist with a socialist publication, but he broke away from the socialists when they opposed Italy's entry into World War I, and when he was drafted in 1915, Mussolini took up arms for his country. In all, Mussolini saw about nine months active service, but in the years after the war, he returned to the political arena, this time not as a socialist, but by forming the Fascist Party early in 1919. Like Adolf Hitler in Germany, Mussolini believed he would be his nation's savior. Where discontent was rife, he found his supporters. Many unemployed war veterans followed where Mussolini led, were organized into squads of black shirts who terrorized their political opponents. It was the beginning of a dark age of oppression for the Italian people, and when the fascists were invited to join a coalition government in 1921, things went from bad to worse when the black shirts marched on Rome. Even the king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, turned to Mussolini, inviting the self-styled Il Duce to form a government with disastrous consequences, as by 1925, democracy had been dismantled. Italy found itself in the grip of a dictator every bit as unpredictable as Adolf Hitler was becoming in Germany. After the Wall Street crash of 1929 saw the world fall into an economic depression, the 1930s found both Hitler and Mussolini's empire building at an alarming rate. In Mussolini's case, Abyssinia, today better known as Ethiopia, was the main target. As well as gaining inroads into Africa, Mussolini also supported General Franco in the Spanish Civil War, and more importantly, cooperated with Hitler and Nazi Germany to such a degree that it culminated in May 1939 in their Pact of Steel as World War II loomed large. Italy formally entered World War II on the 10th of June 1940, officially signing up to the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Japan on the 27th of September of that same year in Berlin. Under Mussolini's leadership, however, Italy was far from being a strong military nation and as early as 1941 had suffered multiple defeats in Greece and at the hands of the British in North Africa. Ironically, without German intervention, Mussolini and the Italian army would have faced a catastrophic military collapse for the people of Italy. Confidence in Il Duce was shaken, if not stirred. Despite Mussolini's pre-World War II activity in Africa, the Italians were defeated in the desert along with the Germans under the command of Erwin Rommel. And naturally, once soldiers of the calibre of the British General Bernard Montgomery had secured North Africa, the Allies looked towards Italy as the next logical stepping stone back into mainland Europe. The Allies' successful campaign to take Sicily, codenamed Operation Husky, began in July and came as quite a shock to the Italians. Their position was truly precarious, as not only did they have the battle-hardened British, Canadian and American troops from North Africa to worry about, but their so-called allies, the Nazis, were equally menacing. If the Italians surrendered, they would come under immediate German attack, and anger against Mussolini for putting Italy in such a predicament grew. With Sicily under heavy assault, early in July 1943, Mussolini was removed from power and put under arrest. The King of Italy himself took control, and with Marshal Badoglio taking charge of the government, Hitler feared an imminent Italian surrender to the Allies, and ordered plans be put in place immediately to liberate Mussolini. 
Having been humiliated on the Eastern Front with the loss of Stalingrad, Hitler was determined that the dramatic turn of events in Italy and all around the Mediterranean would not be permitted to undermine his power even further. Consequently, when the Italians did surrender unconditionally to the Allies early in September, the Germans were swift to react. Firstly, they liberated Mussolini and restored him as a puppet dictator. Then they set to work salvaging whatever they could as they attempted to halt the Allies in their tracks. What was about to unfold in Italy would change the course of the war, and the American president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, astutely commented in one of his famous fireside chat broadcasts that the first crack in the axis has come. The criminal, corrupt fascist regime in Italy is going to pieces. The question now was who would pick up the fallen pieces first, the Allies or the Germans? In the last days of September 1943, the Allies were making good progress in the south of Italy. While the King and Marshal Badoglio met the American General Dwight D. Eisenhower aboard HMS Nelson to sign a full armistice, to the north Hitler had annexed the German-speaking regions of northern Italy. What had seemed to the Allies an easy advance to Rome was now becoming very much more complicated as the lines between who was friend and who was foe became increasingly blurred. By October 1st, when the Allies marched into Naples, the Germans had been fighting a revolt by the citizens of the city. Matters had exploded into conflict when German soldiers began to loot a shop. At least amongst the devastation of Naples, the Allies were assured of the support of their new brother-in-arms. Meanwhile, on the Adriatic side of Italy, as October began, the Allies had also captured Foggia, and with it the most important airport in the region. Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, was quick to assess the situation and realized that even his considerable talents would be stretched in putting a positive spin on this event. The Allies now had the potential to launch air attacks on Nazi-held strongholds in the Balkans, as well as giving them a springboard to attack southern Germany. This was of little consolation, though, to the thousands of Italian soldiers who were now facing the full brunt of Hitler's wrath. Even those who had surrendered to the Germans, including 5,000 on the Greek island of Cephalonia, were brutally massacred by the Nazis, and with the pressures mounting, it wasn't only military personnel that faced the backlash of German retaliation. On October 3rd, the Gestapo ordered all the Jews in Athens to register and Greece quickly became an important focal point for the Allies, with Italy being so close by, but the Germans were equally determined to secure as much territory in the area as possible. Within 24 hours, the British protectors of the island of Kos had been beaten soundly by Hitler's Axis powers, despite the cracks spotted in their armor by Roosevelt. And as the Greek Jews were targeted, the Italian Jews were also about to discover the sting of Nazi persecution. On October 9th, a hundred Italian Jews from Trieste were rounded up and sent to Auschwitz, and not one of them survived. This was the Day of Atonement in the Jewish calendar, the ancient festival of Yom Kippur, one of the holiest of all Jewish holidays.
At Auschwitz, this day did not go unmarked as the Nazis picked out 1,000 inmates they claimed were too weak to work and executed them. Without the protection of being part of Hitler's axis of evil, the Jews of Italy were now SS targets. There were nonetheless some advantages to be enjoyed because Eisenhower announced that there would be no more Allied bombing raids on Italy, and all efforts were made to prevent the ships of the Italian Navy falling into German hands. But Hitler's retaliation was unrelenting, and as the Luftwaffe were ordered to attack the escaping ships as they headed for Malta, he also drafted in more ground troops from the Russian front. With the Nazis in full occupation of Rome, General Erwin Rommel was charged with commanding operations in northern Italy, while General Kesselring had the daunting task of stemming the tide of the Allied advance in the south and protecting the Italian capital. Although Kesselring could do little about Naples, the Fuhrer would have been delighted at the devastation his general left behind for the Allies to deal with. The reprisals were appalling, as all communication, transport, water and power systems were destroyed, while the city's buildings burnt, bridges were bombed, railway tracks were torn up, the harbour was a mass of sunken ships. The workload for the Allies was huge, and Kesselring would have been well aware that in excess of 800,000 civilians would now be reliant upon the Allies for their survival. Instead of speedily moving north to consolidate their advantage, the Allies were stalled as they dealt with the aftermath of Naples, but to their credit, the port was restored, reopened and functioning within a week. With the Allied commander's sights now set on Rome, there was no time to lose, and the German defensive line at the Volturno River, 20 miles northwest of Naples, came under attack. The Volturno line ran from the town of Tomoli, along the Biferno River, through the Apennine Mountains to the Volturno River. As early as October 6th, Canadian tanks had forced the German troops of occupation to withdraw from Tomoli, and by the 12th of the month, the American 5th Army had crossed the river to breach the German defensive line and, in doing, push the Nazis back yet further. The very next day, the King and the Italian government declared war on Germany as the battles raged on. There were heavy civilian casualties as well as military losses with what happened at places like Campo Basso being typical. Resonant with ancient history, even the city hall with all the archives was destroyed as the 1st Canadian Corps eventually took the city from the Germans. By October 16th, the Allies were just 90 miles from Rome, but on the very same day in the capital, German SS officers seized more than 1,000 Italian Jews. However, with more than 4,000 Jews given refuge in private homes, monasteries and converts, not to mention almost 500 hidden inside the Vatican, the Nazis once again found themselves thwarted by their former allies. The Allied war effort was now really gathering pace, as from the snow-clad mountains of Italy to the sweltering jungles of the Pacific, the dream that victory could be theirs was steadily becoming a reality. The positive influence of Roosevelt, Eisenhower and the Americans were making a colossal difference, and with them came propaganda every bit as effective as that manipulated by Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis. 
Hollywood film stars rallied to entertain the troops, from the glamorous Carol Landis to the comical Joe Brown. Many entertainers were happy to play their part no matter what the dangers to their own personal safety. And in this positive atmosphere, plans for the Allied invasion of France were also gathering momentum. In the south of England, exercises were taking place with tank landing craft, and by the middle of October, the codename Mulberry had been selected for the hugely daring artificial harbours made of concrete that would be such an essential part of the D-Day landing plan. Nevertheless, the principal allied nations, the USA, Great Britain and Russia, were far from feeling at ease with each other, especially as Russia had been so closely linked with Hitler in the early stages of the war. It was Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, who had speedily moved to recruit Joseph Stalin to the Allied cause after Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, when the Germans had invaded Russia. Ever since, despite Hitler's confident prediction that the Soviets would crumble before him, the Russians had been a constant thorn in his side. But Churchill, of all people, a man who in his long political life had changed his allegiances on more than one occasion, was all too aware of the disastrous consequences if Russia were to defect back to the Axis powers. Consequently, on October 18th in Moscow, the American, British and Russian foreign ministers agreed that they would not consider any separate peace negotiations with Germany, while the very next day in Washington, the Americans agreed to supply millions of tons of aid to the Soviets. As October 1943 drew to its conclusion, with the Allies manoeuvring into position to sustain their assault on the Axis powers, the cost in human suffering was escalating. On the 25th, the Japanese completed the Burma-Thailand Railway with the forced labour of 46,000 Allied prisoners of war. More than 16,000 of them had died of starvation, brutality and disease, alongside many thousands more Burmese citizens caught up in a war not of their making, in which they too were forced labour for Imperial Japan. Just as events in southern Europe were now moving at a rapid pace, the same was equally true in the Pacific. On the very first day of November, U.S. soldiers of the 3rd Marine Division landed in Empress Augusta Bay on the Solomon Island of Bougainville. Backed up by an impressive U.S. naval task force of four light cruisers and eight destroyers and commanded by the brilliant Rear Admiral Aaron S. Tip Merrill, the Americans quickly consolidated their position. The Japanese were equally quick to respond, launching air attacks from Rabaul as well as dispatching their own powerful task force of cruisers and destroyers. Merrill was the first American rear admiral to use radar and in this battle it gave him a major advantage. Without radar, the Japanese commander failed to assess the outcome of the battle accurately when Merrill retreated under cover of smoke. Returning to Rabaul, the Japanese believed they'd been victorious and prepared to re-attack the Allied landing forces at Bougainville without realizing Merrill's task force was still very much intact. Two U.S. aircraft carriers raided Rabaul on November 5th. Having underestimated their enemy, the Japanese fleet sustained heavy losses, which meant that any danger to the now well-established U.S. Marines from Japan's Imperial Navy had for the time being at least passed.
Success in the Solomon Islands had been crucial to the Allies because it was from here that the Japanese had planned to expand into New Guinea, Papua, and most worryingly of all, Australia. To recap a little, the campaign for the Solomon Islands had started back in February 1943 with General MacArthur leading a sustained American strategic offensive. By June, islands that people had never before heard of in the West were suddenly on the map. In Operation Toenails, the Americans overcame Japanese resistance as they landed on the island of Rendover, with the crucial airfield at Munda within attack range from there. While American and Japanese ships battled for dominance in the waters of the Kula and Vela Gulfs, although there was no outright victory for the Allies, the Japanese were prevented from backing up their ground troops. When Munda Airfield fell to the Americans on August 5th, phase one of their campaign was complete. But there was still a great deal of work to be done, clearing Japanese troops from New Georgia and the surrounding islands of Arundel, Banga, Gizo, Kolombangara and Vela La Vela. The Japanese were a most tenacious enemy, honor bound never to contemplate surrender, always fighting to the death. In the build-up to the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay in November 1943, Operation Toenails had been vital and what lay ahead was destined to be equally challenging. Interestingly, the Japanese suffered much heavier losses of ships and planes than the Americans. But while the USA could manufacture replacements, by this stage in the war, the Japanese could not. Nevertheless, the Japanese, determined in battle and policy of no surrender, continued undaunted, serving notice to the Allies that whatever the outcome of the war against Hitler in Europe, victory over the Japanese was going to be a completely separate issue. With the end of 1943 just weeks away, Adolf Hitler was finding the troops available to him were becoming even more thinly spread. Having to occupy Italy as well as cope with another bitter cold winter on the Russian front was bad enough. But the Germans were now in no doubt that an invasion of Western Europe sometime in 1944 was imminent. In fact, on November 3rd, Adolf Hitler issued Directive 51, warning of the anticipated Allied landings, and his propaganda minister Goebbels once again had a difficult task ahead of him, convincing the German nation that their Führer was still invincible. Goebbels' personal diaries offer a fascinating insight. And on the day before Hitler issued Directive 51, Goebbels made an entry regarding the fact that more than 9,000 German soldiers had been killed on the Eastern Front in just nine days. He said, We cannot sustain such a drain for long. We are in danger of slowly bleeding to death in the East. Whatever the public face of Nazi propaganda, Goebbels, like many of his fellow high-ranking officials, was fully aware of the all-too-real danger of Germany being defeated. Without doubt, the Nazi propaganda machine was being stretched to the full by the events in Western Europe and Russia. However, the Japanese government was even more determined than the people of Japan should believe that their brave imperial warriors were victorious in every campaign of the Pacific Offensive. There were, of course, plenty of occasions when they did score direct hits against the Allies, particularly out at sea. And on November 19th, the Japanese Navy sunk the USS Sculpin, a Sargo-class submarine. 
appropriately named after a remarkably stealthy fish that can survive out of water as well as in it, capable of inflicting a painful sting, the sinking of the Sculpin was a major blow to the American Navy. Yet the Japanese missed a golden opportunity to gain intelligence regarding the devastating attack the Allies were planning for the very next day on the three atolls in the Gilbert Islands, Bacon, Tarawa and Abamama. Aboard the Sculpin was Captain John P. Cromwell, who had been fully briefed on the offensive to take the Gilbert Islands, codenamed Operation Galvanic. When the submarine was first struck, the vessel's commander surfaced to give his crew the chance of survival, but a direct hit to the conning tower meant that he, along with many of his men, were killed outright. Cromwell was not amongst them, but realized if he was taken prisoner by the Japanese, he might reveal the secret plans under torture. Bravely, he went down with the sinking submarine, rather than risk jeopardizing the operation, and was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for devotion to his country. To date, the Americans had been given little chance to go on the offensive with the Japanese because, after the shock of Pearl Harbor, they had constantly been taking a defensive position. Interestingly, the Battle of Tarawa was only the second time they had done this, the first being the Guadalcanal campaign, where their amphibious landing force had met little resistance, but things were about to change dramatically. Strategically, the Gilbert Islands were of vital importance as the Allies increased their operations from the mid-Pacific to the Philippines and prepared to advance on Japan. Taking the Mariana Islands from the Japanese would be crucial if the US Navy stood any chance of succeeding in this objective, but naturally, Imperial Japan was all too aware of this. Because the Marianas, including the all-important island of Guam, had become a major target, Japanese reinforcements had been drafted in, with fortifications consolidated to make the entire area as secure as possible. The Americans knew that they would have to advance island group by island group because before they could even reach the Marianas, they would need to wrestle the nearby Marshall Islands from Japanese control. But before they could do that, the enemy garrison on the Tarawa Atoll needed to be neutralized. By now, the Americans had enough experience of the Japanese to come prepared, and as Operation Galvanic began November 20th, over 6,000 US troops landed on Macon. On paper, the occupying army made up of 300 Japanese soldiers and 500 Korean laborers should have been easily defeated, but the battle was bitterly contested and American casualties were high. It was a costly operation in other respects too, as the US escort carrier Liscombe Bay was torpedoed, killing 644 of the 900 crew. Then an accident aboard the USS battleship Mississippi during the pre-landing bombardment of Macon, when the turret exploded, resulted in a further 43 American deaths. The people of Macon were nonetheless delighted to greet their US liberators, offering coconuts as a token of their gratitude. It was an experience the Allies were going to encounter many times in the coming months, as the freedom they were fighting so hard for was returned to those so long oppressed by the axis of evil. With Macon secure, American troops began their assault on Tarawa Atoll, again about 6,000 of them, but there were 5,000 Japanese soldiers lying in wait for them. A bloody battle ensued, lasting some 76 hours, with more than 1,000 of the Americans killed, and the Japanese statistics certainly make for some fascinating reading. 
Of the vast defending force, only one Japanese officer and 16 of his men survived, alongside 129 of the conscripted Korean laborers who had also made up the numbers. For the American people, who had so far been protected by heavy censorship, the now unrestricted news reports were hugely shocking. Many condemned Washington for allowing the offensive to go ahead after seeing photographs of America's brave young men floating dead in the water. The realization that the Japanese were going to put up a long and terrible fight really did hit home. With their experiences on Macon and Tarawa, the Americans changed their tactics when they reached Abimama. Despite the much smaller Japanese garrison, one Marine was killed within minutes during an attempted landing, so it was to settle for using naval gunfire only to clear the army of occupation. It was certainly effective, but not in terms of direct hits. Because of the 25 Japanese defenders, only 14 had been killed by gunfire, the rest had committed suicide. The loss of the Gilbert Islands to the Americans was far from being good news for the Japanese government back in Tokyo, but they did have the satisfaction of knowing the victorious US troops had suffered significant casualties in achieving their goal. But the bad news was not yet over for the Japanese, as on November 25th, American bombers attacked a crucial airbase on Formosa, or as we know it today, Taiwan. The Japanese Navy operated heavily out of Formosa, which had been snatched from the Chinese, and the Americans destroying 42 of their aircraft in this mission was a huge blow. Air cover afforded the Japanese battleships extra protection, and to lose so many planes was very costly indeed. And it wasn't only the Americans giving the Japanese problems late in 1943. As on the same day in New Guinea, Australian forces captured vital territory. Suddenly, despite their fierce fighting and to-the-death attitude, the Japanese were not looking quite as invincible as they had liked to appear. Meanwhile, as the final days of November dawned, the pressure on Adolf Hitler in the West was increasing. On the 22nd, the British carried out a night raid on the German capital, dispatching 764 bombers to attack Berlin. With direct hits on the government section of the city, including the Admiralty and Air Ministry, Hitler was incensed. He was safely resting at his Wolf's Lair military headquarters at Rastenburg in East Prussia, when even the Chancellery and his train in a Berlin railway siding suffered huge damage. The civilians of Berlin were not as fortunate as their leader, however, as a hundred of them were crushed simply trying to get to safety in an underground shelter. Just as it had been for the civilians of London in the Blitz, the number of innocent casualties escalated, with 1,737 Berliners killed. Goebbels once again committed his personal feelings to his diary, noting that hell itself seems to have broken loose over us. The British lost 167 air crew in the raid, but the very next night, Air Command ordered a further raid on Berlin. This time, 127 aircraft were lost, but the effect on the German capital was again devastating. With no heat, no light and no water, and fellow Berliners dying all around, there was little even Goebbels could do to improve the morale of the German people. For the Allies, there was work to be done wherever they turned, 
and in Italy, the push towards Rome continued. There were many major offensives, like the bombing of Berlin, the continuing Italian campaign, but the little events were beginning to play a huge part too. In France, the resistance was undermining the German occupation at every turn. And with help from British agents, the preparations for the long-awaited invasion of the coast of northern France were, piece by piece, being slotted into place. Pulling all the various elements of the Allied push for victory together was far from being an easy task. Meetings between the Allied leaders were incredibly difficult to orchestrate. A prime example of this was the Cairo conference held between the 22nd and the 26th of November. Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, and America's President Roosevelt met with China's Chiang Kai-shek to discuss the Allied position against the Japanese. Russia's Joseph Stalin refused to attend as he believed, with the Chinese present, it would be viewed by the Japanese as provocation on the part of the Soviets. On November 27th, the Cairo Declaration was nevertheless signed by the three leaders present, stating that the Allies would continue to employ military force until Japan's unconditional surrender. It was also decided that when that happened, all the islands of the Pacific seized by the Japanese since the First World War would be taken back. All territories Japan had seized from China would also be restored, and last but by no means least, Korea would become independent. With the Cairo conference complete, Churchill and Roosevelt looked towards further discussions on the Allies' plans to invade France. While Stalin's absence from Cairo had been manageable, it was time for the Big Three, as they were so often dubbed, to meet as the Tehran Conference began. Stalin had not travelled outside Russia since the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, but the three unlikely allies arrived in Tehran amid the tightest security to agree the plan for an Anglo-American cross-channel invasion planned for spring or summer 1944. In the discussions on November 29th, Churchill outlined to Stalin the conditions that needed to be met if Operation Overlord had any chance of succeeding. Firstly, there had to be a satisfactory reduction in the German fighter forces in northwest Europe. Secondly, German reserves in France and the Low Countries had to be minimized on the day of the assault. And thirdly, the Allies had to make sure that Germans could not transfer significant reinforcements from other fronts for the first 60 days of the operation. Stalin was skeptical as to whether this was possible, but Churchill, as ever, found the right words to express what was required when he said, it will be our stern duty to hurl across the channel against the Germans every sinew of our strength. But amidst discussions outlining the plans for Operation Overlord, Stalin also had quite an agenda of his own. He made it clear that the moment Germany was defeated, the Soviets would embark upon a war with the Japanese. Churchill described Stalin's declaration as a momentous decision that had to be kept absolutely top secret. In fact, it wasn't even noted in the secret records of the Tehran talks. There were also other matters on the table for discussion, but one in particular was ironically kept top secret from the Russians. Roosevelt and Churchill chose not to disclose to Stalin that scientists in America working on the atomic bomb were making massive progress, and that B-29 bombers were now being modified to carry and drop the deadly devices. The fear of new weaponry and scientific advances was huge for the Allies and the Axis alike, and in Britain, Concern over Hitler's designs for his unmanned rocket bombs continued to increase. Although it would still be many months before his V-1 rockets would be operational, a rare visit by Hitler to a flying bomb test site was scrutinized in the minutest detail. 
Hitler at this time was always reluctant to leave his wolf's lair HQ due to growing fears that he would be assassinated, as his health, both mentally and physically, deteriorated. It has been suggested that he was suffering from Parkinson's disease, but this has never been substantiated. In the light of this, British intelligence knew that such a visit must have been important, and it was even speculated that the rocket bombs could weigh up to seven tons. Consequently, Churchill's government put in place plans to make millions of hospital beds available for those who might be injured by such a weapon. Prevention would nevertheless be better than a cure, so Operation Crossbow was also instigated to systematically bomb any site in northern France that looked suspicious from reconnaissance photographs. With the arrival of December, as the world waited for the end of another year at war, the major players continued to maneuver themselves into position. On December 7th, the American President, Roosevelt, appointed General Dwight D. Eisenhower to the much-coveted command of Operation Overlord. Calm and level-headed, with Eisenhower as Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, Overlord was in a very safe pair of hands indeed. And Eisenhower was not alone, as the British general, Bernard Montgomery, was also about to be called to rally for the Overlord cause. He had been fully occupied in Italy since his rise to prominence with the British Eighth Army in North Africa, but things were moving very slowly now in the Italian campaign, as the Germans tightened their grip on Rome and other significant strongholds. By the end of December, Montgomery returned to England to command the 21st Army Group, while Oliver Lees took over Monty's role in Italy. Always outspoken, Montgomery, with a characteristic lack of tact, announced that he was glad to be leaving what he described as the dog's breakfast of the Allied campaign in Italy. Ironically, there were dissenting voices, most notably from the American camp, claiming that Monty had actually played a part in creating the dog's breakfast, and things did not exactly bode well for future relations between the opinionated Englishman and certain US generals. By the very nature of the Anglo-American offensive, these strong-minded personalities were going to have to forget their differences and work together, and it would take all of Eisenhower's immense talent as a diplomat to ensure that the very men needed to win the war did not end up fighting amongst themselves. Even so, as more and more attention was now being focused on Overlord, the Allies still continued to push on towards Rome. For the Canadian, British and American troops fighting in Italy, it was now evident that the battles ahead were going to be long drawn out and costly. What had appeared to be a straightforward campaign was now going to become a war of attrition throughout 1944. The Germans at the front of Cassino as 1943 drew to a close could not be dislodged despite the best efforts of the Allies. The winter weather was making the task even more difficult, and any hope of matters in Italy being completely concluded before Operation Overlord commenced were fading fast. As Christmas appeared on the horizon, events in the Pacific also continued to hit the headlines. On December 15th, American troops landed on the Arawa Peninsula at the western end of New Britain in the Solomon Islands. It was a strategically important advance, with the capital of New Britain, Rabaul, still operating as a formidable Japanese stronghold. With people everywhere praying for peace at Christmas time, World War II relentlessly marched ever onwards. On Christmas Eve, the British once again bombed Berlin, and on Christmas Day, American planes knocked out 24 of the flying bomb sites that had been spotted in northern France. In 
In Washington, President Roosevelt made his traditional broadcast to the nation. We know now that if we lose this war, it will be generations or even centuries before our conception of democracy can live again. And if there was little comfort to be had from his wise words, which was totally appropriate after the recent events in the Pacific and the horrific casualties inflicted upon the Americans by the Japanese. For the sake of those US Marines and their families, the bitter pill could have no sugar coating. Roosevelt pulled America together with a timely warning of what the year ahead was likely to bring, asking for one and all to find the strength and fortitude that would be required if the Allies were going to be victorious. He said, The war is now reaching the stage when we shall have to look forward to large casualty lists, dead, wounded and missing. War entails just that. There is no easy road to victory and the end is not yet in sight. It was evidently just what was required of the American president, as a day later, US troops launched Operation Backhander, a landing on Cape Gloucester on the extreme tip of New Britain. There was no festive holiday out in the Pacific, and within a week, the Americans had secured a vital airfield, giving them the perfect location to launch attacks on the yet unconquered half of New Guinea. This was a positive note for the year to end on for the Allies, but the Japanese fought back as fiercely as ever, and there was little doubt that the first months of 1944 would come complete with ever more conflict for the world at war. The grand conferences had been attended, the now famous Allied leaders had been pictured chatting together at Cairo and Tehran, and despite the major policy rifts on human rights that existed between the Western Allies and the Russians, for the time being at least, they were presenting a united front. What would happen to these strange allegiances once the war was over was going to be extremely complicated, and on a global scale, the ramifications were immense. Yet, from the sleepy seaside towns of southern England through to the ancient streets of historic London, it was this determined island nation that was about to take centre stage. For Adolf Hitler, his earlier inability to break the people's spirit and invade Britain would return to haunt him, as Operation Overlord now had the most stable of platforms to be launched from. The people of Britain would once more be asked to stand firm and resolute, playing host to the many thousands of Allied troops and supplies required to cross the Channel and invade France. Preparations were now almost complete to force the German army of occupation to retreat back across its own borders in a prelude to Hitler's last stand. The blueprint for victory was at long last about to be written. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sondern, dass wir intolerante, unverträgliche Menschen sein. Wir wollen sagen. Wir haben die When the clock struck midnight, marking the final moments of 1943 and the new year of 1944 began, World War II continued at a rapidly accelerating pace. All eyes turned to London as the preparations for Operation Overlord, the long-awaited Allied invasion of northern France, were finalised. In Germany, Adolf Hitler and his high-ranking officials knew all too well that the invasion forces would soon be on their way, but where they would land, and perhaps more importantly, when they would cross the Channel, was yet to be revealed. Hitler's public appearances were now very rare, and the Führer struggled to come to terms with the reality of the German situation. On all sides, his position was becoming daily more untenable, with the Allies making good progress in both the European and Pacific theatres of war. With his henchmen all around him, Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring to name but a few, Hitler grew increasingly withdrawn and was often irrational in his decision-making. Even those closest to him finally began to realise that their leader was no longer the great saviour of Germany that they had once believed him to be. It's quite often overlooked, but as we progress to consider the blueprint for victory and the build-up to Operation Overlord, there was actually a much smaller scale Allied invasion of France back in 1942. On August 19th, a joint British and Canadian commando raid was made on the French port of Dieppe as 5,000 troops plus 50 American Rangers and half as many again free French soldiers took part in Operation Jubilee. Although unsuccessful, it did give the Allies vital information to help them plan a future assault on the French coast that would eventually take shape as the D-Day landings. The casualties at Dieppe were a disaster for the Allies, especially for the Canadians, while all equipment and vehicles were abandoned on the beaches. Interestingly, on hearing the news, Hitler mocked his enemy, saying, The British have had the courtesy to cross the sea to offer the enemy a complete sample of their weapons. But later, when he briefed his commanders, Hitler's tone was far more reflective when he told them, We must realise that we are not alone in learning from the lesson from Dieppe. The British have also learned we must reckon with a totally different method of attack and at a different place. Dieppe may have been a minor blip on the radar of this global war, but like so many operations that failed to achieve their objectives, it nonetheless made a major contribution to the bigger picture. Meanwhile, the fighting for North Africa was over. The Allies quickly made the most of their advantage, putting plans to take the attack to southern Europe via Italy into action. Operation Husky was their first offensive, focused on the island of Sicily, and after a swift victory, the campaign for Italy seemed to be theirs for the taking.
Yet in war, the tide can turn in the blink of an eye, and the fight for Italy was anything but a foregone conclusion. Hitler was unable to prevent the Italians from surrendering, and therefore ordered a German invasion of his former comrade-in-arms, Benito Mussolini's nation. This made the push for control of Rome by British, American and Canadian troops a much tougher task than had ever been anticipated. Despite the difficulties faced by the Allies in Italy as 1943 had come to a close, plans for the liberation of France in the spring or summer of 44 were now unstoppable. As the Russians continued to attack the Germans from the east, and the Americans battled for supremacy in the Pacific, Great Britain prepared to play host to the mightiest invasion force the world had ever seen. No matter how positive the news was of Allied progress around the globe, those that Hitler had condemned to the concentration camps, whether Jews, Poles or Gypsies, faced greater suffering than ever. Yet another concentration camp opened in Poland on New Year's Day, having previously been a forced labour camp tyrannised by its commandant Amnon Goth. His sadistic treatment of inmates was highlighted in the poignant film Schindler's List, warning a whole new generation of the true horrors of war. Even so, there was a growing resistance to Axis oppression, with brave individuals often making a personal stand against those who preyed on innocent civilians simply caught up in the conflict. In the Philippines, an American mining engineer by the name of Wendell Fertig had refused to surrender when the Japanese had taken the islands back in 1942. A civilian himself, he went deep into the jungle and built up a force of several thousand Filipinos, and together they constantly harassed the increasingly tyrannical Japanese army of occupation. Wendell Fertig only ceased his guerrilla activities in the jungles of the Philippines when the American general, Douglas MacArthur, returned to take the islands back from the Japanese later in 1944, just as he had promised he would do. In the meantime, the British Royal Air Force had been systematically bombing Berlin for some time, and they planned a further air raid for the first night of the new year. Bad weather forced a brief postponement, but by January 2nd it was business as usual, with Hitler's seat of power under siege yet again. Just as it was business as usual for the British pilots, the Americans continued to advance their campaign for New Guinea and New Britain out in the Pacific. Japan was still a long way away, but for the Russians, their target of reaching Germany was getting closer by the day. On January 3rd, the Red Army were within 10 miles of what had been the Polish border back in 1939, leaving Adolf Hitler in no doubt whatsoever that a Russian breakthrough was not far off. More pressing on Hitler's mind, however, was the Allies' cross-channel invasion. American and British aircraft began Operation Carpetbagger on the 4th, dropping arms and supplies to resistance groups in France, Holland, Belgium and Italy as the Allies' carefully planned preparations were being slotted into place. It was also time for the Allies to start calling the main protagonists entrusted with leading Operation Overlord to London. 
General Bernard Montgomery, now Sir Bernard, having been knighted by King George VI in recognition of his victory at El Alamein, had returned to England from Italy to take command of the British contingent of the Allied Expeditionary Force. To his men, Monty, as they fondly knew him, was a hero they would follow to the ends of the earth, but for those in command of him, Monty could be something of a loose cannon. He was extraordinarily valuable in the fight against Hitler, but it was commonly quoted that Montgomery was great to serve under, difficult to serve alongside, but hell to serve over. For whoever was in overall charge of Operation Overlord, earning the respect of Monty was crucial if this brilliant but difficult general was going to fulfil his undoubted potential. The decision regarding the appointment of a Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Invasion Force had been taken back in 1943. And in January 44, it was time for the American General Dwight D. Eisenhower to take up his position in London. On Winston Churchill's home territory, working with the maverick British Prime Minister was always going to be a challenge, and with Monty already in situ too, it was going to require a very firm hand on the helm to keep the invasion plan on track. Even now, in the 21st century, when people are asked to name the heroes of the Second World War, it's rare for Dwight D. Eisenhower to come top of many lists. Yet without Eisenhower's calm attitude, steely determination, quiet politeness and brilliant military mind, the outcome of World War II might have been very different indeed. So, before going any further, we'll take a brief look at the man charged with the successful execution of Operation Overlord, who is also destined to become the 34th President of the USA. Born David Dwight Eisenhower in Grayson County, Texas on October 14, 1890, his childhood nickname, Ike, stuck with him throughout his life. Remarkably, both of his parents were pacifists, but this didn't prevent him from attending West Point Military Academy, as they believed it would provide him with the best possible education. With the outbreak of the First World War, while Eisenhower was at West Point, he inevitably took up a military career. But even when the Americans entered the conflict in 1917, Eisenhower's duties in the tank corps kept him close to home. After the armistice was signed in 1918, Eisenhower forged ahead with his military career during the 20s and 30s, working under the command of such powerful men as General Douglas MacArthur. When World War II broke out in 39, Eisenhower had earned a first-class reputation as an administrator, and he found himself serving with MacArthur in the Philippines. Promotions came quickly, and when Eisenhower returned to America to take up posts in Washington, California, and Texas, he rose from Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier General, attached to the general staff in Washington by the close of 1941. Before long, Eisenhower became Assistant Chief of Staff in the Operations Division, and his obvious administrative abilities led to his appointment as Commanding General European Theatre of Operations in London. It was after this that he became Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in North Africa, and as the battle moved to Italy, after Rommel had been driven out of Tunis, Eisenhower went with the action. He might not have been a soldier on the battlefield, locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the rare gifts that the mild-mannered Texan possessed were equally as valuable in the fight against Hitler. And it was time for Eisenhower to show the world that he was up to the task now being asked of him as he arrived in London to take command of Operation Overlord.
It was of vital importance as Eisenhower and the top brass of military commanders settled down to refine the plans for the D-Day landings that the people of Britain did all that they could to help the war effort. On the home front, the government became ever more involved in the education of the population so that every individual could play their part. From early instructions to dig for victory to encourage food production, measures had been taken to keep everyone eating healthily. By the beginning of 1944, rationing had been a way of life for years, and teaching families to make the most of their weekly allowances was considered a government matter. The Ministry of Food had drafted in home economists to encourage healthy eating, as imaginative recipes were dreamt up to make tasty meals from whatever was available, and popular entertainers were often recruited to the cause. As we know, the first rationing in 1940 was of bacon, butter and sugar, quickly followed by meat, tea, jam, biscuits, breakfast cereals, cheese, eggs, milk, canned fruit and sweets. Some foods occasionally appeared off-ration, such as whale meat, but even the ministry's cleverest cooks struggled to find ways to make it palatable. The whole idea of rationing was to ensure that whether to the rich or the poor, food and essential items were distributed fairly. It would be unrealistic to think that there wasn't a thriving black market, however, because although the vast majority of the people of Britain were both law-abiding and public-spirited, there were still some for whom money talked, despite the government's best efforts. Interestingly, despite food in the shops being rationed, meals served in restaurants were not. By the end of 1944, it was estimated that 9% of all food was eaten outside the home, with establishments known as British restaurants opening up all over the country. Typically charging less than a shilling for a three-course meal, they provided plain wholesome food wherever a suitable building could be found. Laws were brought in so that even the most exclusive London restaurants were not permitted to charge more than five shillings, and three courses were the maximum allowed. It was also compulsory for factories, so vital to the war effort, to provide canteens, as the government made sure that the population was as well-fed and healthy as possible in order to work at full capacity. It wasn't only food that was rationed. Over time, clothing, petrol and even soap was controlled by coupons. Fashion definitely had to take a back seat, with any clothes available having to conform to the utility standard, which meant minimal fabric, no turn-ups and no frills. Nylon stockings were a thing of the past, as ladies painted their legs with whatever they could find, and gravy browning seamed with eyebrow pencil proved to be a popular choice. But when the GIs started to arrive in Britain in 1942, they actually brought with them such luxuries as nylon stockings, along with chocolate, chewing gum and cigarettes, which did make the American servicemen very popular indeed. The term GI actually came about because all of the US soldiers' equipment was stamped with the words government issue, which was quickly abbreviated to GI. Eisenhower's fellow countrymen were a glamorous addition to the very ordered, duty-bound existence of the women on Britain's home front, and throughout 1944, their numbers rapidly increased. This didn't always bode well for Anglo-American relations though, not least because the men left on the home front tended to be viewed as second-rate for not being in uniform. The expression, overpaid, oversexed and over here, was often used by the British men to describe the GIs, 
but from the ladies they danced and romanced, there were noticeably fewer complaints. Nevertheless, there were broken hearts aplenty, especially with an estimated 1.5 million GI stationed in Britain in the run-up to D-Day. In excess of 15,000 of them married girls from the UK in 1944 alone, while the GI bride phenomenon, meaning that many of these young women moved to America either during or after the war. But it was rarely a case of happy ever after. They often married after a whirlwind romance of no more than days, and the stark reality of life in a different country, thousands of miles from their families, meant that quite a number of these marriages ended in divorce. Also, many thousands of girls became pregnant by American soldiers, often causing devastation within British families that continued long after the GIs had gone home. It's therefore not surprising that the British men left on the home front were unhappy about the conduct of their allies, with whom they simply couldn't compete, especially as they were generally overlooked by the female population, being mostly elderly, in poor health, in less glamorous occupations that were exempt from the call-up, or worst of all, draft dodgers. There was also a group known as conscientious objectors who were permitted to register not to fight if their religion or their beliefs prevented them from doing so. Several of them were sent to work in British coal mines, but this didn't stop them from being branded as cowards for not being in uniform. Late in 1943, and moving into 44, this had a surprisingly adverse effect on another group of miners, who found themselves digging for coal for a very different reason. Known as the Bevin Boys, they were often mistaken by the community at large for conscientious objectors and shunned for cowardice. This was indeed an injustice, as they worked incredibly long hours in the most difficult of conditions, and without them, the British nation and the entire war effort would have been brought to a complete standstill. In Britain's wartime coalition, under Churchill's leadership, there was a number of specially designated ministries, and alongside the Ministry of Food, there was also a Ministry of Labour and National Service, overseen by Ernest Bevin. As early as May 1939, after Hitler's troops had marched into Czechoslovakia, the Military Training Act was passed, giving the British government the power to call up men between the ages of 20 and 22 for six months military training. After war was declared, the National Service Armed Forces Act became law, and men aged between 18 and 40 were called up, although this was extended in 1941 to include men up to the age of 51. There were some occupations exempt from the call-up, such as engineering and coal mining, but men could still volunteer. Early in the war, many coal miners did just this, before the government really appreciated what a problem it would become as fewer and fewer men remained at the coalface. Legislation had been put in place to deal with such situations, courtesy of the Emergency Powers Act of 1940, followed by the Essential Works Order a year later, meaning that those left on the home front could be conscripted into essential industries. However, the majority of the potential conscripts were women who could not be sent down the mines, and although Bevin put out an urgent plea for men to volunteer, Understandably, there were few prepared to step forward. With the real threat of the coal miners who did remain taking industrial action, Bevin needed to act fast. The minister devised a system whereby a percentage of those conscripted for national service would be allocated to the mines. 
each week, some say from his own hat. Bevin would draw a number between zero and nine. Any of the men called up that week with a national service number ending with that digit would be ordered to the mines rather than into the armed forces. It was not a popular course of action and it blighted Bevin's political career, but it was effective and these hard-working miners got their name after a speech Bevin gave in an effort to inspire them. We need 720,000 men continuously employed in this industry. This is where you boys come in. Our fighting men will not be able to achieve their purpose unless we get an adequate supply of coal. Bevin's boys certainly played their part, but their service to king and country has only been properly recognized in more recent times, which is ironic, as unlike those conscripted into the armed forces, they were not released from duty until many years after the war had ended. While Britain faced the challenges of food and fuel shortages with resilience, the cross-channel invasion was transformed from a distant dream into an actual reality, and the propaganda machine in Germany went into overdrive to persuade civilians that the war was still going their way. And it wasn't only their own people that they tried to influence. German propaganda radio broadcasts were made in England to undermine the Allied position, directly targeting civilians throughout the English-speaking nations. In a program called Germany Calling, a fictitious character called Lord Hawhaw warned of treachery on the part of the Allied leaders. In January 1944, he suggested they were all about to be handed over to the Russians, playing on the British and American fear of communism. It was hoped that the British public in particular would pressurize Churchill into agreeing a peaceful settlement with Hitler, but such a broadcast only served to convince Allied intelligence that the Nazis were now clutching at straws. The most famous voice to play Lord Hawthorne was the American-born but Irish-raised William Joyce, left England for Germany at the beginning of the war. As a senior member of the British Union of Fascists, he would have been interned, but instead he became a naturalized German citizen. Joyce was captured in Germany by the British shortly before the end of the war and hanged for treason. Although not a British subject, it was argued that as Joyce had once lied to obtain a British passport, it was therefore his nation of choice, making him guilty of treason, a capital offence. Hitler too was now getting to a stage where he was clutching at straws almost daily. The Führer was convinced in the early weeks of 1944 that all he needed to do was develop the jet aircraft to fight back against the anticipated Allied landings. He declared that, if I get a few hundred of them to the front line, it will exorcise the spectre of invasion for all time. It was just another example of Hitler losing his ability for logical thinking and decision-making. Another problem faced by Berlin was how to explain the defeat of the Germans, and more particularly, Erwin Rommel in North Africa. They had boasted that Rommel was an unbeatable military genius, so what to do with him next was something of a problem. After a while, he was sent to Italy, but when the new year began, just as Eisenhower was called by the Allies to London, Rommel was called to defend the Axis position in France. There's no doubt that Rommel's military instincts were remarkable, and although at this time his fellow commander, Gerd von Rundstedt, firmly believed the Allied attack would come from Dover to Calais, Rommel was convinced that Normandy would be the chosen destination. As a result, Hitler's once highly favored Desert Fox spent the months of January and February 1944 surveying the beaches and countryside of Normandy. 
mines and traps were laid along the shoreline, and any field that would have been a secure landing site for aircraft or paratroopers was either flooded or spiked with what became famous as Rommel's Asparagus. These were long poles driven into the ground that made it impossible for planes or military personnel to land. Even though it would be months before he was destined to be proved correct, for the time being at least, all Rommel could do was back his hunch. One place where German troops had managed to hold ground was in Italy. Despite the Allies enjoying a head start, the Germans were now well and truly dug in around Monte Cassino, and they would have to be driven out if the Allies were to stand any chance of reaching Rome. On January 12th, the French Corps attempted to capture the town of Cassino, but to no avail. The Germans held firm, leaving the Allies no choice but to wait for another opportunity. It was nonetheless only a brief moment of triumph for Hitler, as elsewhere his troops were coming under attack on all sides. Across German-occupied Europe, partisans were rising up against their oppressors. In Yugoslavia, the leader of the revolutionaries, General Tito, was a constant thorn in the Nazi side, and what's more, by this time he was receiving considerable aid from the air, courtesy of the British and the Americans. And of course, Russia continued to be a dangerous drain on Hitler's resources. On January 15th, the Red Army finally broke through the German defences around Leningrad. The fight was so fierce that the Russians took few prisoners. With more than 60,000 German soldiers killed as the Red Army cleared the entire Leningrad province. Back in Italy, the British had now joined the French in the battle for Cassino, but once again the Germans repelled their advances. North of Cassino, as the Americans advanced towards Italy's Rapido River, they were also planning a daring landing from the sea at Anzio, just to the south of Rome. While Eisenhower met with his commanders in London to discuss Operation Overlord on January 21st, British and American troops, escorted by 28 warships, sailed from Naples in Operation Shingle, the codename for the landings at Anzio. Just minutes after midnight, the troops went ashore. The 227 Germans based there were caught completely by surprise and offered little resistance. In 24 hours, 36 Allied servicemen had safely landed, with the loss of only 13 lives. Hitler had instructed his men to hold Italy at all costs, and within days the Allies realised that despite their early success, Anzio was far from being secure. German aircraft struck on January 23rd, sinking British support ships, preventing tanks and heavy artillery being brought ashore. The American commander at Anzio hesitated, with disastrous consequences, giving the Germans the opportunity to rush in reinforcements. As the Germans learnt to their cost at Anzio, military intelligence was of vital importance, as knowing that the Allies were on their way would have made all the difference. At Bletchley Park, an elegant mansion at the heart of the British countryside, coded Axis messages were intercepted and deciphered. 
Not only were the Allies able to track what the Germans were planning, they were also able to ensure that the false intelligence they were feeding the enemy was getting through. With Operation Overlord imminent, this was crucial as every effort was made to take all German attention away from Normandy. As part of Operation Fortitude, a sophisticated and elaborate campaign to deceive the Germans over the proposed landing beaches of Operation Overlord, for every reconnaissance flight over Normandy, two were dispatched over the Pas de Calais. The 1st United States Army Group, commanded by the notorious American General Blood and Guts Patton, was in fact a total fabrication of the decoded messages from the Germans told the Allies that Hitler was moving troops from Russia in preparation to counter Patton and his imaginary men at Calais. The 12th British Army made up of the 15th British Motorised Division, the 34th British Infantry Division, the 8th British Armoured Division and the 7th Polish Infantry Division likewise only ever existed on paper. And apart from Rommel's gut feeling about Normandy, the disinformation campaign was working perfectly. However, for those fighting in Italy, Russia and out in the Pacific, the battles were anything but imaginary. The Americans had been making good progress in the Pacific since 1943, gradually advancing towards the Mariana Islands, which would give them a strategically important base from which to launch attacks on Japan. But before they could reach the Marianas, they would need to take the Marshall Islands. On February 1st, a huge American landing operation overwhelmed the Japanese armies of occupation. But despite this, the defenders of the three islands under attack chose to fight to the death rather than surrender. For Japan, the casualties were high. Out of 8,000 of them on one island, 7,870 were killed, with the Americans losing less than 400 men. Even so, a full assault on Tokyo was still a very long way off, and the war in Europe would need to be concluded before the question of how to defeat the Japanese could be addressed. In London, Eisenhower was totally absorbed with plans for Operation Overlord, as he and his senior commanders realized just what a huge planning commitment they'd taken on. Scientists, technical experts, and a formidable intelligence operation would be crucial, and for the few people with the security clearance to be aware of the details, it seemed an impossible task. At Buckingham Palace, George VI was kept informed of Overlord's progress, and noting his thoughts in his diary for February 44, he gives us a rare insight into the apprehension felt by those responsible for leading the daring operation. The King wrote, The more one goes into it, the more alarming it becomes. Another operation that was rapidly taking on alarming proportions was the battle the Allies were having in Italy, attempting to hold their position on the beachhead at Anzio. The landing that had started with such promise for the Allies was being held off by the determined attacks of the Germans, and just a short distance away at Casino, Hitler's troops were doing an equally good job of keeping the Allies at bay. As February wore on, the battle for Casino urgently needed to be resolved if the Allies were going to be able to take Rome before the start of Operation Overlord. Leaflets were dropped addressed to Italian friends, telling them to leave the ancient monastery of Monte Cassino as an Allied attack was imminent. 
It was a timely warning, just prior to 400 tons of bombs being dropped on the magnificent early medieval shrine, killing the bishop and 250 civilian refugees sheltering there. Alongside the Americans, Canadians and the British, Maori, Indian and Gurkha troops fought hand-to-hand -hand against the German defenders amongst the ruins, and still the Allies failed to dislodge them from their vantage point. In the skies over Europe, the Allies continued to bomb Berlin, while the Germans in retaliation bombed London. With alarming accuracy, four people were killed in an air raid virtually on the doorstep of the Prime Minister's home at No. 10 Downing Street. But fortunately for Churchill, he was away from home at the time. For the RAF, the bombing raids on Germany were very costly in terms of planes lost and men killed, but Churchill, as ever, was quick to defend his actions. With all thoughts focused on the liberation of France, he said, the air offensive constitutes the foundation upon which our plans for overseas invasion stand. At the same time as the major cities of Britain and Germany were being bombed, the Americans were equally busy bombing the Japanese in the Pacific sinking warships, merchant ships and aircraft, as well as taking another of the Marshall Islands. However, the Japanese were successful in scoring direct hits on American warships off the coast of Iwo Jima. As was now expected, any survivors were slaughtered by the Japanese and there were British warships that suffered a similar fate in the Indian Ocean. A new tactic emerged, because as soon as Japan's submarines had sunk the enemy ships, they surfaced in order to machine-gun the survivors clinging to the life rafts. There was little respect for a prisoner of war's human rights from the Japanese, and in the concentration camps the Germans behaved with equal contempt for their fellow man. In Dachau, though, where so many atrocities had been committed, it's interesting to note that a clerk at the camp took a brave step. On February 22nd, 31 Soviet prisoners of war were dragged out of barracks and executed, and the clerk simply recorded their names, each and every one of them. Of the millions killed in concentration camps, the majority were nameless victims of the Holocaust. But this particular clerk gave the dead men their dignity, creating a list that would one day provide evidence against those responsible for committing such barbaric crimes. Spring was now upon the Allies, as February gave way to March, and with the time for the invasion drawing ever closer, Allied military intelligence worked tirelessly to pull all elements of the deception plans for Operation Overlord into place. In Moscow, the Soviets gave their blessing to the Anglo-American disinformation campaigns and added an interesting one of their own, creating a spurious landing off the coast of Norway. There were still setbacks, as a further Allied attack on Monte Cassino still failed to secure the location, and German troops marched into Hungary. Yet Hitler's stranglehold on power was slipping away from him, as some of his own officers were beginning to question his authority. From his early days as Germany's Chancellor, Hitler had always feared the possibility of assassination. He had, after all, made many enemies along the way, but the fact that the plots were now being discussed amongst his own men made everyone around him a danger. Without a doubt, the Führer's days were numbered, but the damage he was still capable of inflicting upon the Allies was a very real danger to the success of Operation Overlord, which was gathering momentum by the hour.
In London, there were endless rounds of top-secret briefings, as those Eisenhower had charged with making sure that everything was ready for the invasion were working around the clock. And all the while, the British wartime spirit prevailed as the citizens of London went about their day-to-day -day businesses as cheerfully as they could. Whether working in shops, offices or factories, everyone was doing their bit for the war effort. And in the evenings, they would volunteer as air raid wardens and fire watchers to keep the city as safe as possible, whatever Hitler threw their way. The fate of the free world lay in the hands of the experts hidden away in the lofty war offices of London, planning the largest and most audacious invasion force yet known to man. If it failed, Hitler would have a chance of turning the war back in his favour, and with an operation of such epic proportions, the Allies would have little left to attack again. The air raid warnings continued to scream out and the bombs still fell on the streets of London. But as Hitler had learned to his cost, here was a people that refused to be crushed. Life went on and people made the best of whatever pleasures they could find. The West End theatres might struggle to put on a show in the evenings, but the lunchtime concert became a popular wartime phenomenon. The venues were unusual. The National Gallery was a great favourite, popularised by the classic pianist Dame Myra Hess, and Londoners from all walks of life took time out from their busy schedules to be soothed by the lyrical melodies of Beethoven, Brahms and Mozart. It was indeed the calm before the storm. Out of the corridors of power in London, the blueprint for victory had been written, and D-Day was literally just a heartbeat away. It was surprisingly hard for me to conceive when I walked the peaceful, picturesque beaches along the west coast of northern France for the research of this book and the related documentaries that they were the setting for the remarkable, never-to-be-forgotten Normandy landings. 
The beautiful sands are known as the Côte de Nacre, which poetically translates as the Mother of Pearl Coast, and the beaches are awash with poignantly moving memories of that auspicious and historic day when thousands of Allied troops came ashore on June 6, 1944. The events that took place there are celebrated as D-Day. Without doubt, this daringly heroic and ultimately liberating invasion marked the beginning of the end of World War II. Since September 1939, when war broke out, for the Allies, victory and the prospect of peace was a distant and often uncertain dream. Somewhere in the future, as Adolf Hitler and his axis of evil stormed to power across Europe. But by 1942, the mists of doubt had slowly started to lift, and the vision of a world free from tyranny began to emerge. And although, up until D-Day, the war could still have swung in Hitler's favour as preparations were made, fortune seemed to have been smiling on the Allies for some time, firstly in North Africa, and then across the Mediterranean into Italy. Before Alamine, we never had a victory. After Alamine, we never had a defeat. Prime Minister Winston Churchill spoke these words after the British Eighth Army had triumphed against Erwin Rommel in the Second Battle of El Alamein. The Allies were at last making progress, and although months and years of conflict still lay ahead, the tide was definitely turning their way. Now, although the events of North Africa have been covered in detail in earlier chapters, it's worth taking a moment for a brief look back, as the key players in the D-Day landings were already emerging. This gives us the opportunity to discover a little more about the backgrounds of the remarkable heroes of Operation Overlord, who played such key roles in the Normandy landings. The first battle of El Alamein had been far from conclusive. The Allied forces did battle with the Germans from the 1st to the 27th of July 1942, with the outcome being a stalemate at a cost of some 13,000 Allied casualties. Even though this war was far from ideal, the British still managed to take 7,000 prisoners and damage Hitler's North African campaign. Rommel's plans to advance to Alexandria and then Cairo were stalled, and this impasse also put a stop to Germany gaining control of the Suez Canal and many Middle Eastern oil fields, which would have had grave consequences for the Allies. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery took over the British Eighth Army in August 1942. And it was his insight and initiative that proved to be the downfall of the Nazis in the second battle at El Alamein. Using his experience of fighting in the First World War, Montgomery could anticipate and almost predict what was going to happen and managed his campaign accordingly. Fortunately for Montgomery, the air support he received was outstanding when compared with the German Luftwaffe and Italy's Regia Aeronautica, who instead of supporting their ground troops became embroiled in air-to-air -air combat. Overall, Allied casualties were less than half of those suffered by the Germans, which were 30% of Rommel's men, and he had no other option but to retreat moving the remainder of his army to Tunisia, where better defensive action could be taken. 
Winston Churchill famously described the 14-day battle at El Alamein that ran from October 23rd to November 5th, 1942, as not being the end, not even the beginning of the end, but perhaps the end of the beginning. And it was certainly the point at which the Allies started on the road to victory with the colourful characters of Rommel, Churchill and Montgomery all gaining valuable experience. With the battle for North Africa over, the Allies could springboard into Europe across the Mediterranean, and the island of Sicily was the next target. The Allied invasion, codenamed Operation Husky, was a mix of amphibious and airborne warfare, with the aim of removing both the Sicilian Air Force and Navy, giving the Allies access to the whole Mediterranean. German intelligence had no knowledge of the invasion plans thanks to a decoy of documents planted on the corpse of a British officer stating that the Allies had no interest in Sicily. The papers claimed the next invasion target was to be Greece, so most of the German defences were relocated. Paratroopers were the first to invade just after midnight on July 9, 1943, but due to very strong winds, many landed miles off course and in the wrong order, but the confusion actually proved to be very positive. When the beach landings began, Allies faced very little opposition. But by July 13th, resistance had grown and the losses and casualties began to escalate. The remarkable American general, George Patton, who was the commander of U.S. 7th Army and equally as outspoken as Montgomery, captured the capital, Palermo, which proved to both the Italians and the Germans that Sicily had fallen and they promptly retreated. Hitler's forces managed to evacuate the whole garrison in Messina, and because the Allies were at this point superior in the air and at sea, Germany's swift evacuation came as something of a blow, as they had failed to make the most of the situation. The individual charged with controlling Montgomery and Patton was General Dwight D. Eisenhower, and his task was far from easy. As progress through Italy was slow, the tensions between Montgomery, Patton and another American, General Omar Bradley, escalated and it took all Eisenhower's diplomatic skill to prevent a war breaking out between his generals before the fight against Hitler and the final push for victory could begin. The invasion of Sicily heralded the Italian campaign, but there had been some disagreement between the Americans and the British about strategies for ending the war. But President Roosevelt and the USA determined to liberate France first and foremost. However, Winston Churchill was of the opinion that Italy needed to be dealt with and taken out of the war as quickly as possible. As the Allies slowly battled on in Italy as 1943 wore on, the plans for a full-scale invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe gathered momentum. The Russians, who were holding firm against Hitler in the East, attended the Tehran Conference, along with the British and the Americans, bringing together Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt for the first time since the Soviets had become part of the Allied operation. 
The time had come to put the final strategy to defeat Adolf Hitler in place, beginning with the invasion of France, codenamed Operation Overlord, and Dwight D. Eisenhower was once more the man selected to take charge as Supreme Commander. He would need to draw on the experience of the likes of Montgomery and Patton if the mission was to succeed, pulling together the various personalities, and as the Normandy beaches were selected as where the D-Day landings would take place, there was a great deal to be done in a short space of time. Early in 1944, Anglo-American relations became tense when Montgomery insisted that in order for there to be success in Normandy, the original plans of three Allied divisions must be increased to five. This would certainly curtail the American plans for Operation Anvil to play a major role in the invasion. Eisenhower was keen to create a diversion with an army from the Mediterranean landing on the Côte d'Azur in the south of France. But Churchill and the British were strongly against this and felt if resources were concentrated in Italy, Rome would fall to the Allies sooner. Churchill even wrote to President Roosevelt asking that many of the landing ship tanks, better known as LSTs, be transferred from Operation Anvil to Operation Overlord. This dispute continued for some time, until events in late April 1944 took the issue out of the Allies' hands as our story of D-Day begins in earnest. Preparation would be key if the invasion of Normandy was going to be successful, and the 50-mile-long landing beach zone would have to be split up into sections if a beachhead with adequate ports was to be established at speed, allowing the Allies swift access to the heart of occupied France. It was decided that the American Army divisions would land closest to Cherbourg on beaches codenamed Utah and Omaha, while the British and Canadians would land on Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches along the stretch of coastline leading to Caen. Rehearsing for the invasion was vital, and the Americans, who were due to land on Utah Beach, were involved in a practical mission codenamed Exercise Tiger. A similar stretch of Devon coastline was selected at Slapton Sands, as 30,000 troops were put through their paces, but then disaster struck. German e-boats from Cherbourg attacked and torpedoed five landing ship tanks, which dealt a bitter blow both to Operation Overlord and Operation Anvil. At the beginning of the war, Churchill had requested that great ships be built that could cast upon a beach large numbers of the heaviest tanks in any weather, and the LSTs certainly did just that. But the losses at Slapton meant the postponement of Operation Anvil in order to give as much support to D-Day as possible, and with 700 men lost, the disastrous rehearsal was also a human tragedy. Even so, as D-Day came ever closer, exercises like Tiger were still a necessity, despite the dangers. Because of the sheer size of the operation, there was a great disparity in the experience and the level of training between the various soldiers, sailors and airmen called upon for D-Day. 
apart from those who fought in the North African and Italian campaigns, many of the American divisions were being sent straight from the USA and would be only able to take part in a few weeks of intensive training on British soil. Without doubt, the Air Force, Navy and assault regiments would have to practice effectively and cooperatively in order for there to be a successful outcome to D-Day. If the troops were to be prepared as possible, terrain had to be found that resembled the five Normandy landing beaches, along with Slapton Sands, the Gower Peninsula, the Tarbat Peninsula, Culbin Sands and Burghead Bay were also selected. Because these sites were used for military training purposes, all the villages, farms and rural communities needed to be evacuated and quickly. Hundreds of people from each location had to leave their homes as more Allied troops from all over the world gathered in Britain, ready to invade France. Before long, the south coast became a huge training and embarkation zone, with every eventuality planned for during April and May. As well as men, vast quantities of ordnance and military vehicles were required, but most important of all, every move that was made needed to be kept secret. Hitler and his generals knew full well that an attack was imminent, but one of the most astounding things about D-Day was the way in which Allied counterintelligence managed to keep the details of the invasion such a secret. This was crucial to the success of Operation Overlord, and as much careful planning went into this part of the proceedings as into orchestrating the actual landings. A far-reaching system called Bigot was introduced to keep a check on who held complete information about Operation Overlord, and the amount of Bigot officers was kept to an absolute minimum to prevent any information whatsoever leaking out. Naturally, as time went on and the operation drew ever closer, the different forces needed to be briefed on the types of area they would be going to. But the fear of this information spreading was so great that anyone who knew the planned locations was kept under strict supervision and in some cases kept behind the kind of barbed wire fences you would expect to find in a concentration camp. At the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, otherwise known as Shafe, the disastrous events at Slapton Sands had given them unexpected cause for concern, as ten bigot officers were among the 700 men who lost their lives along the Devon coast. A large-scale, grueling mission was ordered to find all ten of the officers because there was every possibility that they could have been carrying bigot paperwork or were still being captured and interrogated by the Germans. Eventually, all ten bodies were found and Schaaf could continue with Operation Overlord safe in the knowledge that their secrets had not been compromised. But this was far from being the only scare they had to deal with. One US Major General was enjoying drinks at a London hotel and without thinking complained that he couldn't get any supplies through until about June 15th after the invasion. Needless to say, he was returned to the United States very quickly indeed. And it wasn't just careful talk that Schaaf had to worry about. In the lead-up to D-Day, Wind blew 12 copies of bigot documents out of a Whitehall office, and security officers had to risk all to dodge the traffic so that each one was collected. Then, as if the weather hadn't been enough to contend with, a worrying coincidence seemed to arise in the 33 days leading up to D-Day. Words connected with the operation were answers to crossword clues in the Daily Telegraph newspaper. The names of the landing beaches Utah and Omaha cropped up, 
as did Neptune, which was the codename for all the naval operations involved, along with Mulberry, the artificial harbours that were planned for the beaches of Normandy, but most worrying of all was the clue, the Big Wig, the answer to which was Overlord. Immediately, the retired school teacher who had set the clues was brought in for questioning, as he was suspected of being a Nazi spy who was tipping off the Germans. However, he convinced MI5 of his innocence, and this has gone down in history as one of the most bizarre coincidences of World War II. Schaeff were right to be so cautious. The entire outcome of the war and many thousands of lives depended upon secrecy, and when a railway employee at Exeter found a complete set of overlord plans in a briefcase abandoned in a train compartment, it proved without doubt that ensuring information did not pass into the wrong hands was a major undertaking. However, keeping the invasion plan secret was only a part of the process. There was a great deal of effort put into feeding the Germans incorrect information, and it worked very well indeed. For a start, the most logical route for an Allied invasion would have been between Dover and Calais, and Schaeff did everything possible to make sure that this is what the Germans were expecting. For every reconnaissance flight over Normandy, two were flown over the Pas de Calais, as well as floating dummy landing crafts in the Thames estuary and the Channel ports to add to the deception. These diversions became so complex that the project of disinformation was even recognised officially as Operation Fortitude. It proved to be totally believable that Rommel, who Hitler had put in charge of defending France from any Allied invasion, was certainly convinced, keeping his troops concentrated around Calais, leaving Normandy open to attack. As D-Day fast approached, it was also essential that the French resistance be told that the invasion force was on its way. They had worked tirelessly since the fall of their nation back in 1940 to obstruct the German occupying army in any way that they could. Hello, forces. Once again, this is Joan Griffith King. Consequently, two coded messages were broadcast by the BBC on the 1st and then the 5th of June. The long sobs of the violins of autumn, followed by wound my heart with a monotonous languor. Far from being secret, the chief of German intelligence had been warned of the significance of these bizarre words. But when Rommel was told, he believed it preposterous that the Allies would announce their operation plans over the radio, dismissed this as being a part of the elaborate disinformation strategy. A great deal of thought had gone into planning the perfect date for Operation Overlord, and as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Force, Eisenhower had considered everything from weather and tides to phases of the moon. A full moon would be essential for light, along with a spring tide, and initially June 5th was settled on. Nevertheless, when the weather turned unseasonably stormy, the Allies faced an incredibly difficult decision. Eisenhower knew that if he postponed for longer than a day, the operation would have to wait a whole fortnight for conditions to be right again. Already there had been so many close calls, and who could say whether it would be possible to keep their plan secret from the Germans for a further two weeks? Plus, there was now the issue of the thousands of men already aboard their ships prepared for their mission. Not only would it be difficult for them to disembark without it being noticed, but they'd also have to be accommodated until the invasion could go ahead as planned.
Eisenhower did, however, have the option of postponing until the following day, when the weather forecast, even though still dreadful, was slightly more promising. It was a very risky decision, but to everyone involved, it was definitely a chance worth taking, even though the sea crossing would be far from pleasant for the troops. To help with seasickness, the soldiers had been advised to chew gum. But with the appalling weather that came with the dawn of June 6th, it was of little help. The only plus point was the fact that the weather was so bad, the Germans had ruled out any chance of an invasion. Rommel had been so confident that he'd left France and returned home to Germany to celebrate his wife's birthday. Operation Overlord began in two phases, the first being an air assault, while the second was the amphibious landing of Allied infantry. The second phase was hugely dependent on the success of the first, as the airborne bombardment and influx of troops would build up a support force ready to ensure a swift breakout from the beachhead. The air assault landings of British and American troops happened shortly after midnight, in the first few hours of D-Day. This was not only to secure the rear of the beachheads, but also to neutralise as much opposition along the shoreline as possible. It was strategically vital to capture two bridges north of the city of Caen at the British and Canadian end of the landing beaches as they provided the Germans with an opportunity to attack from inland. Also, the bridges needed to be secured intact as they were necessary if there was to be a smooth breakout from the beachhead. The most famous of the crossings was originally called the Benoville Bridge, which was over the Conn Canal, but is known today as Pegasus Bridge, because it's where the British 6th Airborne Division, led by Major John Howard, had the first success of D-Day, after landing their wooden horse gliders perfectly on target. The name change came because Pegasus, the proud flying horse, was the insignia of the 6th Airborne Division, who were responsible for liberating the first of the French towns at Benoville shortly after winning the battle for Pegasus Bridge. The Allied airborne attack continued as planes from the US Air Force set off from the south of England to secure the northwestern perimeter and prevent any German counterattack towards the Cherbourg end of the landing beaches. As part of the German defences, Rommel had flooded as many areas as possible that could have been suitable for parachute landings, and had also scattered hundreds of mines and the famously named Rommel Asparagus. Quite often, those who were lucky enough to avoid the dreaded asparagus often drowned under the weight of their heavy kit bags in the thick swamps that Rommel had created. For months, the D-Day planners had to struggle to find the best landing beaches in Normandy, and the invasion was due to begin at the most westerly stretch of shoreline, Utah, running for some three miles and located between Poupeville and La Madeleine. As the Allied troop ships began to gather, the weather that had made the journey so uncomfortable for the troops proved extremely fortuitous, as the German e-boats sent out from Cherbourg had to turn back to port. This gave the 30,000 American troops and 3,500 vehicles that were in position at 2 a.m. and ready to fight at the first light of day almost a clear path into the area.
The airborne forces, despite so many of them landing off course, had also played their part, and one of the best-known films about the Normandy landings, The Longest Day from the 1960s, features these early events and one story in particular. Just a short distance from Utah Beach lies the charming town of St. Mary Glees. In the early hours of D-Day, 13,000 paratroopers dropped from the skies, one of them being a Private John Steele, who has gone down in history as a result of his most unfortunate landing. Steele's parachute became entangled with the fine steeple of the imposing church, leaving him to dangle helplessly. For two hours, he managed to limply hang on, pretending to be dead, but the Germans eventually spotted movement and he was taken prisoner. A dummy paratrooper still hangs from the steeple to this day, as a reminder of the incredible bravery of so many Allied servicemen as they gave their all to liberate France. But some of the troops involved in the fight to gain control of Utah Beach were a great deal more fortunate than Private Steele. Another contributor to the D-Day history books was Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, the eldest son of the former President of the USA. Despite being 57 years of age, as division commander, he requested he be allowed to lead his men ashore in person, and although advised against such action, he was granted permission and landed on the beach with his troops. However, because of the strong current and massive amount of smoke caused by the initial assault, Roosevelt's infantry landed a mile off course to face only a handful of German soldiers who could do little to defend against this unexpected Allied advance. Roosevelt is famously quoted, when told of the error, as having said, we'll start the war from here, which he promptly did, leading the advance inland. Ironically, the part of the beach where the troops were supposed to have landed was heavily defended, and many more lives would have been lost had things gone to plan. Roosevelt certainly took full advantage of the situation, and his quick thinking and strategic intellect earned him the Medal of Honor. The successful landing at Utah was better than Eisenhower could have possibly hoped for, especially as there were only 197 Allied casualties, and only four out of the 32 tanks sent ashore were lost. These figures were a credit to the skill and courage of all those involved in the landings, with the added advantage of luck very definitely playing its part. Nevertheless, the airborne forces paid a much higher price with the real cost of gaining control of Utah Beach being borne by the many paratroopers who were killed or captured. They were clearing the exits for five hours prior to the Utah landings, causing sufficient confusion to prevent a German counterattack. Unfortunately, by the end of the offensive, the 101st Airborne Division had lost 40% of its fighting force, which coupled with the men also lost in the Slapton Sands tragedy meant that the Americans suffered a great deal more at Utah than the casualty figures at first suggest. Today, the invasion at Utah is remembered for the very positive start it gave to D-Day, heralding the liberation of France. There are many proud monuments along this most significant stretch of beach, and the popular Utah Beach Landing Museum is a wonderful place to visit, especially for those who want to know more about the incredible events of that June morning back in 1944 in person. But the relatively straightforward triumph at Utah could not have been more difficult than the disastrous and very bloody battle that took place at the neighboring beach of Omaha. 
The objective was for American troops to secure a five-mile stretch of coastline that would eventually link with the British forces landing at Gold Beach. But just as all went in favor of those landing at Utah, the exact opposite happened to those destined for Omaha. For a start, navigational difficulties due to the weather worked against the invasion force, putting them directly in the line of fire of the very experienced German 352nd Division, who just happened to be on a training exercise in the district. By this late stage in the war, with so many of Hitler's troops engaged on the Eastern Front fighting with the Russians, many of the troops defending the French coast would otherwise have been schoolboy conscripts. As well as the misfortune of a strongly defended position, an error of disembarkation had further disastrous consequences when 29 tanks were released from their landing craft too early, causing 27 of these essential support vehicles and their crews to sink, leaving the men clamoring ashore even more vulnerable to enemy fire. It's difficult to comprehend what it must have been like, particularly if you look at the quiet beach today. But this vivid account from an eyewitness certainly leaves us in no doubt as to how horrific the scene must have quickly become. Within 10 minutes of the ramps being lowered, A Company had become inert, leaderless and almost incapable of action. Every officer and sergeant had been killed or wounded, it had become a struggle for survival and rescue. The men in the water pushed wounded men ashore ahead of them, and those who had reached the sands crawled back into the water, pulling others to land to save them from drowning. In many cases, only to see the rescued men wounded again or to be hit themselves. Within 20 minutes of striking the beach, A Company had ceased to be an assault company and had become a forlorn little rescue party bent upon survival and the saving of lives. Even so, the fighting spirit of those brave Americans shone through. And as companies who had become separated regrouped while the lower ranks stepped forward to replace their commanders who had fallen, advances were slowly but surely made. It was a real team effort, with the engineers clearing pathways across the beach and up the steep hill, working under intense fire, which frequently set off the explosives they were attempting to defuse, and the casualty rate was high. American losses were horrendous, but the Germans also took casualties of about 1,200, which accounted for about 20% of the 352nd Division. French, as they enjoyed the prospect of liberation, they also had to face the dilemma of how to deal with the fallen, whether friend or foe. Needless to say, having been oppressed by the Germans since 1940, it took some time for there to be a spirit of peace and reconciliation. But if you visit the graveyards along the coast of Normandy today, you'll see how a dignified solution was eventually found for this problem. At Le Con, the German cemetery, more than 21,000 soldiers lie beneath the ground, the majority of which fell between D-Day and August 20th, 1944. 
Each small square commemorates up to four men, some of them no more than boys, and the sheer volume of sombre black stone crosses stands testament to the tragic loss of life experienced on all sides throughout World War II. The cemetery is managed today by the German War Graves Commission, was completed in 1961, but since this time, any German remains found from the conflict are brought here to Le Combe to rest in peace. It's interesting to note that across this rural landscape, this is still quite a common occurrence, where so many lost their lives during the invasion of Normandy. While the casualties of the aggressive German army are buried without pomp and circumstance, the contrast of the American National Cemetery and Memorial, appropriately located high on the cliffs above Omaha Beach, where so many US troops were killed, couldn't be more marked. The brightly gleaming cemetery contains the remains of 9,286 soldiers in over 70 acres of land. There are 30 pairs of brothers buried together here, including Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt of Utah Beach fame, who died of a heart attack just over two months after the invasion on July 12th, alongside his brother Quentin, who had been killed in France during the First World War. The 22-foot bronze statue at the heart of the cemetery is entitled The Spirit of American Youth Rises from the Waves, and along with neat rows of bright shining white gravestones is as thought-provoking as the Teutonic somberness of Le Con. As well as being charged with taking the beaches of Utah and Omaha, the Americans were also given the task of attacking Point du Hoc, a strategic headland under German control. It was believed that a large gun battery was located at the summit, with the potential to be a significant threat to the landing forces as they came ashore. The plan was for the 2nd Ranger Battalion to land at the base of the 100-foot cliff face and climb to the top they would then destroy the gun battery that had the beaches of Omaha and Utah within firing range. Under the command of Colonel James E. Rudder, the brave rangers battled hard under fierce attack to reach the top, while the Germans from their high vantage point had the distinctive advantage. Out of the 225 men who took on this perilous operation, 135 were killed, injured, or listed as missing in action, making for a 60% casualty rate. Then, to add insult to injury, the surviving rangers who made it to the top found that the anticipated big guns were nowhere to be seen. The guns were finally found some distance away in an unguarded apple orchard and immediately destroyed. Moving ever onwards and into the British and Canadian sector, the next landing beach along from Omaha was codenamed Gold. The objectives for the troops here Along with those landing on Juno Beach was to liberate the town of Bayou, secure the Khan Bayou Road and occupy the port of Aramanche. The bombardment from the battleships at sea began at 5.45am and the landings took place five minutes earlier than scheduled at 7.25. Just as had happened at Omaha, there were difficulties getting the allocated tanks ashore because of the weather conditions, and they had to be launched early due to the heavy seas, resulting in a dozen of them sinking before they reached the shore. Even though the troops experienced some heavy resistance in the early hours, they managed to break through the German lines, only sustaining casualties of around 400 men, compared to the thousands of lives lost at Omaha. 
After securing gold, the British troops managed to join up with the Canadians, who had landed on neighboring Juno Beach, next along the coast, but were unable to complete their primary objective of reaching and securing the Con Bayou Road. Today, Gold Beach is an idyllic holiday location, and as people enjoy the seafront hotels, cafes and restaurants, thoughts of D-Day may be far from their minds. However, looking out to sea, there are plenty of reminders of those auspicious events. Aramanche is a charming town, but on June 6, 1944, it was of vital importance as a port, and from here you get a superb view of the remains of the Mulberry Harbours that the Allies constructed soon after the landings. When planning Operation Overlord, the Allies quickly realized that both the American and British sectors would need harbors to ship in supplies once the beaches had been secured. Port on Besson lay between the two sectors, but it simply wasn't large enough to handle all the equipment that would be needed at great speed. So the idea of constructing floating harbors was conceived made up of component parts that could be towed across the English Channel in the wake of the invasion force. The two harbours were constructed at the far end of Omaha Beach and at Aramanche, codenamed respectively Mulberry A and Mulberry B, and they were surprisingly large, being similar in size to the harbour at Dover. Each of these temporary constructions required 600,000 tonnes of concrete, along with about 10 miles of floating roadways to cope with the flow of traffic. Unfortunately, the American Mulberry A was smashed to smithereens by more unseasonable weather in a powerful storm on June 19th, and this proved to be a major setback. Luckily, Mulberry B at Aramanche remained intact despite the terrible conditions, and it is the remains of this amazing construction that can still be seen along the shoreline today. Mulberry B proved to be incredibly efficient and was used to land over 2.5 million men, 500,000 vehicles and 4 million tons of absolutely crucial supplies and bearing the title Port Winston, it was as steadfast and dependable as the British Prime Minister it was named after. Returning to the invasion beaches, our next port of call is Juno. And this is where some of the most incredible footage from June 6, 1944 was actually shot. Interestingly, there were around 50 camera crews recording all the landings on D-Day, which is a staggering figure, especially as they faced the exact same dangers as the troops they were filming. At Juneau, the soldiers of the Canadian 3rd Division had been selected to advance into one of the most heavily defended stretches of the Normandy coastline. The earlier bombardment of this area was of little help to the troops, as the Air Force had failed to cause significant damage, and the advanced naval attack that ran for an hour and a half only destroyed a small percentage of German bunkers. Nevertheless, about an hour after landing, the Canadians had cleared the German sea line but had sustained heavy casualties. However, by evening, they had still pushed several miles inland and secured the town of Saint-Aubin-sur-Mer. 
The final Allied assault was on Sword Beach, following on from Juno. Sword was the furthest east of all the beaches, and only a matter of miles from Khan, and securing this key town was a primary objective for the collaboration of the British 3rd Infantry Division and the 27th Armoured Brigade, who landed here. Unlike Omaha and Gold Beach, although heavily mined, the resistance on the beach was minimal, but the relatively small, concentrated landing area, combined with the swift incoming tide, meant that the operation became very hazardous as the thousands of men and equipment came ashore. As the troops advanced inland, the resistance grew stronger, and it wasn't long before the Germans' 21st Panzer Division was sent to Sword from Conn, and it took the Allies until evening to neutralise them. However, this escalating conflict meant that Conn could not be reached as planned, and the two groups of Allied infantry were stalled on the outskirts of the city. This may not have been the most straightforward of landings, but the indomitable spirit of the advancing Allies was unmistakable, as each and every one of them played their part in the liberation of France. One of the most incredible stories told of the events at Sword Beach is that of Piper Bill Millin of Lord Lovett's first special service. As he stepped out, waist-deep, into the water from the landing craft, he started piping his own rendition of Highland Laddie. As the beach became littered with the corpses of the fallen, amongst all the smoke and confusion, Piper Millen continued to play. In fact, it's said that he piped all the way from Sword Beach to Pegasus Bridge, where Lord Lovett's men joined the British troops that had been the first to land in France on D-Day. There were many tales of incredible heroism, as the days of June 1944 saw Operation Overland forge further ahead towards the very heart of France as it was being liberated from Hitler's tyranny. Against all the odds, by the end of D-Day, 130,000 Allied troops had occupied the stretch of coastline between Cherbourg and Conn before Hitler's generals had even realised what was happening. The casualties had been significant for the Allies. On Omaha Beach alone, 3,000 brave Americans had lost their lives, yet the end of the war was now very definitely in sight. Hitler was far from finished, but the chances of a German victory were disappearing fast as June 1944 drew to a close. For the Allies, morale was at an all-time high, and as the success of D-Day was built upon, the dream of restoring peace to a free world was just that little bit closer to becoming a reality.
With the promise of summer, the Second World War entered a very positive phase for the Allies in 1944. After success in North Africa, in the latter part of 42, and the Allied invasion of Sicily, and the landings at Salerno in 1943, followed by the Anzio attack in January 1944, the German forces were losing their Italian stronghold. The Russians were becoming more powerful in the East, pushing ever closer towards Germany since the surrender of Hitler's troops at Stalingrad early in 1943. Even in Southeast Asia, the Allied battle against the Japanese, part of Adolf Hitler's axis of evil, was gaining momentum daily. And of course, the daring Operation Overlord, which had culminated in the D-Day landings of June 6th, along the coastline of Normandy had been a triumph beyond even the wildest dreams of the Commander-in-Chief, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Remarkably, Eisenhower had never actually seen active service, but he was nevertheless a superb administrator who was greatly admired by all the men he commanded, not least because of his pleasant and affable character. The respect and trust of the troops was of vital importance to Eisenhower because he knew that once Operation Overlord began, every soldier, sailor and airman, regardless of rank or experience, would be key if the battle for Normandy was to be won. The Allies could have taken a shorter route to France across the English Channel, from Dover to Calais, but they deliberately chose a different route. In point of fact, this is precisely what Hitler and his generals were anticipating, and the Allies did all they could to convince the enemy that this was indeed the case. Secrecy had been paramount, because the element of surprise was vital if Operation Overlord stood any chance of succeeding. A concerted campaign, Operation Fortitude, was instigated to keep the Germans believing that the invasion would target Calais, and events soon proved that it had served its purpose. Adolf Hitler was fully aware that an attack on the Western Front through France was imminent, but early in 1944, the Soviet Red Army in southern Russia was giving him a great deal more cause for concern. The Nazis attempted to stem the Russian tide by building large fortifications, but Hitler's fears of being forced into a retreat by the Allies on all fronts were being proved well-founded. Also, the Americans were now dominant in the Pacific against the ever-tenacious Japanese. Because of the sheer size of the US Navy, the Japanese were finding it difficult to secure the islands that they had previously seized. However, for the Americans, containment was the watchword during these crucial months of 1944, because until Europe was liberated, they would have to fight on without any Allied reinforcements, while the European theatre of war became the primary focus as Operation Overlord progressed. In the weeks following D-Day, the Allied invasion force steadily made progress, liberating the people of France literally village by village. The excitement was rising, and after so many years of Nazi oppression, the Allies received the warmest of welcomes from those they set free. Back in Great Britain, news of the triumphant landing certainly boosted morale, but for Adolf Hitler, as the realization dawned that the battle for Normandy was being lost, it was time to retaliate. Hitler had always promised the German people that he had a secret weapon, and with news of the events in France traveling fast, he needed to boost morale and reaffirm the Nazi position of strength. The weapon in question was the V-1 bomb, 
taking its name from a German word meaning weapon of vengeance, and it most certainly was. The effectiveness of these bombs came from the fact that they were unpiloted, basically an early cruise missile that could be launched from mainland Europe across the channel to target Britain. After being launched, the precise autopilot technology would accurately track the target area where it was due to detonate, and the damage the bombs could do was horrific. Powered by a combination of petrol and compressed air, the V-1 could travel at great speed. They made a very loud buzzing sound from the jet engine that pulsated 50 times a second and this buzz gave the V-1s many nicknames, including the Buzz Bomb and the Doodle Bug, after a loud Australian insect. The sound was terrifying enough, but when it went silent, it was dangerous. With there being about 15 seconds before the huge explosion. However, for Hitler and the German developers of the V-1, there was one major disadvantage. There was no way they could be sure whether the bombs had reached their designated sites or not. As London was targeted relentlessly, there was a wall of silence as none of the devastating hits or the casualty figures were reported by the press and great care was taken to ensure that news of the V1's success didn't reach Germany. What's more, the indomitable spirit of the British, typified by the people of London, had been a major problem for Hitler throughout the conflict, most notably during the Blitz, and once again the great British public stood firm in their resolve to see Hitler defeated. Extra barrage balloons were deployed, and planes like the Spitfire were used to attack the V1s in the air, and almost 2,500 of them were shot down. It was quickly evident that Hitler's secret weapon was not going to win Germany the war, and it also proved extremely counterproductive as the Allies became more determined than ever to do all in their power to see the Nazi reign of terror brought to a swift end. For the British soldiers fighting in France, fear for their loved ones back at home made them push all the harder to break out from the beaches having had all the advantage of surprising the Germans, it was now imperative that they consolidated their position. Ironically, Hitler's generals still believed that the main attack would still come from Calais, with the Normandy invasion being a decoy, but the Germans soon realised they had a fight for survival on their hands. General Montgomery, who had been instrumental earlier on in the war, leading British troops to victory in the Second Battle of El Alamein, before taking a significant role in the fight for Europe, certainly found heavy Nazi opposition at the eastern end of the D-Day landing beaches. His troops suffered many losses, and Montgomery was forced to retreat to rethink his tactics. Boosting the German resistance in this area was crucial, because if Caen fell to the Allies, it would leave the road to Paris wide open. However, the occupying army were far from strong despite increased numbers, and it appeared that they were operating without coordinated artillery support, suggesting a breakdown in communication, which was enough to allow the Allies to continue their advance. Since over a million Allied troops had landed in Normandy by mid-July, Montgomery could keep the Germans busy fighting in the northeast of France, which gave the Americans the opportunity to advance further south, and when Caen was eventually liberated on July 19th, the Allies were in a very strong position indeed. With a strategic pincer movement, the Allies steadily surrounded the Germans, but the Nazis could do very little to hold on to their occupied French territory. And 
as more Allied troops were brought in, the Germans quickly became outnumbered and retreat was the only viable option open to Hitler and his generals. To make matters worse for Hitler, the situation on the Eastern Front was getting tougher by the day for the Germans as Operation Bagration gathered momentum. Bagration was the code name for the Belarusian Strategic Offensive Operation, which aimed to clear all German forces from Belarus in northern Russia to Poland, which had started on June 22nd and continued through until the 19th of August. There were four armies in place to take on this task, which consisted of the 1st Baltic Front and the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Belarusian Front. This mission which was later described as the most calamitous defeat of all the German armed forces in World War II, resulted in the complete destruction of the three major components of the German army group in occupation, namely the 4th Army, the 3rd Panzer Army and the 9th Army. The speed the operation advanced at was remarkable, and by July 7th, the Red Army had marched into Lithuania in southern Russia and had managed to secure it by the 13th. By the end of Operation Bagration, the German losses were so great that even forced conscription couldn't begin to replace the men that had been killed. The Axis lost about 20 divisions in all, and 50,000 Germans were captured and taken prisoner from the city of Minsk, which was the last big German base on Soviet soil, liberated on July 3rd. When the Red Army saw the devastation of the villages, where vast numbers of the population had either been killed or deported under the brutal control of the Nazis, they marched the German captives through the centre of Moscow before thundering into Poland. The statistics from Bagration are staggering. Overall German casualties, including those killed, injured or captured, have been estimated at 670,000, with more than 59,000 vehicles destroyed. The Soviets nonetheless paid a very high price with as many as 60,000 men killed, but the Russians were by this time unstoppable as the Red Army roared into Poland. However, with the Polish Home Army already fighting the Germans in the Warsaw Uprising, they waited rather than storm into the nation's capital. When Germany had advanced into Poland, triggering the start of the war back in 1939, the Nazis had been secure in the knowledge that the Russians would not attack them because of the non-aggression pact Hitler had made with Joseph Stalin. In return, Hitler had agreed that the Russians would split Poland with Germany. Consequently, the Polish nationals were keen to take charge of their own affairs. The Warsaw Uprising began on August 1st, 1944, just days before the advancing Red Army were due to arrive, with the Poles eager to triumph over their German oppressors. Sadly, they simply did not have the strength and the Germans fought hard to maintain their position. When the Soviets arrived, they did not, as expected, join the battle lines against the Germans and literally came to a standstill within a matter of miles of the city. The uprising continued for 63 days and the sudden halt of the Red Army is a controversial issue that historians are still disputing to this day. It's been suggested that the Soviet advance from Russia had left the Red Army exhausted and lacking the power to take on the Germans. While others 
argue that this was not the case at all. Stalin may have called a halt so that the Polish home front would be defeated, as they would undoubtedly be opposed to the Soviet regime after the war. The Soviets claimed that it was lack of fuel after Operation Bagration that left them stopping short of Warsaw. But it's unlikely anyone will ever know for sure. As September ended, so did the uprising. And on October 2nd, the Poles surrendered to the Germans, having lost 18,000 soldiers, while between 120,000 and 200,000 Polish civilians had died, most of them murdered by the German troops. After they surrendered, the Nazis burned the ancient city to the ground, leaving nothing but ruins for the Russians to take control of when they finally reached Warsaw. With the mighty Russian allies advancing from the east, American, British and Canadian troops gaining momentum in Western Europe, the German generals knew that they were in a very dangerous position. Hitler's behaviour was ever more irrational, and his symptoms of Parkinson's disease seemed on the increase. The Allies were slowly but surely winning the war. But it wasn't only his enemies that Hitler had to fear because on July 20th, 1944, an assassination attempt came from within the very ranks of his army. What's more, it very nearly succeeded. For some time now, Hitler had made few public appearances, and he was actually attending a meeting at his Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia, discussing the deterioration of the military situation on the Russian front when a bomb exploded, killing four officers and severely wounding many others. Hitler survived, sustaining only minor injuries. But it wasn't the work of one disaffected German. There were many more involved, although the main driving force was Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, one of Hitler's most trusted men who had close access to the Führer. It's interesting to note that there was a German resistance movement dating back to Hitler's rise to power, and it's worth just looking a little more closely at von Stauffenberg's background to discover how this extraordinary event came about in the aftermath of D-Day. Von Stauffenberg came from a high-ranking Roman Catholic family, his father being a significant figure in the German court, while his mother was a countess. He was the eldest of three brothers and started out studying literature, but eventually turned to the military for a career. Before the outbreak of the Second World War, von Stauffenberg was commissioned as a lieutenant and studied weapons and transportation, but was part of the German 1st Light Division that stormed into Poland in 1939. Von Stauffenberg was a supporter of Hitler at this point and considered joining the Nazi Party, especially as the Führer had signed a pact with the Catholic Church. However, like so many of Hitler's treaties, it wasn't long before there were serious infringements. And the Catholic Church began to condemn the Nazis' ideology. The suppression of religion began to escalate within the Nazi regime, but it was the people of the Jewish faith who quickly became Hitler's targets. It was the Nazis' barbaric treatment of the Jews that first caused von Stauffenberg to question his loyalty to Hitler, especially after an event that took place between 9th and 10th of November 1938. Known in history as Kristallnacht, which literally translates as Crystal Night, this attack on the Jews was a warning to the world of what was to come. By the morning of November 10th, the Nazis had murdered 91 Jews, deported some 30,000 of them to concentration camps, and destroyed over 2,000 synagogues. Anti-Semitism was now an inherent part of Nazi ideology, fueled by Hitler's fanatical hatred of the Jews, who he blamed for Germany's economic decline since losing the First World War. 
Von Stauffenberg knew this was wrong, and when the violence extended further to include anyone involved with the Bolshevik movement, his alarm bells were already ringing. Hitler gave written orders that anyone displaying any active representation of Bolshevik ideology was to be killed immediately, and many right-minded Germans, including von Stauffenberg, appealed against this. As the war progressed, von Stauffenberg's opinion of Nazi conduct and policies deteriorated and he became convinced that Hitler was corrupting the German Empire by taking innocent lives. By 1942, von Stauffenberg knew in his heart that Hitler and his Nazi henchmen had to be stopped. In 1943, shortly after being promoted to Lieutenant Colonel of the 10th Panzer Division, von Stauffenberg's vehicle was bombed by the British during the Tunisia campaign in North Africa. He was fortunate to survive and was hospitalized for three months before being sent home to recover further. Von Stauffenberg's injuries were severe. He'd lost his left eye, right hand, and most of the fingers on the other hand, but he was determined to continue as a soldier. However, it was during his rehabilitation that Henning von Treskow, a serving officer but a conspirator in the German resistance, approached him. Aware of von Stauffenberg's organizational skills and dislike of the Nazi movement, von Treskow offered him a job as a staff officer at the headquarters of the German Home Army in Berlin to assist when necessary in the fight to remove Hitler from power. Fully aware that his injuries meant he would never be able to assassinate Hitler without help, von Stauffenberg agreed to take the position. Von Treskow was convinced that only the death of Adolf Hitler would stop Nazi tyranny. And as the Allies played their part, advancing towards Germany, the resistance prepared to do their duty. The assassination must be attempted at all costs. What matters now is no longer the practical purpose of the coup, but to prove to the world and for the records of history that the men of the resistance movement dared to take the decisive step. When von Stauffenberg joined the movement, various plans were in place to kill Hitler and his highest ranking officials but somehow something always seemed to go wrong. Eventually, von Stauffenberg realized that despite his injuries, he was able to get closer to Hitler without arousing suspicion. So he put himself forward to carry out the assassination. By this time, the D-Day landings had been a great success for the Allies, and the support for Von Tresco and the German resistance had increased as plans were put in place to rid the world of Hitler and the Nazis for good. On July 11th, von Stauffenberg attended a conference at the Berghof, Hitler's country retreat, in the Bavarian Alps near Berchtesgaden, carrying a bomb in a briefcase. A colleague waited nervously in a getaway car for von Stauffenberg to complete the assassination of Hitler, along with Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring, but again, it was not to be. When von Stauffenberg arrived, he realized that Hitler and Göring were not present, and after a telephone call to his co-conspirators, the decision was made to abort the mission and von Stauffenberg returned to Berlin to try again another day. The conspirators wasted no time in rescheduling, and by the 15th, von Stauffenberg was ready with his bomb once again at Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia. Fortune yet again failed to smile on von Stauffenberg as Hitler was absent from the meeting and another assassination attempt was aborted. Getting all three men together in one place at the same time was proving very tricky indeed. 
and the Nazis were certainly becoming very suspicious. Arrests were being made and the conspirators selected July 20th, knowing that speed was vital and this would very possibly be their last window of opportunity. On the morning of the 20th, von Stauffenberg travelled from Berlin to Hitler's Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia, armed with two bombs in a briefcase, where he entered the meeting room as planned before the Führer's arrival. Excusing himself to change his shirt, he found a small room in which to activate the pencil detonators using small pliers. Having no right hand and only three fingers on his left, this fiddly job was far from easy. By the time a guard knocked at the door to hurry him back into the meeting, he had only managed to activate one of the bombs. There was nothing for it. Von Stauffenberg could only hope that this one bomb would do the trick. At just after half past twelve, von Stauffenberg placed the briefcase under the table in front of him and, as soon as he was able, with Hitler in position, he left the room using the excuse of an urgent phone call and waited for the explosion. But a latecomer to the meeting took the seat von Stauffenberg had just vacated and casually kicked the briefcase a vital few inches forward out of the way. When the bomb exploded at 12.42pm, the unfortunate latecomer and three others were killed, but Hitler once again escaped death and was one of the least hurt in the blast because of the protection the large solid oak conference table had provided. Von Stauffenberg, who was observing the explosion, was certain that no one could have survived the enormous blast and headed back to Berlin, convinced that Hitler was dead. Elated, von Stauffenberg met with his fellow conspirators, ready to take over power in Germany. However, at seven o'clock that evening, joy turned to despair as Hitler made a radio broadcast stating, a very small clique of ambitious, unscrupulous and at the same time criminally stupid officers made a plot to remove me. The German news agency added, The German people must consider the failure of the attempt on Hitler's life as a sign that Hitler will complete his tasks under the protection of a divine power. The very small clique that Hitler spoke of was actually a lot bigger than he could have imagined. And when he sent the orders for von Stauffenberg to be shot immediately, the officer charged with the task was himself a fellow conspirator and the orders were not undertaken or passed on. But capture was inevitable. And before the day was over, von Stauffenberg and three of his fellow conspirators were found. At 1 a.m. on July 21st, 1944, lit by the headlights of a truck, 36-year-old von Stauffenberg uttered his last words, which translated were, Long live our holy Germany, before being shot. Von Stauffenberg's brother, Berthold, along with over 200 other conspirators, were tried before a judge and sentenced to execution. Eight of these sentences, including Berthold's, allegedly were death by strangulation using piano wire hanging from meat hooks. These horrific killings were supposedly filmed and shown to senior members of the German armed forces to discourage any further assassination attempts as Hitler became more paranoid and dangerous with the prospect of Germany losing the war becoming a question of when rather than if.
While the battle for Normandy had raged on through June and the Russians pushed ever closer to Germany, out in the Pacific, the Americans had been busy making waves. The target was the Mariana Islands, and the first of these was Saipan. Japanese planes were shot down in their hundreds, and US submarines caused a significant amount of damage as they torpedoed Japanese carriers. The Allies were victorious, and Saipan fell on July 9, 1944, followed by the resignation of the Japanese Prime Minister Tojo just nine days later. He had attempted to conceal the events at Saipan, trying to convince his people that the Japanese had been victorious. But when the news leaked out, Tojo had lost all credibility. The Americans were relentless following their victory at Saipan, with a campaign to take the islands of Tinian and Guam, which they achieved in August 1944. After the humiliation suffered at the hands of the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, the Americans were now poised to take the war to the Japanese mainland. And as the summer of 1944 continued, back on the European front, the Americans were also kept extremely busy as the breakout from the beachhead gathered pace after the liberation of Khan. It was time for the Allies to work closely together now, and Montgomery had expected Eisenhower to appoint him commander of the ground forces in Europe. But with the American generals Omar Bradley and George S. Patton being key to the liberation of France, as well as Montgomery, this was probably going to be unworkable. There had been antagonism between the American generals and Montgomery since the Allied advance into Sicily, and Eisenhower knew only too well that his countrymen would never accept Monty in command of them. Also, there were now a proportionally high number of US troops fighting in Normandy, so logically, an American with overall leadership responsibilities would make the most sense. The obvious solution was for Eisenhower to take on the role himself and to appease Montgomery, Prime Minister Winston Churchill promoted him to the rank of Field Marshal. For Monty, the next task was codenamed Operation Goodwood, launched on July 18th, and its aim was to minimize German resistance to Operation Cobra, which would see the bulk of the American forces break out from the beachhead and encircle the Germans, creating the Falay Pocket. Cobra should have begun on the 18th as well, but bad weather, something of a characteristic of the summer of 1944, meant that it was postponed until the 25th. A further operation, codenamed Atlantic, was given the go-ahead to secure the Verrier Ridge, which was a significant sector of high ground to the south of Caen. Taking this area would not only give a great defensive position, but would also open up the path to the town of Falais, which was proving very difficult to get to, with the heavy German occupation of this strategic ridge. When Operation Atlantic failed to achieve its aims, Operation Spring was launched with the Canadian general Guy Simmons, given the job by Montgomery to devise a battle plan to take the ridge, and Phase 1 began on July 24th. The North Nova Scotia Highlanders made the initial attack on the town of Tilly la Champagne in the early hours of the morning. Simmons had devised a way of bouncing light off the clouds to improve visibility, so the Allies could see the enemy positions. Unfortunately, this also meant that the ridge's German defenders could see the Canadians too, and this resulted in a hard and bitter fight. In Phase 2, the Calgary Highlanders targeted towns and a further ridge, and although they also faced tough German resistance, the area was eventually secured. 
The German counterattacks for both Phase 1 and 2 were swift, with panzer tanks advancing against the North Nova Scotia and the Calgary Highlanders, forcing the Allies to retreat from their newly secured areas. The Black Watch then embarked on the third phase, targeting the town of St. Martin, before moving on to take the Verrier Ridge. During D-Day and the weeks after, the bad weather had worked in the Allies' favour, convincing Hitler's generals that the invasion would not be until conditions improved. But this was not the case when it came to Operation Spring. The Germans moved their 9th SS Panzer Division into the area as soon as news of Operation Spring reached them. A postponement due to bad weather gave the German army time to reinforce the ridge with another four battalions of men. The Canadians suffered terrible losses. In this phase, few soldiers survived to tell the tale, proving that despite the success of D-Day, the battle for France was still far from being a foregone conclusion. It would take until early August for this area around Caen to eventually be secured. Nevertheless, although the breakout was happening slowly, the Allies were making progress. And on August 15th, Operation Dragoon was set in motion as the Allies prepared to make an amphibious landing between the southern French towns of Toulon and Cannes. Dragoon had first been planned as Anvil alongside Operation Overlord, with troops attacking from the south at the same time as the Normandy landings. Cooperation between the Americans and the British had been crucial, but not always harmonious throughout 1944, and Anvil had caused something of a rift. Winston Churchill was convinced that the war in Italy needed to be concluded at speed, with pressure maintained until the capture of Rome, but the decision to start invasion plans for France was taken and Operation Overlord selected. But while the beaches of Normandy were targeted, the Americans were also due to land in southern France, putting Operation Anvil into action. Both missions required landing ship tanks, LSTs, and Churchill asked President Roosevelt to transfer these crucial vehicles from Operation Anvil to Operation Overlord, but the Americans were not keen to do so. This row continued for some time until a rehearsal for loading men and machinery onto British beaches like the five chosen for the Normandy landings proved disastrous. As we know, Americans training for Utah Beach at Slapton Sands in Devon were attacked by German e-boats from Cherbourg, scoring direct hits on five landing ship tanks and killing more than 600 men. The landing ship tanks were impossible to replace so close to D-Day, and Operation Anvil was postponed. Ironically, even after the success of D-Day, Churchill was still opposed to Anvil, arguing that resources would be put to better use in Eastern European countries, where he felt it was dangerous for their Russian allies and Joseph Stalin to gain too much power. This is where it suggested the name change for the operation came from, with Churchill dragooned into accepting it by the Americans. After all, Rome had fallen to the Allies in early June, so Churchill no longer had that argument, and after the success of Operation Cobra, which was due in no small part to American strength, the British Prime Minister had no choice but to agree, and Dragoon was set to commence on August 15th.
calling on as many as 200,000 American, Canadian, Free French and British troops, the landings took place in seven different areas along the beachhead and were a great success. By the second day, over 94,000 troops had come ashore, and as so many German troops had been sent to fight in northern France, Operation Dragoon met little opposition. The invasion was carried out with speed and efficiency, and in just 24 hours, advances were made 20 miles inland. For the French resistance, this was exceptionally good news, and for those fighting on the streets of the nation's capital, hopes for a speedy liberation of Paris gained momentum. The French resistance had been born when the Vichy regime had been put in place after Hitler stormed into France in 1940, and it steadily grew and became more organised as the German occupation progressed. Governing France during the occupation, between 1940 and 44, and presided over by Marshal Philippe Pétain, the Vichy regime was controlled by Hitler's Nazi henchmen. For the French, this just added insult to injury, and a resistance movement quickly grew. Even so, it was extremely difficult for the resistance to mobilise as there were strict curfews in place, with censorship and propaganda also used by the Vichy government to keep control of the enraged French citizens. Also, anyone even suspected of being a part of the resistance was treated with vicious brutality and in 1943, the Milice was set up, which was the Vichy government's equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. The Milice were responsible for killing thousands of their fellow Frenchmen during Hitler's reign of terror. There were collective punishments and bloody massacres, and even as late as June 1944, with liberation in sight, the killings continued. At one village, where the presence of the resistance was suspected, a German SS division murdered all 642 inhabitants from babies to those in their 90s. The men were rounded up and mowed down with machine guns, while the women and children were burnt to death in the village church. But by the time June 6th dawned, the French resistance could boast an army of about 100,000, and they were ready, willing, and more than able to prepare the way and assist the Allies in Operation Overlord. The military intelligence they could provide was invaluable, and when it came to performing acts of sabotage on German power, transport and communication links, they were extremely efficient. Not surprisingly, the resistance wanted Paris liberated as soon as possible, and an uprising began on the 19th of August. Even though Eisenhower, as the Allied commander, thought it too early to move into the city, he was given an ultimatum that forced him to change his tactics. Charles de Gaulle, leading the Free French with the 2nd Armoured Division, threatened to send his army in, single-handed if needs be, to assist. And when the Russians failed to intervene in the Warsaw Uprising, Eisenhower agreed that the Allies would support him. The Free French fought fiercely in their battle for Paris. By August 16th, the police, the workers on the Paris Metro and the Postal Service had all gone on strike. By the 20th, the uprising was in full swing, with barricades and trenches appearing everywhere. 
Men, women and children were helping to carry materials on wooden carts for the resistance. The spirit of patriotism was growing. After a short ceasefire, both sides attempted to evaluate the situation. The Germans lacked any depth in numbers, while the resistance lacked the weapons of war, which the Nazis still had an abundance of. By August 22nd, the battle for Paris was back in full swing and the resistance managed to force many of the German army of occupation into retreat. Enraged by this, Hitler demanded that maximum damage was done to the city and Dietrich von Choltitz, the man commanding the German army in Paris, gave the order for the bombing of the Grand Palais. Two days later, the Free French 2nd Armoured Division moved into the centre of Paris, forging ever onward, and General Pierre Bilot, commander of the 1st French Armoured Brigade, appealed to von Choltz's sense of decency with a simply worded observation. I estimate that, from a strictly military point of view, the resistance of German troops in charge of defending Paris cannot be efficient anymore. To prevent any useless bloodshed, it belongs to you to put an end to all resistance immediately. Hitler gave repeated orders not to surrender under any circumstances and is quoted as saying that the French capital must not fall into the enemy's hands except lying in complete debris. Von Choltitz made the hugely difficult and brave decision to disobey these threatening orders and allowed Paris to be taken back by the Free French intact. Triumphantly, Charles de Gaulle made a moving and extremely patriotic speech to the newly liberated people of France, letting the whole world know that we who have lived the greatest hours of our history have nothing else to wish than to show ourselves up to the end worthy of France. Long live France. De Gaulle was appointed president of the provisional government of the French Republic, which immediately came to power. The liberation of Paris was a key event in the Allies' journey to victory in the Second World War, and as the road to Germany lay before them, the race for Berlin was now on. The months of July, August and September 1944 were crucial for the Allies. After the build-up to D-Day and the daring and courageous attacks on the German strongholds along the Normandy coastline, the true enormity of the task that had been undertaken was fully evident. After the relief of the events of June 6th, the Allies now had to face a long, hard push through France to reach Germany. For Adolf Hitler, despite events suggesting that he would never be able to win the war, the determination to fight on was as strong as ever. But the Führer's capacity to make rational decisions was deteriorating, and his own high-ranking officials, including Hermann Göring, Heinrich Himmler and Joseph Goebbels, were having serious doubts about Hitler's ability to lead them for much longer. To consolidate their position in France, the Allies would face many dangers yet, and as the Russians pushed for Berlin from the east, the Western Allies would have political issues to sort out with their Soviet counterparts, as they too had Berlin firmly in their sights. With the end of the war coming into view, the challenges for the free world were as great as they had been back in 1939. But at last it seemed that the hopes and dreams of a new age free from the tyranny of Adolf Hitler were about to be realised.
out an heavy tidings, for which I call upon the house and the nation. formidable Nazi propaganda machine could do little to make Germany's position appear anything but compromised by the beginning of October 1944. For the early part of the war, after Nazi tanks had first stormed into Poland, it appeared that Adolf Hitler was invincible, and as time went on, this was something that the German Führer not only believed, but also took for granted. But ever since the Americans had entered the war to fight for the Allies after the Japanese bombing of the US naval fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hitler and his axis of evil had been put under increasing pressure on a global scale. So, to recap a lot of history to absorb, let's look again at the key points. In North Africa, by late 1942, the Germans had been defeated at the Second Battle of El Alamein as General Bernard Montgomery and the British Eighth Army had taken on Hitler's desert fox, General Erwin Rommel, and won. Montgomery's determination was equal to anything shown by the Germans to date, as typified on the eve of an earlier battle when he had destroyed all contingency plans for withdrawal, telling his officers, if we are attacked, then there will be no retreat. If we cannot stay here alive, then we will stay here dead. It was this remarkable fighting spirit that was beginning to shine through for the Allies, whether fighting in the Europe or Pacific theatre of war that was making all the difference. The tide was fast turning against Hitler. the might of the Soviet Red Army back in 1941 had also resulted in Adolf Hitler getting more of a fight than he'd bargained for. His plans to defeat Russia quickly and decisively through the summer months before the onset of the bitter Soviet winter were dashed as the invading Germans faced fierce resistance. By February 1943, the German Sixth Army had been destroyed after the Battle of Stalingrad, and at the Battle of Kursk later in the year, for the first time, the Nazis' devastating blitzkrieg tactics failed. Elsewhere, after the Allies' triumphant progress in North Africa, Operation Husky targeted Sicily, before pushing on to make a bid for mainland Italy. But by this stage in the war, Adolf Hitler's health was deteriorating, along with his military judgment. However, Hitler's position and that of his Axis compatriots was about to face the biggest threat to date as an Allied invasion force set off from the south coast of England to liberate France and start the push for Berlin. D-Day, June 6, 1944, was a major turning point, and had things not gone in the Allies' favour, the outcome of World War II might still have resulted in a Nazi victory. Even so, the Allies met pockets of German resistance, and despite the success of D-Day, Hitler was not going to give up without a fight. 
and as the summer of 1944, one of the most unseasonable on record, gave way to autumn, the Allies were all too aware that they still had a long, bitter and very dangerous fight ahead of them. Meanwhile, in the East, the Russians were also playing their part, ruthlessly putting the operation, codenamed Bagration, into action. The aim of Bagration was to push all the German forces from what the Republic of Belarus is today back into Poland, and the results were brutal. Historians have described this operation as one of the bloodiest known to man. More importantly for the Allies, it has also been described as the most calamitous defeat of all the German armed forces in World War II. The Red Army made rapid progress and soon reached Poland decimating German army units as they went, inflicting casualties that went beyond 670,000. And with Hitler's forces fully stretched after D-Day, there was no chance of bringing in reinforcements. Such devastating German losses to the east in Operation Bagration, combined with those to the west during D-Day and the months after, quickly became a major cause for concern for the German people, and morale dropped to an all-time low. Hitler needed to do something, and fast, to prove that the Nazis were still in control, and he unveiled his secret weapon. The V-1 had been in production since the beginning of the war, but it was only now that Hitler unleashed the powerful missile on his enemy. Hitler focused the V-1s on London, where immense damage was caused. devastation led to the immediate evacuation of all the children in London, but the British were very quick to deflect these attacks, and out of the 2,452 that were launched, the RAF managed to shoot down over a third. However, a reporting blackout by the British press meant that the Germans had no idea how successful the attacks had been. Although deadly, Hitler's secret weapon had come too late to win in the war. Back in France, a diminishing fuel situation was causing a problem for the Allies, and this stemmed from the lack of deep water ports to ship in supplies. Montgomery, now enjoying the rank of Field Marshal, was busy in the north planning an advance into Germany from Belgium. But Eisenhower advised him to turn his attention to the port of Antwerp in order to open up a useful shipping harbour which would improve the Allies' overall position. Montgomery, always difficult to command, went ahead with the advance he had planned, using the excuse that Eisenhower's strategy needed a combat supply, which was at that time unfeasible. Codenamed Operation Market Garden, Montgomery had pushed forward in late September, with short, sharp, concentrated thrusts across the River Rhine. Rhine was one of the biggest natural barriers that stood between the Allies and Germany, so Market Garden's biggest goal was to secure the bridges intact, which would allow for a fast advance towards Berlin. The market part of the mission referred to the large-scale airborne attack, which was vital for positioning, and the garden part referred to the Grand Troops. The operation to be a success, these two forces needed to work together in perfect unison, but due to the lack of planning, problems began to arise. Previous operations as large as this took months to strategize and rehearse, but the preparations for Market Garden had been completed in just one week with no rehearsal and almost no tactical training. 
Other commanders were concerned about the unpredictable operation, but Montgomery stubbornly stuck to his guns even when shown photographic evidence of menacing lines of tanks very close to some of the landing areas, which he dismissed as being non-serviceable. Operation Market Garden was unsuccessful in part because the fuel situation due to the Allies' failure to secure a port meant that the Germans had enough time to bring in reinforcements and consolidate their position. There were some 20,000 Allied casualties by the time Montgomery was forced to withdraw and precious time had been lost. It was now vital that a solution was found for the fuel problem, because without a steady supply route, the Western Allies' push for Berlin would be seriously thwarted. Just as Eisenhower had wanted in the first place, the Belgian port of Antwerp was the Allies' next target. But as the bitterly hard-fought battle of the Scheldt got underway, it was far from being an easy task for the Allies. The battle began on October 2nd along the Scheldt River, and even though the Germans put up fierce resistance to defend the port, it was eventually secured and immediately brought into service for Allied shipping. The opening of Antwerp combined with the successful capture of the major port of Marseille in the south of France finally put an end to the crippling supply shortage that was threatening the Allies' ever-improving position. The beginning of October also saw the end of the Warsaw Uprising, which is as controversial today as it ever was. The Uprising saw Polish nationals fighting to liberate their capital city from the Germans. It was a major part of the Polish Home Army's Operation Tempest, which aimed to free Poland from the Nazis before the Soviets could take control. It was soon clear, however, that Warsaw was too heavily guarded for the Poles fighting alone, giving the Russians perfect opportunity to settle old scores. After Bagration, the Red Army were less than 10 kilometers away from the struggling Polish Home Army when they were ordered to come to an abrupt halt. The Soviets looked on as the Poles continued to fight a bloody battle for 64 days before finally waving the white flag of surrender. At the heart of the controversy is speculation as to the reasoning behind the Russian leader Joseph Stalin failing to come to the aid of the Polish Home Army. That the Soviets were busy during October is undeniable, and on the 6th they began the Debrecen Offensive in eastern Hungary. If the Russians could secure the area, it would give them a wide open gateway into Germany from the south. The ferocious attack began with the 2nd Ukrainian Front storming past the Hungarian 3rd Army. But then progress slowed, and the Germans were able to build up a strong defensive line. The Soviets treated the civilians of Hungary with utter contempt, committing atrocities that made the Hungarian troops fight even more determinedly, and despite being outnumbered, along with the Germans, they managed to ensure that the Battle of Debrecen ended with the honours even. But the Axis could not hold the Russians at bay for long, and on November 4th, the Red Army managed to secure the Hungarian capital, Budapest, and the surrounding area. October also saw the liberation of Athens. Greece had been invaded by the Italians in 1940, but managed to fight them off until Hitler reluctantly sent in his men in 41. And from then until 1944, Greece was an occupied nation under Axis control. However, the exiled Greek government did manage to raise an army, which became very useful to the Allies in the North African and Italian campaigns. 
At this point in 1944, the Russians were already advancing into Romania and Yugoslavia, and the German forces occupying Greece were strategically withdrawn. They were in danger of being cut off by the Soviet advance, and when the Western Allies took control after liberating Athens, the Greek government in exile returned just over a week later. However, losing occupied territory wasn't the only thing that Hitler now had to worry about. Paranoia and distrust of the people around him was also a growing issue. And this was not without foundation, because there were several assassination attempts made on Hitler's life throughout 1944, but Operation Valkyrie on July 20th came the closest to succeeding. It was only a matter of hours before von Stauffenberg was hunted down and executed, but the extensive investigation to find anyone who was involved was only just beginning. The brutality with which the accused were treated knew no bounds, and even some of Hitler's closest associates were implicated in the plot. The most shocking name to appear was undoubtedly that of Erwin Rommel, Hitler's most trusted desert fox, who had fought so hard for the Nazi cause in North Africa. Rommel had then been singled out for further distinction, as it became obvious through late 1943 into 44 that an Allied invasion of France was becoming ever more likely, and he was given the task of defending the French coast. On July 17th, an air attack had resulted in Rommel's car being bombed, and he was hospitalised with serious head injuries. During his military career, Rommel had always been against some elements of the Nazi regime, especially the maltreatment of Jews, and when it came to the investigations after the July 20th assassination attempt, the Desert Fox came under suspicion. When documents from the coup's headquarters were located, Rommel's name was there, not only as a potential supporter, but also as a possible leader if the assassination and subsequent takeover should prove successful. Even though there was no actual evidence of the conspirators communicating with Rommel, the Nazi inquisitors were on the injured man's case. Unfortunately, while Rommel had been recovering in hospital, he had spoken out about his dissatisfaction with elements of Hitler's regime, and this was counted as positive evidence that he was a traitor to the cause. Head of the Nazi Party Chancellery, Martin Bormann, was convinced that Rommel was guilty and pressed for the case to be put to the People's Court. But on October 14, 1944, Rommel received a visit from two Nazi officers who had a proposition for him to consider. Rommel was, of course, highly respected and a hero of the German people, which is why, no doubt, he was given a choice. The officers informed him that he could either face Bormann and the People's Court, which would also mean the prosecution of his family and staff, or he could take his own life. The latter would mean Rommel received a state funeral, and his family would be given a full pension, and his death would be reported as that of a patriot. Rommel bid his family farewell and left with the two officers who just hours later phoned his wife to say that her husband was dead. The German people were told that Rommel had died of a heart attack and as promised he was buried with full military honours with Hitler sending Field Marshal von Rundstedt as his representative. But as Rommel was laid to rest, the first major battle to take place on German soil was well underway at Aachen. The 
Battle of Aachen began on October 2nd, with the Germans fighting fiercely to defend their city, which was under attack by the Americans. Ironically, during September, the German commander of the city of Aachen had seen his men were going to be seriously outnumbered, so had offered to surrender to the advancing Americans. Somehow, instead of going to the Allies, the letter of surrender was delivered to Adolf Hitler. The unfortunate commander was immediately arrested and German reinforcements sent in. Despite the brave fight put up by the Germans, their efforts were in vain. With the Americans having almost 90,000 more soldiers than their enemy, the battle was going to be one-sided to say the least. But because the Germans were on their own territory, they were able to hold their lines for a while, as well as managing to inflict heavy casualties on the Americans before their inevitable defeat. By the time the battle was concluded as a decisive Allied victory on October 21st, the casualties for both sides were in the region of 5,000. But as the Germans also had 5,600 of their men captured, it was a heavy price to pay in a battle that had been a foregone conclusion. October really was a key month, and it wasn't only in Europe that there was heavy fighting. In the Pacific, the Americans were at last beginning to make headway against the Japanese, and the battles fought between 1943 and 44 were forcing them away from the relative security of their South and Central Island bases. When the Japanese had taken control of the Philippines back in 1942, the American commander of the United States forces in the Far East was General Douglas MacArthur, and President Roosevelt himself had ordered MacArthur to leave the Philippines where he was based. MacArthur was reluctant to depart, feeling the US Army owed it to the people of the Philippines to stay and fight, and even considered resigning his commission to continue as a private soldier. However, in the end, MacArthur followed orders and left for Australia, but not before he had vowed to return to see the Philippines liberated. And on October 20th, 1944, MacArthur and his staff waded knee-deep through the water to march ashore on the Philippine island of Leyte as the American general fulfilled his promise. The Battle of Late Gulf, a body of water to the east of the island, engaged the US and the Imperial Japanese navies and raged between the 23rd and 26th of October. This was considered by many to have been the largest battle at sea of the Second World War, and in fact the whole of naval history, but it can be segregated into four major battles. Fleet Admiral William Halsey was in command for the Americans, and his in-depth planning combined with determined leadership meant that by the 26th the Allies had secured a decisive victory, despite being subject to the first ever organised kamikaze bombings. The troops now fighting for the island would be safe from a sea attack, and although there was still some way to go, the tide in the Pacific was definitely flowing in favour of the USA. Nevertheless, while the outcome in the Pacific was yet far from certain, the Western Allies were, by this time, beginning to believe that victory in Europe and the end of Hitler's reign of terror was in sight. 
As the Russian Red Army made swift and brutal progress, the Americans were discovering that fighting the Germans on their home territory was a dangerous business. A prime example was the Battle of Hürtgen Forest, an area that skirted the border between Belgium and Germany. After the immediate shock of D-Day, the Germans had managed to consolidate their positions and had built up their defences, which was, at last, slowing down the Allied advance. As the Allies moved into Germany, one of their major goals was to clear all of Hitler's troops from this heavily forested area, which would in turn prevent the Germans from reinforcing their front lines further north between Aachen and the River Ruhr. The engagement began on September 19th and became the longest running battle on German ground in World War II. It was also destined to become the longest battle in US history, and as matters would not be concluded until February 1945, these really were the early stages. For the Germans, this was a vital piece of territory to hold, not least because Hitler was still planning a major comeback with his Ardennes Offensive, which would become better known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was to be an important staging area for the many troops, vehicles and armaments required to put the plan into action. The Americans naturally had their own agenda, including taking control of River Ruhr's dam, which could be opened to flood the entire area, something they might either want to do, or more importantly, prevent the Germans from doing. On October 5th, in a first major phase, the US 9th Infantry Division attacked the town of Schmidt, which was a significant link for the German supply chain. The battle was fierce, with both sides needing to hold their position, and it wasn't until October 16th that the struggling 9th Division was reinforced. In just 11 days, 4,500 American troops were lost, serving notice that the Germans were far from beaten, and as a result, the Allied reinforcements came thick and fast, capturing Schmidt by November 3rd. As well as determined German resistance, the terrain was also difficult, with Hürtgen being an extremely dense conifer forest, with hardly any roads, restricting vehicle access. In the few clearings, the Germans had preset their guns to fire with deadly accuracy, and they had also been able to plant minefields that were covered by the winter snow of 1944. Equally, the dense forest caused problems for Allied planes, as there could be little air support for the troops below. The terrain became an even bigger problem in the second phase of the attack, as not only was the weather worse, but also tanks became essential in the battle. American engineers did manage to blast tank routes through the battle zone, but it was a perilous exercise. While the battle continued, the weather and fighting conditions deteriorated, and many lives were lost simply as a result of frostbite, trench foot, and sheer exhaustion. A number of the Americans fighting here had also been involved in the Normandy landings, and some who witnessed the bloody battle for Omaha Beach, where over 3,000 troops were slaughtered, commented that by comparison to the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, Omaha had been a walk in the park. Out of the 120,000 American troops involved in Hurtgen, some 33,000 were killed or incapacitated, and although it resulted in an Allied victory, it was very costly, especially when you consider that German casualties were less than half those suffered by the Americans. 
As time went on, although the capture of Antwerp and its large port had improved the supply situation, getting fuel through to the Allies was continuing to be problematic. The Nazis were still occupying the surrounding areas, and Valkeren Island, with its vantage point overlooking the Scheldt estuary, was guarded by the German 15th Army. Field Marshal Montgomery gave instructions that the Scheldt area was to be targeted, and Operation Infatuate was put in place, with the task of removing the German threat to the Allied fuel supply route given to the 1st Canadian Army. The bombardment of the German defenders began at the end of October. It wasn't until November 1st that the Canadians landed on Valkeren. But the Germans continued to put up a fierce fight until slowly but surely the Canadians cleared each section and the final phase began on November 8th. After days of heavy fighting, some 40,000 German troops from Valkeren Island and the surrounding area surrendered as the Canadian soldiers completed their mission. By the end of November, the port of Antwerp was fully functioning and the Allies' fuel supplies were no longer in question. Shortly after the Allies' amphibious landings at Volcheren, other ports were also captured. And as the numbers rose, the stronger the Allied position became. The port of Zeebrugge in southwest Belgium had also been captured by the Allies in early November, marking the complete liberation of the Belgian nation. It was certainly bad news for Hitler and his vision of a thousand-year Reich, but the German Führer was still not ready to give up his dreams of world domination. Once more, he turned his attention to attacking Great Britain as he unleashed the new improved V-2 missile on London. German engineers had been set to work improving the V-1, which had already dealt the people of Britain a bitter blow. However, the V-1 had given a warning of its arrival due to the loud buzzing sound it made, and refining the V-2 so that it was silent would improve its effectiveness dramatically. Speed and trajectory were also updated, made it almost impossible for the V-2 to be shot down by anti-aircraft guns. The V-2 was the single most expensive project of Hitler's Third Reich, and at 100,000 Reich marks per rocket, the cost eventually became a problem, but not before Hitler, believing this to be a winning weapon, created 6,048 of these deadly rockets. There was also a tragic human price paid in the production of these weapons, as they were manufactured in factories manned by inmates of the Mittelbau Dora slave labour camp, and some 20,000 workers lost their lives before Hitler's new rocket was ready to launch. The first V-2s were fired in August 1944, but it wasn't until mid-November that they really got on target, hitting Britain about eight times a day. When attempts were made to shoot them out of the sky, the massive quantities of artillery shells raining down caused more damage than the rocket itself, and an alternative counter-offensive was needed. It was evident that once the V-2s had been launched, stopping them in their track was nigh on impossible, and the British knew that their only hope of destroying the rockets was to do so before they had even been fired. At first, the RAF attempted to bomb the mobile V-2 launch sites, but this proved to be prohibitively costly at a time when conserving valuable resources was of vital importance. 
The next plan put into operation was to misinform the Germans about the directions in which to launch their weapons. British intelligence worked tirelessly so that false impact reports were sent back, and eventually they managed to get the Germans directing the V-2 rockets to targets in less populated rural areas. Far from solving the problem, such measures just lessened the impact, and so late in the day, the most successful form of counterattack had to be the Allied advance towards Berlin, targeting the V-2 launch sites as they went, pushing them out of range. But this was going to take some time, and as 1944 drew to a close, the V-2s continued to be a very real threat to London and the surrounding areas. Despite the colossal expense of the V-2 project and the undeniable success of the attacks on London, Hitler's miracle weapon would make little difference to the outcome of the war. The spirit of the people of London remained optimistic, although the V-2s could hit at any time as they attempted to go about their daily business. More than 150 shoppers and staff were killed in a single V2 explosion at a Woolworth store, and in total, the V2s claimed the lives of 2,754 British civilians and injured a further 6,500. As a device for punishing his enemies, Hitler's V2s were certainly effective. But when it came to convince his supporters that the Axis powers could still win the war, despite hitting target after target, the V-2s fell short of the mark. It was now obvious that the Third Reich was crumbling, and even Hitler's highest ranking officers were beginning to realize that all hope was lost. But like a wounded animal, the Nazi war machine could still inflict terrible damage and destruction. Hitler was determined to fight on, and as the German position was carefully scrutinized, plans were put in place for one last stand. But it would be a huge undertaking for the remaining troops. They were short of manpower. The Luftwaffe by this stage had been pretty much neutralized by the RAF, and as the Allies' fuel supply improved, the Nazis were left struggling after their Romanian oil fields had been bombed. Hitler knew that he needed to do something big. Even as he became daily more irrational, he would have realized that an outright victory was impossible. But he did believe that he could defend Germany in the long term if he neutralized the Western Front in the short term. As had already been proven, the depleted German units were no match for the brutal Russian Red Army, as their numbers were far too great, so Hitler turned his attention to a plan that would split the Allies, highlighting the difficulties they would face negotiating post-war agreements. He especially wanted the Americans and the British to splinter away from the Soviets, he also believed that the tensions between Montgomery and the American generals could be exploited and used to his advantage. In his desperation, Hitler believed that all he needed to do was buy enough time to produce bigger and more powerful weapons. So plans for a major offensive were drawn up. Military strategists offered many potential operations to Hitler, but only two were put forward for serious consideration. Both targeted the US Army, as Hitler believed that the American public, who'd been reluctant to back Roosevelt's plans to enter the war in the early days, would demand the withdrawal of their husbands and brothers from the European conflict if they were to sustain heavy losses and be defeated in a major battle.
The first plan called for a two-pronged attack on the American troops in Aachen, with a further mission to encircle the US 9th and 3rd Armies as well. Eventually, it was rejected, as there was little chance of it causing an Anglo-American split. The second plan, however, had far more scope. Using their trademark blitzkrieg tactics, the Nazi objective was to split up the American and British lines and capture the port of Antwerp, which would not only cut Allied access to supplies, but also trap four complete armies behind German lines. The operation was given the menacing title, The Watch on the Rhine, but it was destined to be recorded for posterity as The Battle of the Bulge. In September 1944, the area of attack was discussed in detail. Hitler was insistent upon using the Ardennes as the staging area for the battle. A success here in the Battle of France in 1940 had been crucial, and the Allies were unlikely to suspect a Nazi attack coming from this region as they focused on their own push towards Berlin. Many of Hitler's commanders were against the Watch on the Rhine for several different reasons. Some felt that the mountainous terrain was simply too challenging. Others were concerned that if the weather was clear, then the powerful Allied air presence would be able to target the German ground forces with incredible ease, and with the Luftwaffe not able to compete in the skies, the plan would stand little chance of success. Even the commanders put in charge of the operation also had doubts. Field Marshals Walter Modell and Gerd von Brunsted believed that the additional task of capturing the port of Antwerp was too risky and offered an alternative strategy to Hitler, but he insisted that the battle plans go ahead unaltered. The Watch on the Rhine called for 45 divisions with extra units to form a defensive line once battle had commenced. With the manpower shortage the German army was suffering, they could only muster up 30 divisions, and this really was calling upon their last reserves. Full divisions of war veterans and young recruits were grouped together that if matters hadn't been so desperate would have been dismissed as unfit for active service. This really was Hitler's last chance to salvage anything from years of fighting, and he had no choice but to risk all. The Nazis' diminishing fuel supplies were certainly a hindrance, and even pushed back the commencement date from November 27th to December 16th. But this was the very latest date possible if the attack on the Americans was to stand any chance of succeeding. Hitler could not afford for there to be any more delays. German intelligence had calculated that the most likely date for a Soviet attack to open up the road to Berlin would be December 20th. The watch on the Rhine had to have started before this date because Hitler was banking upon Stalin stalling his advance in order to see what the outcome would be if the Americans were attacked. It had been some time since the fates had smiled upon the Germans, and for this operation to go their way, luck would need to play its part. To begin with, the thick fog that blanketed the war zone was very good news for the Germans, as it meant that the Allies' air support could play little part in the battle. Also, the Germans managed to keep their plans highly secret, and the element of surprise would definitely give them a major advantage. The Americans, without doubt, had superior manpower, so it was vital if the Germans were to stand any chance at all for the attack to come as a complete surprise.
Since von Stauffenberg's assassination attempt on Hitler's life had nearly succeeded back in July, security had been tightened. But matters concerning the Ardennes offensive were tracked and controlled to prevent any information whatsoever being leaked to the enemy. Helpfully for the Germans, the French resistance didn't stretch as far as the Ardennes, which meant that the Allies couldn't rely on their local knowledge to pick up what was going on, and German radio traffic was kept to an absolute minimum. Instead, telephones, telegraphs and teleprinters were used by commanders to organise manoeuvres and communications, which meant that one of the Allies' most valuable assets to date, Ultra, which usually intercepted all German operations, became almost useless. The Germans also employed similar tactics to those used by Eisenhower when he'd been planning Operation Overlord, with all movements that were linked to the Ardennes offensive carried out at night under a blanket of darkness. However, despite the lengths that the commanders went to, word did reach Allied intelligence of a possible large-scale German offensive operation, but the Allies could not see how such a course of action would be possible for the almost vanquished Nazis, and the warnings were ignored as they pursued their own agenda, pushing ever closer to Berlin. As a consequence, there was little aerial reconnaissance undertaken by the Allies, and Hitler's master plan quite literally went unnoticed. Beginning at around 5am on December 16th, a devastating bombardment on unsuspecting US troops based in the Ardennes was launched. All the Nazi divisions scheduled to join the attack followed on, and by 8am the battle was well underway. The thick fog that had set in the night before really helped the Germans, making an Allied air response unfeasible, but as conditions worsened, the fog proved less advantageous, as the attacking troops were forced to go at a much slower pace than had been hoped for. With the advantage of surprise, even with very limited troop numbers, the German divisions managed to encircle two American regiments in a pincer movement and forced them to surrender. All around the fighting intensified and the violent battle continued as the weather got increasingly worse and the German advance slowed yet further. Everything started to fall behind schedule, and as the Americans were now all too aware of what was happening, while retreating, they blew up bridges and fuel dumps along the way, which slowed the Germans' progress even more. The Germans' anger and frustration resulted in the captured Americans being treated with utter contempt. Bloody massacres became commonplace as Hitler issued orders for his troops to fight the battle with brutality in order to scare their opponent. And even though the end of the war was in sight, thousands of Americans would be slaughtered in the Ardennes. Just a day after the operation commenced, the Germans captured a US fuel station near the city of Malmedy, and as they moved off, they encountered a small group of American soldiers who, after a brief battle, surrendered. These troops, along with the POWs from the fuel station, were herded into a field and shot, a cowardly and gratuitous act of violence with no advantage gained by the Germans whatsoever. This futile act of brutality was eventually treated as a war crime, and the Malmedy Massacre, as it became known, was tried on May 16, 1946, and the commander responsible for ordering the atrocity was sentenced to death by hanging, along with 42 other members of his division. 
What's more, the occurrence of the Malmedy and similar massacres in the last weeks of 1944 did have a negative impact on the perpetrators. As news reached the Americans fighting throughout the Ardennes, they became more determined than ever to withstand the German attack. A case in point was when the Germans managed to encircle the Americans in Bastogne, and Brigadier General McAuliffe, the US troops commander, received a letter from the Germans demanding an immediate surrender. To the United States Army Commander of the encircled town of Bastogne, the fortune of war is changing. There's only one possibility of saving your encircled troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of this town. If you reject our proposal, six battalions are ready to annihilate you and your troops. All the serious civilian losses would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. What is your answer? Nuts. McAuliffe's one-word reply, nuts, went down in history. And although the Battle of Bastogne raged on, Hitler's dream of a famous last stand that would at the very least salvage some Nazi pride began to fade. The outcome of the Battle of the Bulge would not be decided in 1944, and as the fighting continued through Christmas and into the New Year, the casualty figures for both sides continued to rise. 1945 was destined to bring peace to the world shattered by war, but as the push for Berlin and Hitler's ultimate defeat continued, the days of Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin working together as allies were beginning to draw to an inevitable close. January 1945 was the beginning of the sixth year of the bloodiest and most destructive conflict in human history. In Europe, the heady mood of optimism of winning the war by Christmas, which the British and Americans had believed a distinct possibility in September 1944, had melted away in the face of fierce German resistance. The progress of the armies commanded by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, had been badly affected by supply difficulties and the onset of a bitter winter. And although the Allies had convinced themselves that a conclusive victory was now within their grasp, the race for Berlin would still take some winning.
As the Russian, British and American troops edged ever closer to the German capital, the opening months of 1945 would see some of the most brutal battles of the Second World War as the fight against the Axis powers intensified. This was equally true out in the Pacific too, as the struggle to overcome the Imperial Japanese Army continued. The Allied forces prepared for an attack on mainland Japan, and on a global scale there was a growing sense of hope that the war would soon be over. But while the Nazi and Japanese troops refused to back down, battling fiercely even when staring defeat in the face, there were still months of fighting ahead, with many more lives destined to be lost before victory could be celebrated. Also, with thoughts turning towards rebuilding Europe and the post-war era, the cracks really began to show between the three major Allied powers, as the democratic principles of America and Great Britain were at direct odds with Russia and the brutal communist regime of Joseph Stalin. The race for Berlin was now not only about defeating Adolf Hitler, but also key to the division of territory in the aftermath of the conflict. But for now, there was still a lot of ground to be covered before the war could be won. As the new year of 1945 dawned, in Europe, all eyes were focused on the Battle of the Bulge that was still raging. Two weeks before, on December 16th, a quiet, thinly held sector of the American front line on the Belgian-German frontier had suddenly been torn apart by a massive Nazi offensive. The hills and woods of the Ardennes, the scene of Germany's great blitzkrieg offensive of May 1940, once more reverberated to the crash of artillery and the squeal of panzer tracks as Adolf Hitler's last desperate gamble in the West began. As the Germans pushed into Belgium, Hitler's immediate objective was the River Meuse, but the real strategic prize was the port of Antwerp, which lay another 80 miles away. The loss of this vital supply centre would have spelt catastrophe for Eisenhower's armies, but there was also a more sinister edge to the campaign, as Hitler aimed to encircle the US troops and destroy them. With only three American infantry divisions standing in the way of half a million German troops, supported by nearly 1,000 tanks and assault guns, the surprise attack was a staggering success. Despite US troops fiercely resisting the Nazi onslaught, after seven days of fighting, Operation Watch on the Rhine quite literally punched a bulge in the American front line, which was 50 miles wide and 40 miles deep. Therefore, the Battle of the Bulge was so named. But as the days passed and Allied reinforcements poured in to defend the area, Hitler soon discovered that despite taking an early advantage, he had underestimated the strength of the enemy. Before long, the commanders of the 5th and 6th SS Panzer Armies realised that their troops were simply not strong enough to reach Antwerp or even the Meuse. With fuel running low and Allied bombers pounding their supply routes, the advance of the 6th SS Panzer Army was stalled. By Christmas Day, the offensive in the Ardennes had run out of steam. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, Hitler's Axis partners, the Japanese, were continuing to struggle against the Allied advance. By the end of 1944, Japan's empire was rapidly shrinking as the pressure mounted. In 
northern Burma. A British Imperial Army, led by General Bill Slim, supported by American air power, had instigated an offensive to recover the entire country. And further east, Powerful American amphibious forces based on the Mariana Islands and New Guinea had invaded late in the thousand-mile-long Philippines island chain. The US Navy also had a few scores of their own to settle, and in the Battle of Late Gulf that followed, they managed to wipe out most of the Japanese Navy, including all its remaining aircraft carriers. To the satisfaction of U.S. commanders, the victory saw the attack on Pearl Harbor finally avenged. By November 1944, mainland Japan was also beginning to feel the Americans' wrath at first hand. From airfields in the Mariana Islands, 1,400 miles away, giant long-range B-29 Super Fortress bombers launched their first raids on Tokyo and other Japanese cities. The next stage in the Pacific campaign was underway, and planning now began for a full assault on the Japanese mainland, as preparations were made to invade the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And while the Americans were pleased with their progress in the Pacific, far away in Moscow, Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin was also feeling very satisfied with the way the war was going. While the British and the Americans were battling to keep Hitler's panzers at bay in the Ardennes, the Red Army was busy building up its reserves for a massive new offensive in central Poland. The Soviet's main objective was to target the coal mines and steel mines of Upper Silesia, Germany's easternmost industrial region. However, sensing final victory in the air, Stalin had his sights set on Berlin, and the way things were going, the Red Army would get them months ahead of the British and the Americans. On January 1st, New Year's Day 1945, on a dozen battlefields scattered across the globe, it was just another day of death and destruction. In Western Europe, the battle continued in the Ardennes. The Nazi bid for Antwerp in the north had failed miserably, but the 5th Panzer Army that had stormed through the central Ardennes was still battling on for control of Bastogne. This was one of the few Belgian towns where the road network of the Ardennes converged, and if captured, it would clear the way to the Meuse. Unfortunately for the Nazis, the Americans defending the town belonged to the 101st Airborne Division, who were very possibly the finest soldiers in the entire United States Army. In late December, they'd been joined by three divisions of the U.S. 3rd Army, sent by Lieutenant General George Blood and Guts Patton. Spurred on by the flamboyant Army commander, who ordered them to drive like hell, tanks and motorized infantry succeeded in breaking through the 5th Panzer Army's lines, and between Christmas and New Year, Bastogne had been wrestled from the Germans. However, the Battle of the Bulge was far from being over because the bloodiest battles of the Winter War in the Ardennes were still to come. Refusing to give up the fight by January 1945, the 5th Panzer Army launched fresh assaults on American forces, now six divisions strong.
Hitler also had further plans that he hoped would shatter the Allied defences. And at mid-morning on New Year's Day, hundreds of Luftwaffe fighter bombers roared low over Belgium and the southern Netherlands. Luftwaffe chief Hermann Göring's contribution to the ground offensive in the Ardennes, Operation Baseplate, was underway at last. Streaking low over the countryside, the attackers sprayed airfields with gunfire and bombs, and within hours, 465 British and American aircraft had been destroyed or badly damaged. However, the cost to Göring's airmen had been extremely high. 277 German planes had been shot down, and while the Allied air forces could easily replace the aircraft they had lost, the Luftwaffe would find it virtually impossible to replace its dead fighter pilots. It was without doubt a busy New Year's Day for the Nazis, because fierce fighting also erupted along the Allied front line between the River Saar and Switzerland, as Operation North Wind, Hitler's latest and in fact his last offensive in the West, began. Timed to exploit the difficulties faced by Eisenhower in the Ardennes, troops from two German army groups hurled themselves at positions manned by American and French troops on a 70-mile front in Alsace-Lorraine. However, unlike the surprise Ardennes offensive, this time the Allies were prepared, and although the Germans succeeded in gaining some ground, they did not achieve their objective. Having failed to divert Allied troops from the Ardennes to the front further south in Alsace-Lorraine, by January 6th, the Germans had abandoned all hope of capturing Bastogne. This gave Eisenhower the opportunity to assemble his forces on both flanks of the bulge. In the north, American and British troops were under the command of Field Marshal Montgomery with the 21st Army Group, and in the south, the 3rd US Army was under Patton's command. Ordered by Eisenhower to launch a converging attack on the Germans in the Bulge, their immediate objective was the crossroads town of Hufalitz. Only 25 miles separated Montgomery and Patton's troops, but as temperatures plunged below zero and the bitter winter weather set in, progress was soon reduced to just a mile a day. Frozen roads slowed up tanks and motorized units. Engine oil froze up, and infantrymen discovered that their rifles and machine guns wouldn't work. There were also the added risks of landmines planted in the snow, which were becoming another serious menace. Whereas Allied infantry were unused to advancing through deep snow drifts and frozen roads, the Germans had already experienced extreme winter weather fighting in Russia and were much better prepared for the icy conditions. Even so, despite the problems the bitter winter posed for the Allies, even Hitler soon realized that the game in the Ardennes was up. On January 8th, he gave his frontline commanders permission to abandon the bulge west of Hufelitz, and seven badly battered panzer divisions pulled back through the town as Allied artillery pounded their lines of retreat. As the troops under Montgomery and Patton kept up their dogged pursuit of the retreating German forces, by January 16th, they recaptured Hufelitz, and by the end of the month, the Allied front line was back exactly where it had been six weeks earlier. Hitler's gamble in the Ardennes had failed, and the watch on the Rhine had resulted in a devastating loss of life on both sides. Oh.
The Germans had suffered 91,000 casualties, and although the Allies had won the offensive, they'd fared little better. Amongst the American forces, casualties were shockingly high, reaching 89,000, with 19,000 of those being fatalities. As the bodies were counted, the Battle of the Bulge emerged as the costliest American campaign of the Second World War, what's more. The engagement not only took its toll in humanitarian terms, because for the Anglo-American High Command it opened several old grievances that had been festering for some considerable time. Just four days after the Ardennes offensive had started back in 44, Eisenhower had ordered Montgomery to take temporary command of all British and American forces on the northern side of the Bulge. Militarily, the decision made perfect sense, because the German offensive had upset the existing American command structure, but not everyone was happy with the arrangement. U.S. General Omar Bradley, who was renowned for getting on well with everyone, disliked Montgomery intensely, having had difficulties working with him in the past, protested fiercely, and although Monty quickly brought stability to the northern side of the bulge, his self-promoting attitude upset and annoyed the Americans. After telling the U.S. generals that their broad front strategy was to blame for the current crisis, he went on to infuriate them even further at a press conference on January 7th by giving the impression that he alone had rescued them from disaster. Livid with rage, Bradley and Patton threatened to resign unless Montgomery was removed from command of the Northern Bulge. To keep the peace, Montgomery eventually apologised for his tactless remarks, which kept his position secure, but the bad feeling continued as the focus switched to the strategic direction of the campaign. The British, including Montgomery with the backing of Churchill and his military advisers, continued to argue in favour of a quick, narrow thrust aimed at the German capital, Berlin. Eisenhower, however, was not prepared to implement such a strategy, being very aware of the vast numbers of men that would be lost in the process, especially as the American troops now outnumbered the British in Northwest Europe by more than three to one. Meanwhile, in the Soviet camp, Joseph Stalin had his own agenda. Since August 1944, powerful German forces had kept the Soviets pinned down in central Poland, 500 miles to the east of Berlin. Therefore, instead of pushing on towards the Nazi capital, Stalin had elected to invade the Balkan states in southeast Europe. Brushing aside less powerful German forces, Soviet troops poured into Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, overrunning the Ploisty oil fields vital to the Nazi war economy and triggering the collapse of the pro-Nazi regimes in Bucharest and Sofia. By November, Belgrade, the Yugoslav capital, had fallen to the Red Army and local communist partisans. But in the following month, Soviet forces advancing across the Hungarian plains were prevented from taking the capital Budapest as the Hungarian army, supported by strong German reinforcements, fought back furiously. But all the while, German High Command had been watching the Red Army pour reinforcements beyond its front on the River Vistula in central Poland with growing anxiety.
Army Group A, the German soldiers responsible for defending this sector could only muster 400,000 men and little more than a thousand tanks. It was a desperate situation, and by late December, Army Chief of Staff Colonel General Heinz Guderian pleaded with Hitler to halt the Ardennes offensive and send more reinforcements to the Eastern Front. The Nazi Führer ignored the request was more cut off from the reality of the deteriorating situation than ever. When early in the new year, he was given a report by German military intelligence identifying no less than 225 infantry divisions and 22 armoured corps in the Red Army's order of battle on the Eastern Front, he had exclaimed, who is responsible for producing all this rubbish? Whoever he is, he should be sent to a lunatic asylum. In fact, the Red Army outnumbered the 400,000 German troops of Army Group A by 5 to 1, and on January 12th, the long-awaited Soviet offensive began. As a fierce artillery barrage shattered the calm, over the next 72 hours, three Soviet army groups made up of some 3 million troops, 10,000 tanks, 20,000 artillery pieces and 7,000 aircraft burst out of their bridgeheads on the Vistula. Their main objective was the coal field and steel plants in Upper Silesia, the one German industrial area that had largely escaped Allied bombing. But Stalin and his closest military advisers also had a much greater prize in mind. They were determined to get to Berlin before the British and the Americans. Three notorious Soviet commanders had been given the task of leading the Red Army towards the German capital and fulfilling Stalin's hopes and dreams. Marshal Konev, Marshal Rakovsky and the Soviet Army's most famous battlefield commander, Marshal Zhukov. Together, they would storm westwards across the war-torn Polish landscape, edging closer to Berlin by the day. By January 17th, the ruined Polish capital Warsaw had been seized from the Nazis, and as the Red Army continued to advance, soon German civilians from all around the Reich's eastern provinces began to flee. While more territory fell, Nazi guards running labor and concentration camps also began joining the exodus to the west, and with them came hundreds of thousands of Jewish slave laborers. Starving and racked by illness, tragically thousands would die as they marched westwards through the snow. Many of these bedraggled figures came from the notorious camp of Auschwitz, which was soon to be liberated by the Soviets. Only a few thousand prisoners remained when the Russian soldiers arrived on January 27, 1945, and as the ruins of gas chambers and crematoria were uncovered, the true extent of the unimaginable atrocities committed by the Nazis was revealed. At least one and a half million people had died at Auschwitz, and for those liberating the camp, it was undoubtedly a chilling and disturbing experience to walk within its walls.
As the remorseless advance of the Soviets continued, however, Hitler's reign of terror was clearly ending. As the Red Army continued their march west, to the horror and dismay of the Nazis, the Russians quickly crossed what had been the pre-war German-Polish border. On January 31st, Zukov's spearhead reached the River Oder at Kostrin, and on February 13th, Konev's first Ukrainian front caught up with them and dug in to create a 50-mile wide front along the River Nice. In just four weeks, the Red Army had advanced 450 miles and Soviet troops were now just 50 miles from Berlin. With practically the whole of Eastern Europe under Soviet control, Stalin was in a confident mood and in a very powerful position. There was no doubt that Germany faced imminent defeat, and while Britain and America still held their ground to the west, Churchill and Roosevelt were keen to discuss the final phase of the conflict and how to restore order in post-war Europe. At the beginning of February, Stalin persuaded Churchill and Roosevelt to travel to the Soviet Union to meet him at the Black Sea coastal resort of Yalta in the Crimea. The American president was keen to nurture and consolidate relations with the Soviet leader, but beneath his cheerful exterior, as Winston Churchill arrived at the airfield, he harbored a deep mistrust of Stalin's intentions. Nevertheless, there were agreements to be made, and setting aside personal opinions, on February 4th, the Big Three and their senior military and diplomatic advisers sat down at the Livadia Palace to an intense round of negotiations that would last a full eight days. Ironically, first and foremost on the agenda was Poland, the nation Hitler had stormed into way back in 1939, forcing Britain and France to declare war on Germany. Churchill was insisting upon free and fair elections for the Poles. In fact, both he and the American president agreed that all liberated European and former Axis countries should be given the right to democratic elections. Also, of utmost importance to Roosevelt was ensuring Stalin joined the New World Order, the United Nations, and to secure his assistance in the war against Japan. The Soviet leader agreed to participate in the war against Imperial Japan three months after Germany had been defeated, as well as agreeing to join the United Nations. However, he asked a high price in return for his assistance in the Pacific War. For a start, Stalin wanted the recognition of Soviet interests in Mongolia and Manchuria, which were nominally part of China. He also wanted access to Port Arthur in Korea and possession of the Kuril Islands, then occupied by the Japanese. Roosevelt's military chiefs had many reservations about agreeing to such demands, but even so, their president agreed to each request. By the time the Yalta conference ended, Stalin had got exactly what he wanted, but only after the war's conclusion would Britain and America realize that a democratic and liberal world was the last thing on the Soviet leader's mind. Under his control, Eastern Europe would be swiftly engulfed into the communist regime. However, entering the final phase of the war, and considering the future of Germany, the Big Three were all of one accord. They would accept nothing short of an unconditional surrender. With the Red Army ready to attack Berlin from the east, Stalin asked that the British and Americans provide practical help for his troops. Heavy Allied bombing raids on railway centers in eastern Germany would interrupt the flow of Nazi reinforcements to the front to face Zukov and Konev's army groups. 
as thousands of bombers were available for frontline service in England and Italy, it was a request that the British and Americans could easily accommodate. And as military teams present at Yalta agreed to the Soviet request for assistance, one target loomed large on the maps of the Allied bomber chiefs. It was the German city of Dresden, famous for its many architectural splendours, including several magnificent palaces, and was much admired as the Baroque jewel on the River Elbe. But as well as being renowned for its beauty, Dresden was also a hub for industry, producing many commodities for the German war effort, with the benefit of an important regional railway centre. So far, it had escaped heavy Allied bombing because of its distance from the RAF bases, but soon after the Yalta conference, all this would change. Over the course of the 13th and 14th of February, 700 RAF heavy bombers took off and were soon swarming above the city. Before long, thousands of incendiaries and high-explosive bombs were being released onto Dresden's elegant streets and avenues, and a terrifying firestorm took hold. By the time the bombardment ended, the city was reduced to rubble and ruins, and thousands of people had lost their lives. According to official figures, anything from 21,000 to 35,000 people had been killed, but the railway, which the raid had aimed to cripple, was left undamaged. However, the destruction of Dresden did little to affect the outcome of the war, and the huge death toll presented Nazi propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels with a unique opportunity to embarrass RAF Bomber Command and its chief air marshal, Sir Arthur Harris. As the news of the loss of the city's magnificent palaces and cathedral, along with the rumours of 200,000 dead, all cleverly exaggerated by Goebbels, was circulated in neutral Swedish and Swiss newspapers, the British Foreign Office became suitably alarmed. But the devastation caused by Allied bombing raids was not confined to Europe, because far away in the Pacific, US Major General Curtis LeMay was coordinating attacks on Imperial Japan that would prove just as horrifying as the attack on Dresden. Giant Boeing B-29 Super Fortresses had been raiding Tokyo and other Japanese cities from bases in the Mariana Islands since November 1944. But when the attacks didn't prove as effective as LeMay had hoped, by January 1945 he had decided to make drastic changes to his strategy. The majority of Japan's town and city dwellers lived in houses made of wood and paper, so LeMay realised that incendiaries would cause the greatest possible devastation. He therefore decided that low-altitude night attacks would prove far more effective than high-altitude daylight raids. On February 24th, 11 days after the annihilation of Dresden, the Americans launched their first night raid on Tokyo, with 170 B-29s carrying only incendiaries in their bomb bays. The resulting fires destroyed one square mile of the city, and this raid was just the beginning. Two weeks later, on the night of March 9th, LeMay organised a much bigger attack on the Japanese capital, dispatching 325 B-29s. Crammed into their bays were bombs filled with highly flammable magnesium, phosphorus and napalm, while their defensive guns were removed to increase the range and payload. As the aircraft took off, the weather conditions were perfect for the attack, the air was dry and strong winds were blowing, which would ensure the fires spread swiftly around the city. 
flying in streams ranging from 5 to 9,000 feet above the target to confuse artillery fire, the American bombers were soon looming above the city. The sky quickly lit up as nearly 1,700 tons of incendiaries were dropped in three hours. As fierce winds whipped up the flames, the fire began to rapidly scythe its way through the streets lined with wooden huts. As tens of thousands of people tried to escape, their routes were blocked by vast walls of fire and they had little hope of survival. 16 square miles of the city were consumed by flames and by daybreak, the bodies, reduced to ashes, were simply scattering like sand. More than 100,000 souls had perished in the flames. It was the deadliest air raid in the whole of the Second World War and had cost US Bomber Command only 14 B-29s. Between March 1945 and August 15th, when the Japanese finally surrendered, Curtis LeMay's bomber crews would wreck 64 Japanese cities, cripple the nation's war industries, and reduce two and a half million buildings to rubble. The Japanese put the civilian death toll at more than one million people. Seven decades later, the controversy generated by the fire raids on Dresden and Tokyo still haunts the world. Nevertheless, at the time, advocates of area bombing, like Air Marshal Bomber Harris and Major General LeMay, justified the tactic, claiming it helped to win the war. Even so, by 1945, Japan still showed no sign of surrendering. And although the Allies had been steadily winning back territory from the grip of the Empire of the Rising Sun, there were still many bitter battles ahead. While American troops continued the fight to reclaim land they'd lost to Imperial Japan at the outbreak of the Pacific War, by January 1945, General Douglas MacArthur was preparing for the next step in the recapture of the Philippines. With Leyte and Mindoro secure, the next step in the campaign to avenge the American defeat of 1942 was the invasion of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines chain. On January 9th, 175,000 American troops belonging to Lieutenant General Walter Kruger's 6th Army landed on the south shore of Lingayen Gulf on Luzon. Defending the territory on the ground, Japan's General Yamashita understood American forces had the upper hand in firepower and mobility. As a result, he ordered his 170,000 Japanese soldiers to retreat deep into the jungle, where he hoped they would have a better opportunity to overcome the opposition. But while the struggle continued throughout January, by the end of the month, Kruger's army was closing in on the Philippines' capital, Manila, and the Japanese realized that their grip on the island was slipping. Meanwhile, secondary landings by more U.S. amphibious forces and paratroopers had come to support Kruger's army. By February 3rd, the first American troops had reached Manila. Three years earlier, defeated American soldiers had walked through the streets with their general, Jonathan M. Wainwright, subdued and bedraggled as the Japanese looked on in triumph. Those that had survived the ordeals of the last few years were still being held prisoner, along with many civilians, and it was Kruger's first objective to liberate the thousands of people who were still suffering in the Japanese prison camps. Mm -hmm. 
As the 1st and 8th US Cavalry Divisions and Filipino guerrillas advanced into the northern outskirts of the city, 6,000 civilian, Filipino, American and British Commonwealth citizens were discovered interned at the University of Santo Tomas, as well as 1,000 American prisoners of war in Bilibid Prison. Meanwhile, two commando raids organized by American special forces liberated hundreds of starving, disease-ridden captives in camps at Cabanatuan and Los Banos. While fighting erupted all over the city, the prisoners were soon set free and evacuated to safety as every effort was made to regain control of Manila. Ironically, just like MacArthur back in December 41, Yamashita had wanted to spare the beautiful capital of the Philippines from destruction and had ordered his troops out of the city. However, 16,000 Japanese naval troops and nearly 4,000 soldiers led by Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi disobeyed his orders and reoccupied the city, as fighting quickly escalated in what has been recorded in the history books as the worst urban battle of the Pacific theater of war. Manila's civilian population found themselves caught up in the deadly crossfire. Many people were killed, with thousands shot or bayoneted as Iwabuchi's men ran amok. Filipino women and girls were hunted down, raped and murdered by the score, and as the Americans continued to bombard the city with aerial raids and tank attacks, even more lives were lost. The fighting didn't end until March 3rd, when the Japanese garrison had been entirely wiped out, by which time civilian deaths had risen to staggering proportions. But for the Americans and Filipinos alike, victory had come at a high price. There were 6,000 US casualties, with more than 1,000 fatalities, and while the city lay in ruins, the civilian death toll rose to an estimated 100,000. These were terrible times for the people of Manila, and while the Americans attempted to restore order, as civilians tried to piece their shattered lives back together, the Allied plans to invade Japan continued at an even more determined pace. In fact, as the battle for Manila had been raging, a huge American amphibious invasion force, made up of the aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers and destroyers of the 5th US fleet, was steaming towards the island of Iwo Jima, 800 miles south of mainland Japan. Normally uninhabited, Iwo Jima was barely four miles long and a little over two miles at its widest point. Dominating its southern end was Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano 546 feet high. The plan was to convert this pile of rock and volcanic ash into one big airstrip for General Curtis LeMay's B-29 Super Fortresses and P-51 Mustang Fighter Escorts. This would bring LeMay's bombers one step closer to Tokyo and assist in terrorizing Japan cities. The attack on Iwo Jima started with 10 weeks of heavy bombing and three days naval bombardment to break down Japanese defenses. Then at 2 a.m. on February 19th, Operation Detachment, the invasion of Iwo Jima began. As a storm of high explosives and steel lashed the island, 70,000 US Marines braced themselves for an assault landing, and just before 9 a.m., the first waves of US Marines hit the beach. Much to their surprise, they found no sign of the enemy, and for a moment, they thought that the weeks of bombing and shelling had destroyed the Japanese defenses. However, the reality of the situation was quite the opposite. And the massive American bombardment had left Iwo Jima's 23,000-strong garrison virtually unharmed, hidden away in an extensive complex of tunnels, bunkers, weapons pits and gun emplacements. 
Suddenly, the air was filled with the thunder of the heaviest mortar and artillery fire that many of the American troops had ever seen, much of it from gun emplacements on Mount Suribachi. The scene was described by one reporter as a nightmare from hell. Nevertheless, despite the growing number of casualties, the American forces slowly edged closer towards the base of Mount Suribachi. This resulted in the containment of the Japanese troops defending the mountain, and on the fifth day of the invasion, February 23, 1945, a marine patrol managed to reach the summit and unfurl the Stars and Stripes. A short time later, five U.S. Marines and a U.S. Navy medic raised a second and much larger American flag over Mount Suribachi, and the dramatic photograph taken of the event was soon circulating around the world. It came to symbolize the raw courage of the U.S. Marine Corps, but the battle for Iwo Jima was far from over. Three of the men in Joe Rosenthal's stirring photograph were killed shortly afterwards as the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions, reinforced by the 3rd U.S. Marine Division, proceeded to clear the rest of the island. The Marines suffered extremely heavy casualties as they fought for Iwo Jima, quite literally, yard by yard. Over the course of a month's bitter fighting, the Japanese on Iwo Jima were gradually dragged from their underground hideouts, but it cost the lives of many Americans. On March 16th, Iwo Jima was declared officially secure, but another five days passed before the Japanese command post on the northwest side of the island was located and destroyed. Finally, on March 26th, after 35 days of the bitterest fighting, the battle was over. Of the island's 23,000 strong Japanese garrison, barely 1,000 had survived as prisoners of war. Although the Allies now had a base one step closer to Japan, from where Curtis LeMay could launch his terror bombing, the fighting on Iwo Jima was a grim foretaste of the ordeal that lay in store for the sailors, soldiers and marines assigned to the Americans' next big operation in the Pacific. In the battle against Japan, this was to be the invasion of Okinawa, and while the Marines prepared themselves for yet another battle, back in northwest Europe, the Allied armies, commanded by General Eisenhower, were ready for the end game. Their aim was to eliminate all German forces west of the River Rhine, and in so doing, set the stage for the final drive into the heart of Nazi Germany. Field Marshal Montgomery's troops began the attack with Operation Veritable as British and Canadian troops targeted German positions over a narrow stretch of territory between the Mar and the Lower Rhine on February 8th. Support was expected from the American 9th Army as they launched Operation Grenade to cross the River Ruhr further south, but in response, German engineers blew up the dams that controlled the rivers in the target area, causing extensive flooding. It was clear that Operation Grenade would have to be postponed until the water level dropped. Finally, on February 23rd, Operation Grenade got underway as the 9th US Army began its assault across the River Ruhr, while General Omar Bradley's 12th US Army Group launched its own race for the River Rhine in Operation Lumberjack. On March 7th, soldiers belonging to the 9th U.S. Armored Division seized the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen before its astounded German defenders had time to set the demolition charges properly. With lightning speed, General Bradley ordered the 1st U.S. Army to rush as many troops as possible across the bridge. General Patton was also active, and by March 21st, under his command, the 3rd U.S. Army had surrounded the German divisions in his sector. 24 hours later, Patton's men had crossed the Rhine between Mainz and Mannheim, and their bridgehead was secure.
In six weeks, the Germans had lost 290,000 troops west of the Rhine. With the Allies across the last natural major obstacle in the West, there was little the Nazis could do to prevent the British and Americans advancing all the way to Berlin. As the British Prime Minister arrived on March 24th, he crossed the Rhine and set foot on its eastern bank in a truly symbolic moment. Churchill was now eager to press on towards Berlin. With so many Allied servicemen already lost in bitter battles, on March 28, 1945, Eisenhower took decisive action to begin the final stage of the campaign for Northwest Europe. Much to Churchill's dismay, Eisenhower, who was intent on keeping Allied casualties to a minimum, declared that Berlin was no longer a major military objective, leaving the task of securing Hitler's last stronghold to the Russians. Scarcely believing the news, to the east, Stalin ordered Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Konev to the Kremlin to plan the Red Army's final offensive against Nazi Germany. Soon the Soviets would begin their advance, and in just two months, the European war would be over. But for now, the final countdown for Berlin had only just begun, and the most important battle of all was about to be played out. In April 1945, the Second World War was nearing its conclusion. In Europe, Allied armies were driving ever further into Nazi Germany from the east and west, and victory was quite literally within their sights. Adolf Hitler, once the triumphant master of an empire that stretched from the Pyrenees to the Volga, the writing was on the wall. Now a Berlin recluse in his underground bunker, surrounded by only his most loyal supporters, the Führer's every word still meant life or death for the German people and the millions of foreign slave labourers and concentration camp inmates in Nazi captivity. Before the guns would be finally silenced, hundreds of thousands of innocent souls would perish in the flames and rubble of the dying Third Reich. On the opposite side of the world, Hitler's Axis partner, Imperial Japan, had been left reeling by the Americans fighting out in the Pacific theatre of war. Sustained by the world's greatest economy, the reach and sheer power of the USA was by now simply staggering. 
Huge amphibious armies, protected by massive naval forces, were leapfrogging across the Pacific ever closer to Japan, and giant B-29 bombers were raining fire and high explosives onto its cities. In the waters around Japan, American submarines had almost run out of ships to sink, and in the meantime, the Japanese population, some 90 million strong, faced economic collapse and starvation. In the Far East, British troops had recaptured Burma from the Japanese, who had been in occupation since 1942. Back in London, Prime Minister Churchill was receiving equally encouraging news from the fighting on all fronts. Even so, after five years of steering the nation through the stormy waters of war, Churchill was weary and anxious about the future. The old warrior was concerned that the British Empire, exhausted and financially drained by such lengthy fighting, would be sidelined as the endgame came into view by its more powerful American and Russian allies. Winston Churchill had undeniably given his all for king and country, and an Allied victory promised to be his finest hour. But he was wise to be cautious. Quite incredibly, his own future as the nation's Prime Minister was far from assured. As April 1st, 1945 dawned, three weeks had passed since the first American troops had seized the Ludendorff Bridge over the River Rhine at Remagen before the Germans had been able to demolish it. The rest of the 46 road and rail bridges that had spanned the Rhine had all been blown up. And ironically, the Ludendorff Bridge collapsed under the shock of constant near misses by German artillery fire and air attacks just 10 days after the first US Army had used it to secure a bridgehead on the east bank of the Rhine. The Rhine was the only major natural obstacle between the armies led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allied Supreme Commander in Europe, and the rest of Germany. Once the Rhine had been crossed, the rest of the German nation would be accessible, and Eisenhower's troops might well have reached Berlin before the Red Army, who had been held up at the River Oder, 90 miles beyond the city since the end of January. When Eisenhower had assumed total command of ground operations in September 1944, his land campaign in northwest Europe had its critics, one of the most vociferous being Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. Monty led the 21st Army Group as the Allies really started to make progress in Germany through March and into April 1945. Charged with putting Operation Plunder into action, Montgomery's 21st Army Group saw Canadian, British and American troops cross the Rhine near Vessel. Montgomery's men captured all their objectives, sustaining only minor losses within hours. However, Operation Varsity, in which two Allied airborne divisions were dropped beyond the east bank of the Rhine, did not fare so well, suffering heavy casualties. Watching the drama unfold in the skies from the relative safety of the west bank of the Rhine was none other than Churchill himself. Always keen to visit the front whenever he could, Churchill had travelled to General Eisenhower's tactical headquarters overlooking the river. As ever, Churchill was determined to throw himself into the centre of the action, and much to Eisenhower's dismay, the British Prime Minister, now in his 70s, leapt into an American landing craft and crossed the Rhine. But Winston had more to contemplate than Eisenhower worrying about his personal safety, with the looming division of Europe into two rival ideological and military blocs. Thank you. 
Churchill believed that the now ailing American President Franklin D. Roosevelt seriously underestimated the danger posed by Joseph Stalin and the Russians. The British Prime Minister wanted Eisenhower and the Western Allies to advance all the way to Berlin before the Soviets could get there, but Eisenhower regarded the destruction of German military power as his primary mission. Berlin was not his main priority. But for the time being, with German artillery spotters and snipers still active on the east bank of the Rhine, Eisenhower's immediate task was to persuade Churchill to return to the comparative safety of the west bank before he got hurt. While the delicate negotiations were taking place to retrieve Churchill, 150 miles further upstream, the 3rd U.S. Army's 5th Infantry Division had strategically, and without any of Montgomery's pomp and circumstance, crossed the Rhine at Oppenheim. With little love lost between the 3rd U.S. Army's commander, the flamboyant American General George Blood and Guts Patton, and Montgomery, and with old scores to settle, Patton would have been delighted to get across the Rhine before Monty's 21st Army Group. In fact, Patton managed to lead five divisions across the Rhine at Oppenheim, where there was little opposition, ensuring that the road to Berlin and victory in Europe was now wide open. But German resistance to the Allied advance was weakening daily, with a home guard made up of old men and young boys who were as afraid of what would happen as the beleaguered civilian population. And worse was to come for them, because from the safety of his bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery building in Berlin, Hitler demanded that the battle should be conducted without consideration for our own population. Ordering the destruction of all industrial plants, the main electricity works, water works, gas works, together with all food and clothing stores to create a desert for the advancing allies, Germany's Führer declared, If the war is lost, the German nation will also perish. There is no need to consider what the people require for continued existence. April 1st, 1945 was actually Easter Sunday, a traditional day of celebration for the Christian Church. For the Allies, there was increasing cause for celebration. As Montgomery's 21st Army Group advanced, they were flanked by the American 9th Army, forming the northern pincer of a giant encircling maneuver around the Ruhr, Germany's industrial heartland, while the 1st US Army formed the southern pincer. Units from the two American armies met near Lippstadt, and 72 hours later, the encirclement of the Ruhr pocket was complete. Within this slowly shrinking perimeter were the remnants of 21 divisions, totaling 430,000 German soldiers of Army Group B, together with millions of tired, hungry and frightened German civilians and foreign slave laborers, all trapped and at the mercy of the Allies. There were also considerable advances being made in the Pacific, with the Americans preparing for Operation Iceberg. The target was Okinawa, only 340 miles from southern Japan, and the largest in the Ryukyu chain of islands. If an amphibious landing was successful, Okinawa would provide the Americans with a springboard for the final invasion of mainland Japan. Less than a week earlier, Iwo Jima, the first island in the Japanese archipelago to be invaded by the Americans, had finally been declared secure after six weeks of bitter fighting.
immortalized by photographs and film showing U.S. Marines and a U.S. Navy medic raising the Stars and Stripes on top of Mount Suribachi five days after the first landings on February 19th, the Iwo Jima fighting had cost the lives of 6,825 American and 21,703 Japanese soldiers. Although an Allied victory, the Battle of Iwo Jima was a chilling prelude to Operation Iceberg. For the invasion of Okinawa, the Americans assembled a force of 102,000 soldiers, 88,000 Marines and 18,000 Navy personnel under Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., commander of the 10th U.S. Army. Supporting Buckner's troops was a massive fleet of 1,600 ships, including 40 aircraft carriers, 80 battleships, 32 cruisers, and 200 destroyers. The warships lying offshore and the carrier-borne aircraft were at battle stations, ready to blast Okinawa into submission. At 6 a.m., the bombardment of the beaches at Hagushi began, and after three hours, the intense naval barrage ceased, and troops of the 3rd Amphibious Corps and 24th Army Corps stormed ashore. Much to the Americans' surprise, however, the assault waves encountered no opposition at all. Follow-up troops rapidly headed inland, and by noon, they had taken their immediate objectives, the airfields at Kadena and Yomitan. By nightfall, the 10th Army had more than 60,000 men ashore, and the beachhead was now nine miles wide. But the Japanese were nowhere in sight. In fact, Okinawa's Japanese garrison had positioned itself well inland to avoid American naval gunfire, many concealed in the caves of the island's rocky landscape. The Japanese 32nd Army defending the island was 120,000 strong, with 70,000 of them being regular army troops. They were good, battle-experienced men, but the remaining 50,000 were a mix of naval troops and locally conscripted islanders who were poorly trained and inadequately equipped. Even so, the Japanese had plenty of artillery, and the terrain, without a doubt, favoured a defensive position. At 60 miles long, being an average eight miles wide, much of Okinawa was made up of hills covered with pine forests and thick undergrowth. Renowned for constructing strong and well-concealed defensive positions, the Japanese were ready and waiting for the enemy as the battle for Okinawa commenced. But by April 3rd, the Americans had reached the eastern shore, effectively splitting the Japanese forces on Okinawa in two. General Buckner quickly initiated phase two of his plan, the objective of which was to take the northern half of the island. The 6th Marine Division advanced towards the Motubu Peninsula on the western side of the island, where they encountered Japanese troops defending a natural fortress of wooden ridges and ravines. But by the 18th of April, the Marines had cleared the Motobu Peninsula. Most of the northern half of Okinawa was now in American hands. In the meantime, the Allied invasion fleet off Okinawa had come under a ferocious assault from the air. The Japanese High Command had assembled more than 2,000 aircraft on airfields in southern Japan and Formosa, today known as Taiwan to disrupt the invasion of Okinawa, and despite bombing raids on their bases by American B-29s and carrier-borne aircraft, in the weeks before Operation Iceberg, many were still ready for action. 
leading the Japanese air onslaught were aircraft packed with bombs and aviation fuel flown by young pilots on a one-way suicide mission. They were the kamikaze, which in Japanese means divine wind. In the 13th century, typhoons scattered and sank two Chinese fleets on their way to invade Japan. The Japanese called these storms the Divine Wind. Now the Japanese High Command hoped that another Divine Wind would scatter the American fleet off Okinawa. On April 6, 1945, the Japanese Operation Chrysanthemum began with massed kamikaze attacks on the Allied invasion fleet. Although fired up with fanatical devotion to their emperor, most of the kamikaze pilots were novices and Allied fighters managed to shoot dozens of them down well before they had the chance to do any damage. But there were plenty of kamikaze who did succeed in breaking through, and for two days, anti-aircraft gunners on board Allied warships fought desperately to knock them out of the sky. An incredible 13 American destroyers were badly damaged or sunk, and it was a threat the Allies needed to take very seriously indeed. In the next three months, hundreds more kamikaze pilots hurled their aircraft and themselves at Allied warships, and practically all of them, just as they had intended, lost their lives. By the time the fighting on Okinawa came to an end, the kamikazes had sunk 36 Allied vessels and badly damaged another 368. Most of the 4,907 American sailors killed and the 4,874 wounded during the invasion of Okinawa perished during kamikaze attacks. For the US Navy, these were grim statistics, while on Okinawa, the land battle was just beginning. The highest concentration of Japanese forces was to the south of the island, and on April 4th, General Buckner ordered the 24th Army Corps to advance in a southerly direction from the American beachhead. As the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions pushed on towards Shuri, Okinawa's ancient capital, they met fierce resistance from Japanese troops defending a position the Americans had christened Cactus Ridge. There was a bitter hand-to-hand -hand struggle for Cactus Ridge. By April 9th, the Japanese had been toppled from their vantage point, but at a high price, with 1,500 American casualties. But the way to Shuri was still barred by Japanese defenders along the Kakutsu Ridge, and the fierce fighting continued until superior American firepower forced the island's defenders to call off further attacks. Even so, Buckner's advance had stalled, and the fight for Okinawa was anything but over. Meanwhile, back in Europe, the British, Canadian and American armies were driving ever deeper into Germany after successfully crossing the Rhine in late March 1945. In contrast to the bloodletting in the Pacific, their casualties were light. Most German troops they encountered were keener to give up rather than fight. But during their advance, the Western Allies were uncovering the ghastly evidence of the Nazis' crimes against humanity. On April 4, 1945, troops belonging to Patton's 3rd U.S. Army overran the Ordruf labor camp near the town of Gotha. In the camp, they discovered piles of corpses, some covered with lime and others partially incinerated. 
These unfortunate souls had been prisoners that the fleeing SS guards considered too ill to walk and they had been shot before the camp was evacuated. News of the horrors at Ordruf quickly spread, and on April 12th, General Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe, visited the camp with General Patton and General Omar Bradley, commander of the 12th US Army Group, to see for themselves what they had been fighting for. But worse was still to come, and as advanced units of the 3rd US Army entered another much larger camp outside the city of Weimar at Buchenwald, despite the horror of the situation, they were at least able to liberate 21,000 sick and starving inmates. The British and Americans knew about Nazi concentration camps, but little had prepared them for the reality. After inspecting Ordruf, Eisenhower informed General George C. Marshall, the head of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, D.C., that what he had seen beggared description as he let the world know the truth about what Hitler and the Nazis had done. On April 12th, the famous CBS radio correspondent Edward R. Murrow visited Buchenwald and he too reported his findings, but over the airwaves to all who would listen. Buchenwald was not an extermination camp, but for the 238,000 prisoners from all over Europe and the Soviet Union who passed through its gates from July 1938 to April 1945, it was a place of terror and death. 56,000 inmates are believed to have perished in the camp. Eisenhower did all that he could to publicize the dreadful conditions inside Ordruf and Buchenwald, being of German ascendancy himself, he was determined to confront the German people with their collective responsibility for these appalling crimes. The Americans forced inhabitants from the district surrounding the camp to come and witness the atrocities committed in their name and walk past the piles of emaciated bodies awaiting cremation at the camp furnace. On Buchenwald's parade ground, the German civilians were also shown an appalling and truly bizarre collection of trophies collected by the SS. These included human organs in jars of formaldehyde, shrunken heads, and lampshades and book bindings made with skin from prisoners especially selected for their colorful tattoos. The horrors of the concentration camps continued to be revealed, but the liberation had come too late for so many inmates, and in the weeks that followed, thousands died as a result of their terrible suffering at the hands of their captors. However, while this human tragedy played itself out as the world looked on, the death of just one man was about to change the course of history. On April 12th, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, known to millions simply as FDR, the man responsible for bringing the Americans into the war, had died. Paralyzed with polio since his late 30s and under immense pressure as American's president since 1933, through the Great Depression and then the war, Roosevelt's health had been deteriorating for some time. At the Yalta Conference in the Crimea in February, Roosevelt had met Stalin and Churchill to discuss the post-war division of Germany, but his appearance had shocked everyone present. He was evidently a very sick man. On returning to the United States, the president addressed the US Congress. Although too ill to stand, he spoke while seated. We haven't won the wars yet. The main theme of his speech was his vision for the United Nations organization. He said, 
The Crimean Conference ought to spell the end of a system of unilateral action, the exclusive alliances, the spheres of influence, the balances of power, and all the other expedients that have been tried for centuries and have always failed. We propose to substitute for all these a universal organization in which all peace-loving nations will finally have a chance to join. It was a remarkable legacy for Roosevelt to leave to the world, and although very unwell, he continued to lead the Americans in the fight against Adolf Hitler and his axis of evil. At the end of March, Roosevelt travelled to Warm Springs, Georgia, to prepare for the International Conference in San Francisco, at which the United Nations organization would be created, but during April the 12th he complained of a terrible headache. Shortly after, Roosevelt suffered a massive brain hemorrhage and died within hours. He was 63 years old and had missed seeing his dedication to the Allied cause rewarded with the fall of Berlin and victory in Europe by only a matter of weeks. In the United States and amongst the Allies, news of Roosevelt's death was met with disbelief and grief. FDR had been in the White House for longer than any other American president. In 12 years, he had led the United States to economic prosperity, to the very threshold of victory over Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. All over the USA, flags were lowered for 30 days of official mourning. Hundreds of thousands of grateful Americans made the pilgrimage to gather along the railway line between Warm Springs, Georgia and Washington, D.C. to watch a funeral train bring Roosevelt's body back to the nation's capital. Even more people gathered together in Washington to line the streets as FDR's coffin was taken to lie in state in the Capitol building and his state funeral was one of the most emotional occasions in Washington's entire history. But there was still a war to be won, and America turned hopefully to the new president, 60-year-old ex-U.S. Senator Harry S. Truman, yet a relatively unknown figure on the international stage. Truman had taken on the mantle of the U.S. Commander-in-Chief just as the Second World War was about to enter its final and most dramatic stage. In Germany, the British Second Army was making rapid progress towards the Danish frontier and the Baltic, while the 12th US Army Group were busy completing operations around the Ruhr pocket. By April 21st, the fighting was over and 325,000 German soldiers filed patiently into American captivity. Overwhelmed by the huge number of men surrendering that required food and shelter, the Americans created makeshift prisons along the Rhine. But sadly, during the next days and weeks, due to the sheer enormity of the task, many hundreds of these men died as a result of their already poor state of health before their captors had a chance to care for them properly. What's more, tensions were now beginning to appear within the Allied camp. Winston Churchill and the British were in favour of pushing ahead to take Berlin before the Russians could get there, but Eisenhower and the Americans favoured a policy of crushing all further German armed resistance first. Rumours were abounding of a powerful Nazi defensive position that had been established in the German and Austrian Alps, manned by fanatical SS troops, and Eisenhower diverted a great deal of the American military effort southwards to neutralise this threat. On April 11th, leading units of the US 9th Army that had reached the River Elbe, the last major natural obstacle before Berlin, were ordered to halt. Mm -hmm. 
but the Russians were still forging ever onwards, displaying ruthless efficiency, with the Red Army thrusting aside the large number of German forces sent by Hitler to defend Hungary, and by April 13th, the Soviets had captured Vienna. In Berlin, where Hitler's chief of Nazi propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, was still celebrating news of Roosevelt's death with his Führer, hopes were beginning to grow that the alliance between the British, the Americans and the Soviets would now crumble. However, despite differences of opinion about what should happen after the war, all three of these major players were ready to end Hitler's reign of terror once and for all. On April 16th, Stalin's long-awaited offensive on the Oder-Neisse river line, 90 miles east of Berlin, began in earnest. The Russian Red Army had three main objectives. The first was to capture Berlin. The second was to seize any material and any remaining scientific personnel connected with the Nazi atom bomb program. And last but not least, to snatch as much German territory as possible in the process. The assault began with a shattering artillery bombardment as two and a half million Russians moved into position for the final offensive against Hitler and his Berlin hierarchy. One and a half million of these soldiers were under the orders of the Red Army's most experienced battlefield commanders, Marshal Zukov and Marshal Konev, who were given the task of storming Hitler's center of operations. They outnumbered German ground forces by nearly three to one, the artillery by four to one, and tanks and other armored fighting vehicles by nearly six to one. Joseph Stalin was well aware that there was fierce competition between the two marshals to get to Berlin first, and he had actually given Sukhov's first Belarusian front on the Oder line a head start, much to the annoyance of Konev, whose first Ukrainian front on the River Nice was some distance further away from the Nazi capital. But Zhukov did not have things all his own way, as directly in front of his troops were the Silau Heights, the most heavily defended sector of the German front line that lay 10 miles beyond the River Oder. After four days of extremely fierce and bloody fighting, the heights were finally cleared, while by April 19th, Konev's first Ukrainian front had managed to break free of the nice line, finding themselves advancing quickly through open country. As April 20th dawned, Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday, there was little for the Fuhrer to celebrate. Zukov and his men had made a rapid advance from the Silau Heights and were already shelling the center of Berlin with long-range artillery. As the day progressed, the Soviet forces enveloped the Nazi capital to the north and south and over the next 48 hours began to steadily tighten their grip on the city. The Russians were now taking charge, but during the night of April 21st, the Royal Air Force Mosquito Bombers made a final raid on Berlin. At precisely 8.30 a.m. the very next day, the Soviet commanders gave the order, open fire at the capital of fascist Germany. By April 23rd, Berlin had in effect been isolated by the Russians. For Adolf Hitler, now trapped in his Führer bunker, there was no possible escape. Realizing that Berlin was doomed, he declared his intention to remain there and take his own life. Nevertheless, the fighting for Berlin was far from over and Soviet casualties were continuing to mount despite the inevitability of the battle's outcome. There were some 45,000 troops defending the city, 
and despite being badly equipped and disorganized, there was still a sting in the tail. Some belonged to the Waffen SS, the combat arm of the SS only open to those classed by Hitler's racial purity regime as being true Aryans, while others were French volunteers from the Charlemagne division. Their ranks were reinforced by thousands of poorly armed members of the Volkssturm, conscripted males between the ages of 16 and 60 who were not already serving in the German Home Guard, as well as members and Hitler Youth Volunteers. A separate detachment of 2,000 Waffen-SS soldiers had been put in charge of defending the Führer bunker and the rest of the government district, but there was little even they could do against the Russian onslaught. As well as being outnumbered, the German defenders faced a massive artillery attack. The Russians were well equipped with Katyusha rockets, which were self-propelled from mobile launchers. These rockets, named after a popular Russian wartime song about a girl called Katyusha, could be devastating. The Soviet troops were quickly blasting their way into the center of Berlin. Their main target was the old German parliament building, the Reichstag. But across the entire city, there was fierce house-to-house -house and hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The fighting ebbed and flowed with each Red Army attack and German counter-offensive. However, in the heat and fury of combat, nobody was taking any prisoners on either side. The action was not only confined to Berlin. 80 miles to the southwest of the city, at the ancient town of Torgau on the River Elbe, the eastern and western allies had an historic meeting. The first contact was made between troops of the 9th US Army 69th Division and the 58th Guards Division in Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front on April 25th, which has gone down in history as Elbe Day. This was a perfect photo opportunity for a small army of American and Soviet journalists and cameramen who were brought together the next day to record the official meeting between the American and Russian soldiers as they shared a moment of celebration, friendship and exchanged gifts. However, despite the outward appearance of unity, the tensions between the Allies were growing. Immediately after the photos had been taken, the Americans returned to their side of the Elbe and stayed there. This was much against the wishes of General Bill Simpson, the 9th US Army commander who wanted to continue the push towards Berlin, but Eisenhower had already rejected this, electing to leave the way clear for the Russians. This was because when Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin had agreed the plans for restructuring post-war Europe at the Crimean Conference, Berlin would be located deep within the Soviet zone. There was literally nothing to be gained, and keeping US casualties to a minimum was obviously a major consideration, especially after the Americans' terrible losses at the Battle of the Bulge. Also, the risk of incurring casualties as a result of Soviet friendly fire in the chaos of the battle-torn streets of Berlin was simply not worth taking, so the Red Army continued its remorseless progress. By April 29th, the Russians were within a mile of the Führer bunker, and as the news reached Hitler, he was also told that the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini was dead. After attempting to escape to Switzerland with his mistress, Clara Petacci, Mussolini had been captured and the pair were executed, and their mutilated bodies put on display before the vengeful crowds. For Hitler, there was no escape, and rather than face the same fate as Mussolini, the Fuhrer took control of his ultimate destiny. He put his affairs in order, signed his last will and testament, and married his mistress, Ava Brown. 
Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich was over, and on April 30th, with the Russians getting ever closer, the newlyweds committed suicide, and afterwards their bodies were taken out of the Führer bunker and burnt by SS bodyguards in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. As 10,000 desperate German troops continued defending Berlin's battered government district to the last, on May 1st, the Reichstag, the most traditional symbol of German power, finally fell to the Soviets. While the Russian soldiers flew the red flag from its battered roof, Hitler's heir apparent, Joseph Goebbels, took drastic and tragic action, killing each of his six children before he and his wife committed suicide. Hitler had ordered Goebbels to flee if Berlin was captured, but for the first time, the Führer's most loyal supporter disobeyed the man he had devoted his life to serving. Things were by this time moving at a dramatic pace, and on May 2nd, the commander of the Berlin garrison, General Helmuth Weidling, capitulated to the Russians, and within hours, all the guns in the city had fallen silent. The Soviets took nearly half a million German prisoners, but there are no accurate figures for the many thousands of soldiers and civilians who perished. However, Eisenhower's determination to keep US troops out of the battle for Berlin proved to be well-founded, as the Red Army counted the cost. At least 81,000 Soviet soldiers were killed during the fighting in and around the city, while sustaining another 280,000 casualties. With the fighting over, the Russians also had the daunting task of organizing food supplies for the surviving civilian population and making the city habitable again. But paradoxically, while this was happening, many ordinary Soviet soldiers, motivated by revenge and often fired up by alcohol, rampaged through Berlin, committing atrocities equally as appalling as those associated with the Nazi regime. While the promise of peace was imminent in Europe and the war still raged on in the Pacific, news that the Japanese were at last being brought to a standstill reached the West. As the Germans capitulated to the Russians on May 2nd, British and Indian troops completed their advance through central Burma and captured the capital Rangoon with just a matter of hours to spare before the monsoon rains began. As the world would see in the months ahead, the Japanese refusal to contemplate surrender slowed Allied progress considerably. However, despite the fighting continuing in Burma for another three months, the campaign was effectively over with the fall of Rangoon. The Japanese mainland was also being attacked with little opposition, and in the Philippines, American troops led by General Douglas MacArthur had managed to contain more than 200,000 Japanese soldiers on the islands of Mindanao and Luzon. Again, resistance was fierce as the Japanese fought bitterly to hang on to their mountain strongholds. But on June 26, MacArthur was finally able to declare that the Philippines campaign was over. Ironically, it was also late June 22, to be precise, that the Okinawa campaign was also declared at an end. It had lasted a gruelling 87 days, and more than 100,000 Japanese soldiers had perished in the fighting, with at least another 7,000, mostly local conscripts, taken prisoner. A further 100,000 Okinawan civilians are also thought to have died during the fighting. Although victorious, the Americans paid a huge price, suffering more than 50,000 casualties, with at least 12,000 fatalities. The Japanese had served notice that concluding the fighting in the Pacific, despite events in Europe, was going to take all the Allies' resolve to see through. It was a chilling prospect for the American military planners, considering an amphibious assault on Japan, as they began to calculate what the losses were likely to be. 
based on the 30% casualties experienced by the US 10th Army on Okinawa, a conservative estimate would suggest that a staggering 300,000 Americans would be killed or injured. Finding a way forward would demand a new approach to warfare. But as we return to the European theatre of war, the early days of May 1945 certainly provided the Allies with much to celebrate. The German command to carry out at once, and without argument or comment, all further orders that will be issued by the Allied powers on any subject. With fighting in Italy and in Berlin all coming to an end on May 2nd, events quickly gathered momentum. <clears throat> Just 48 hours later came the unconditional surrender of all German forces in Northwest Europe, and it was given to British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery in a tent on the Lundberg Heath. Everything was now in place for the war in Europe to be concluded. And early on May 7th, the German representatives, General Jodl and Field Marshal Keitel, signed the instrument of final unconditional surrender at Eisenhower's headquarters at Rheims in France. It was agreed that at 23.01 hours Central European time on May 8th, all forces under German control would stop fighting. At last, the news that the world had been waiting for since 1939 was ready to be announced. Plans were put in place for Victory in Europe Day to be celebrated on May 9th. However, good news travels fast because by the 8th, rumours of the imminent end to the fighting in Europe prompted celebrations in Great Britain, on the streets of London and throughout the nation. Fueled by the tide of public excitement, at 3pm, Prime Minister Winston Churchill once more broadcast to the British people, Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, but in the interests of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front. It was an incredible day, and the euphoria out on the streets was contagious. From nowhere, celebratory teas were mustered as entire communities joined together and Winston Churchill went to Buckingham Palace to take his place alongside the royal family who had come out onto the balcony to acknowledge the cheers of the sea of people gathered all around. Almost five years to the day when Churchill had taken on the challenging role of Prime Minister back in 1940, this moment on the very first VE Day has been described by many as having been Winston's finest hour. However, it wasn't only Winston Churchill and the people of Britain celebrating the news of Hitler's demise and the fall of the Nazis. Across the Atlantic, the Americans, despite continuing to fight a war of attrition with the Japanese, took time out to enjoy the occasion. For Harry S. Truman, May 8th and the victory it represented was dedicated to the memory of his predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had done so much to rid the world of tyranny. Still in mourning for their recently passed president, American flags remained at half-mast, but it was nonetheless a time for looking forward with hope to a new era, and ironically, it also happened to be President Truman's 61st birthday. But while to this day, Britain and America celebrate VE Day on May 8th, the Russians honour the 9th, a date that had originally been set aside by the Allies all those years ago. For the Soviet people, VE Day is still both a celebration of great joy and intense sorrow. 
At least 20 million Russian citizens had perished since the 22nd of June 1941, the day that the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union, laying waste to entire cities, towns and villages which had been left in ruins and the terrible losses have never been forgotten. Across Europe, nations were liberated, from the British Channel Islands to the Greek islands in the Aegean Sea. Dunkirk, St. Nazaire and La Rochelle all gained their freedom, as did Norway and Denmark. Even the strip of territory stretching from the Western Netherlands to Czechoslovakia, still under Nazi control, was handed back as German troops capitulated to local Allied forces, fleeing west wherever possible to avoid capture by the vengeful Soviets. The final act in the destruction of Nazi Germany took place on the 23rd of May, when British troops arrested Admiral Donitz at his Flensburg headquarters near the Danish border. From this point onwards, the major Allied powers, Great Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union and France ruled supreme over Hitler's now disbanded German Empire, but the question of what next needed a definitive answer. Always eloquent in his VE Day broadcast, Churchill had expressed what the rest of the world was thinking. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, but let us not forget for a moment the toil and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, in all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. Yet it was Harry S. Truman who had the technology within his grasp to force the Japanese to surrender, and after just weeks in office, the responsibility for launching a nuclear attack on Japan rested very firmly on the new president's shoulders.
As the Western world celebrated peace in Europe and the overthrow of Adolf Hitler's regime, the war continued to rage in the Pacific and there was still no end in sight for the battles of the Far East. For the Japanese, to surrender was a fate worse than death, and driven by ancient traditions, they were determined to fight to the very last man. As Allied casualties continued to rise and the United States prepared for their invasion of the Japanese home islands, there were soon grave decisions to be made, and in the final stage of the global conflict, steps would be taken to defeat the eastern enemy, which would transform the face of war forever. This last chapter brings us to the conclusion of a conflict which would prove to be the most destructive in the history of mankind. And the events of July to September 1945 would not only mark the end of the Second World War, but the beginning of a brave and dangerous new world. On July 17, 1945, the leaders of the victorious nations met in Potsdam, just a few miles west of Berlin, to discuss the future of post-war Germany. Among those attending was the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, whose future in office, as I previously mentioned, was by now far from assured. Not long after VE Day, the British wartime coalition had broken up a general election would soon decide whether Churchill was re-elected as Prime Minister or replaced by the Labour leader Clement Attlee. The Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin also attended the Potsdam Conference and was by now reaping the rewards of Germany's defeat as he laid claim to territory in Central Europe. And there was also a new face in the political arena, Harry S. Truman. Truman had taken the place of the American president Franklin D. Roosevelt after his death in April and would prove to be considerably less sympathetic towards the communists than his predecessor. With political turmoil looming on the horizon, these three men had much to contemplate. But despite their differences, they still shared a common goal to ensure that Germany should never wage war again. With this in mind, during the Potsdam Conference, it was agreed that Germany should be split into four occupation zones. What eventually became known as West Germany would be divided between Britain, America and France, whereas East Germany would be occupied by the Soviets. The capital, Berlin, which was within the Eastern Soviet sector, would also be divided between the Allies, with the United States and Great Britain controlling the West and Russians controlling the East. The Soviet soldiers had set about occupying Berlin after their victory in May, but by July they were joined by the first American, British and French occupation troops as they moved into the western sectors of the city. Those who observed Berlin in the aftermath of the war were taken aback by the state of the capital, where they found much of the population suffering from starvation and attempting to live amongst the rubble of devastated buildings. Almost all transport in and out of Berlin was now inoperative, and adding to the problem of food shortages, bombed-out sewers had contaminated the city's water supplies. The Allied aerial attacks of the past few years had clearly taken their toll, 
and combined with the large artillery pounding from the Soviets during the Battle of Berlin, up to a third of the city had been destroyed. In early July, Churchill was among those who witnessed the damage to the city firsthand. As he walked through the devastated streets, passing the wrecked government buildings, Churchill was clearly moved by what he saw, and later said that his hate for the Germans had died along with their surrender. But despite any sympathy Churchill may have had for the German population, the Allied leaders were eager to deal justice to those responsible for the Nazi regime and its crimes. Hitler's war of aggression had led to an immense loss of life, with over 20 million dead in the Soviet Union alone. Tragically, the greater proportion of war casualties in Russia and most European nations had been civilian rather than military. And as the end of the war approached, the Allies began to discover the true horror of how so many people had died. During the advance on Berlin, American and Soviet commanders had discovered concentration camps filled with victims from all over Europe and Russia. In some camps, none of the inmates had been left alive and only piles of bodies remained. In others, those who had survived the horrors of their internment were severely malnourished and in a desperate state. It was soon evident that not thousands, but millions of people had been systematically murdered by the Nazis, including Soviet civilians, soldiers, ethnic Poles, gypsies, and those who had opposed the Nazi regime. Above all, the Nazis had targeted the Jews, and around two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population had been killed in what would later be called the Holocaust. As the war crimes mounted, at Potsdam, it was decided that an international military tribunal on behalf of the American, British, Russian and French governments should be formed. This body would conduct the most famous of all war crime trials at Nuremberg, a town renowned for hosting Nazi rallies and considered the ceremonial birthplace of the party. It was felt that this was a fitting place to mark the Nazi symbolic demise and the trial to punish the major war criminals of the European Axis countries would at least see some justice served for the horrors of Hitler's unforgiving regime. Among the highest ranking Nazi officials sentenced at Nuremberg was Hermann Göring, the commander of the Luftwaffe and second in command to Adolf Hitler. He was sentenced to death for being a leading political and military aggressor in the war and for his role in the extermination of the Jews. But Goering would thwart the Nuremberg judges when he committed suicide the night before his public hanging. Others to be sentenced at Nuremberg were Rudolf Hess, who'd been Hitler's deputy before he was captured in Britain in 1941. Hess was given a life sentence and would remain in Spandau Prison, Berlin, for the remainder of his days, dying allegedly by suicide August 1987. Karl Donitz, the initiator of the U-boat campaign and president of Nazi Germany in the days after Hitler's suicide, was given a 10-year sentence and Wilhelm Keitel, the head of the Wehrmacht, was sentenced to death by hanging. 
Many of the doctors who had performed medical experiments in Nazi concentration camps were also sentenced at Nuremberg. But as justice was dealt out to the Nazis, the Allies understood the Second World War was far from over, and although Nazi Germany was now defeated, their allies, the Japanese, were still at large. The so-called Empire of the Rising Sun had begun the war with the West back in December 1941, when they bombed the American naval base at the now legendary Pearl Harbor, and their conquests across Southeast Asia and the islands of the Pacific had been as every bit as successful as the German advance across Western Europe. But as American naval forces recovered their strength, bit by bit, the Allies had begun to oust the enemy from their conquered terrain. From New Guinea to the Philippines, the Japanese were soon fighting defensive battles, and by the summer of 1944, the island-hopping campaign of Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander-in-chief of the US Pacific Fleet, had brought Allied forces to the Mariana Islands and closer than ever to Japanese home territory. Throughout the spring of 1945, the drive towards enemy home territory continued, and American Joint Chiefs of Staff began to discuss the final invasion plans for Japan, codenamed Operation Downfall. Japan was an archipelago made up of thousands of mountainous and volcanic islands, which made its invasion a daunting prospect. Of the four main islands, Honshu, Hokkaido, Kyushu, and Shikoku, there were few areas suitable for invasion. Only the beaches on the Kanto plain of Honshu, southwest and southeast of Tokyo, and the beaches of Kyushu presented suitable attack zones. The Allies decided that a two-stage invasion should be launched, the first of which, codenamed Operation Olympic, would attack southern Kyushu. After building air bases here, cover would then be provided for the next step, Operation Coronet, which was the attack on Tokyo Bay on Honshu. Operation Olympic was scheduled for November 1st. The combined naval armada would be the largest ever assembled in the history of warfare. 14 US divisions were scheduled to take part in the initial landings, and once the invasion of Honshu was underway, 25 divisions would be involved. The main concern for the Americans was the potential for huge casualty rates. The Japanese had demonstrated that they were willing to fight to the death if necessary, and there were also fears of biological warfare, which the Japanese had used during their war with China. It was estimated that there could be over a million US casualties during the attack, and in April 1945, the extremes to which the Japanese would go to protect their homeland had taken an even more sinister turn. The heavily fortified island of Okinawa, which lay 340 miles from Japan, was to be used as a staging post in the invasion of Honshu, and on April 1st, British and American ships delivered Marine and Army divisions to its shores. But as the Marines struggled to root out the enemy, the Allied invasion force was to encounter Japan's most lethal weapon. The Japanese had turned to the ancient myth of the kamikaze to save their empire, and had set in motion their last great attack, Operation Chrysanthemum. Wave after wave of pilots plunged towards the Allied ships and to their deaths. In the next
next three months, 36 Allied vessels were sunk and hundreds more were damaged while the battle to wrestle Okinawa from the enemy continued. Although the Allies finally prevailed and won the bitter struggle, by the time the campaign was over on June 22nd, there were more than 50,000 American casualties, with at least 12,000 fatalities. Even the mission's commander, General Buckner, had been killed. In the first six months of 1945, U.S. casualties in the Pacific had exceeded those suffered during the previous three years put together and put Allied commanders in no doubt that any attempt at invading the home islands would indeed lead to not thousands, but possibly millions of casualties. But despite Allied convictions that Japanese military and civilians alike would fight to the bitter end to defend their homeland, by the summer of 1945, many people in Japan were desperate for peace. Since February, over 60 cities around the country had been bombarded by LeMay's terror attacks and Tokyo was in ruins. The Diet Building, where the Japanese government gathered, was soon one of the few structures left standing. As the death toll rose and industries vital to the Japanese war effort were destroyed, the situation in the country became desperate. Millions of people began to flee from the cities and those that stayed faced a dismal existence. In addition to the bomb attacks, General LeMay had also launched Operation Starvation, in which vital water routes and ports were mined to disrupt enemy shipping. Before long, there were desperate fuel and food shortages, and wildlife deteriorated in the home islands. For the first time, Japanese civilians began to turn against the military. Across the country, people called for peace, desperate to end the war, as the American bombers continued to destroy everything in their path. Changes in Japanese leadership also began to reflect the country's hopes for peace. The warmongering Prime Minister Tojo, who had led Japan into war in 1941, had been forced to resign after the fall of Saipan in the summer of 1944. His replacement, Kuniaki Koiso, was in office for less than nine months, and after his fall from government in April 1945, Baron Kantaro Suzuki had been elected to govern the country. Prime Minister Suzuki was a retired admiral and an aged hero of the Russo-Japanese War, and unlike the more militant members of the government, he did not believe that his country should go down fighting. His presence in government was a clear indication that the peace party was prevailing in Japan, and by now, even the Japanese emperor Hirohito began to press for concrete plans to end the war, realizing that his empire had no hope of surviving against the American onslaught. As the conflict in Europe drew to a close in May 1945, the call for peace became more urgent than ever as the full weight of American forces were now focused on the Pacific. The aim of Prime Minister Suzuki's cabinet was to secure any peace term short of an unconditional surrender, and to do this, Suzuki turned to an unlikely ally. Way back in April 1941, Japan had signed a neutrality pact with Russia, and although the Japanese were also bound to Nazi Germany, after signing the Tripartite Pact, they had made the decision not to join Hitler when he began his war on the Soviets in June 1941. With the agreement with Russia still standing in 1945, the Japanese cabinet hoped that the Soviets could act as mediators for a negotiated surrender with the Allies. 
Suzuki and his officials decided to send Prince Fumimaro Konoe to Moscow to head the peace delegation. Konoe had tried desperately to prevent Japan from going to war with America in the first place, and it was hoped that he could now somehow secure a peaceful future for his country. However, the Japanese had no idea that Stalin had already made an agreement with the British and Americans concerning the future of Japan. During the Yalta Conference in February 45, with little consideration of the treaty made with the Japanese four years earlier, the Soviet leader agreed to participate in the war against Imperial Japan three months after the defeat of Nazi Germany. In return, he was promised attractive territorial concessions, including Japanese-occupied Manchuria, the Kuril Islands, and Port Arthur in Korea, which were all beneath the Japanese sphere of influence. It's hardly surprising, therefore, that when Suzuki's delegates contacted the Soviets to negotiate peace, they were met with silence from Moscow, and soon fears began to grow that the Soviets could pose as much of a threat as the Americans. On the day the Potsdam Conference commenced on July 17, US and British warships fired 200,000 tons of shells into the coastal area northeast of Tokyo as the build-up to invasion continued. Soon after, the Soviet Union recalled all embassy staff and families from Japan, hinting that they also intended to attack. The future was looking decidedly bleak for the land of the rising sun. But there was soon another unexpected twist in the tangled intricacies of world politics, as Truman and Churchill became increasingly concerned with what appeared to be aggressive expansionism on the part of the Soviets. By July, the Red Army controlled the Baltic states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania, and refugees fearing a communist takeover were fleeing in their millions. Contrary to agreements that had been made at Yalta in February, Stalin had also set up a communist government in Poland. The Soviet leader defended his actions, insisting his control of Eastern Europe was a defensive measure against possible future attack. But as communist influence grew in Europe, America and Great Britain were beginning to fear that the Japanese were the least of their worries. Truman harbored deep suspicions of the communists and was anxious that in East Asia, as elsewhere, Russia should make as little headway as possible. As far as the American president was concerned, the less the Soviet Union was involved in the last stages of the war, the better, and it was with great relief that he received news that there might be an alternative to Russia's involvement. This ray of hope was the Manhattan Project, a secret US scheme to develop Albert Einstein's research in nuclear fission. Scientists had been quietly developing Einstein's theories at Chicago University, and on July 16th, a breakthrough was made. In New Mexico, scientists successfully tested the deadliest and most powerful weapon on Earth, the atom bomb, and with this weapon at their fingertips, the Americans realized they could shorten the war and reduce American casualties without the aid of the communists. As Truman began to make all attempts to exclude the Soviet Union as an invading force, the race for Japan was on. At 20th Air Force headquarters in the Marianas, Curtis LeMay and his staff worked around the clock to devise a plan for the use of the new top-secret weapon against the enemy. The Soviets, in the meantime, were gathering forces on the border with Manchuria in southeast China, in 
preparation for their agreed invasion of Japanese territory, scheduled for August 8th, exactly three months after the surrender of Nazi Germany. As tensions mounted back in Potsdam, there were sudden changes in the political arena. Winston Churchill had left the conference on July 25th to hear the outcome of the British election, but he had not been re-elected. Clement Attlee now returned to Germany in his place as the new British Prime Minister and to join Truman and Stalin in the final decision-making of the war. Together, they made a final plea for Japan to surrender in the Potsdam Declaration on July 26th. Allied terms were that those responsible for the policies that had led to war were to be forever eliminated, the war criminals should be punished and Japan occupied. Back in Japan, Suzuki still waiting and hoping for a response from the Soviet Union to their pleas for a peace agreement gave a seemingly inscrutable reply, perhaps due in some part to the ambiguities of the Japanese language. For the Allies, this was a final gesture of defiance, and on August 6, 1945, the history of warfare was changed forever. Truman ordered the atom bomb to be loaded onto a B-29 plane named after the pilot's mother, Enola Gay. It took off from the runway on the island of Tinian and set off for its target, an important military centre called Hiroshima with a civilian population of over 300,000. It was a calm, sunny Monday morning, and the city was bustling with activity when at 8.15 a.m. the bomb was dropped. The devastation spread over four square miles, killing 30% of the population instantly. Humans and buildings alike disintegrated in the explosion, and the firestorm that ensued claimed many more lives. All that was left of Hiroshima by the time the smoke had cleared was a wasteland of flattened streets, many of its inhabitants now nothing but literally shadows, burnt into crumbling walls by the blast of white light. Four hours after the attack, the Japanese government didn't know what had happened, and were only given some indication when a plane was dispatched to survey the city. A huge cloud of smoke was still rising above Hiroshima, but the true horror of the situation was only just beginning. The Japanese soon realised that the death toll was rising as survivors began dying from radiation sickness. While Japan reeled from the attack, President Truman made the announcement that the atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima and sternly warned if the Japanese do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on Earth.
Two days after the attack on Hiroshima, the Soviets began to storm across the border into Manchuria on August 8, ending all hopes the Americans had of keeping the Soviets out of the Pacific theater. But Tokyo still failed to respond to the call for an unconditional surrender, and on August 9th, Truman carried out his threat by dropping yet another bomb on Japan, this time on the city of Nagasaki. As another city crumbled into ruin, the Japanese government and the emperor realized they no longer commanded the fate of their country. Faced with further nuclear attacks, Emperor Hirohito was forced to put aside any hopes of an honorable end to the war. The unendurable must be endured, he announced, and finally at midday on August 15, 1945, Japan accepted the Potsdam Declaration and agreed to unconditional surrender. One day later, President Truman made the speech that the world had been waiting for. In reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th, I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. When the news of surrender arrived, a surge of relief swept across the American forces who'd been battling against Japan for almost four years. The bloodshed was finally at an end and the Pacific War was over. On August 30th, US troops of the 6th Marine Division landed on a beach south of Tokyo, marking the beginning of America's occupation of Japan. As US command was firmly established, the stars and stripes were triumphantly raised over the Japanese homeland. Later that same day, the commander of US forces in the Southwest Pacific Theater, General Douglas MacArthur, flew into Atsugi Airfield in Tokyo and prepared to take control over the conquered empire. On the morning of September 2nd, the Japanese delegation boarded the U.S. battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay to make the unconditional surrender official. MacArthur, who was to take on the role of new Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Japan, directed the ceremony, which marked the end of the Pacific conflict, and his speech to the onlookers reflected the hopes of millions of people around the world finally peace would be restored. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. Representing Emperor Hirohito, the Japanese Foreign Minister Shigemitsu formally surrendered for his country and committed Japan to the complete disarmament and surrender of all military forces. And when all the nations that had taken part in the Pacific battles had signed the document, MacArthur drew the war to a poignant close by saying, let us pray that peace be now restored to the world. pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. The Second World War officially came to an end at eight minutes past nine on September 2nd, 1945. Across the Pacific and Southeast Asia, the Japanese now laid down their arms. On September 4th, Imperial forces surrendered on Wake Island, three years and four months after the Americans had been driven from its shores. In Malaya and throughout Southeast Asia Command, British Commonwealth forces accepted the surrender of the Japanese troops, and soon the Union Jack was flying proudly over the British colonial city of Singapore once more, almost four years after its invasion. 
In the Philippines, the once known Tiger of Malaya, General Yamashita, surrendered the remainder of his army to General Jonathan Wainwright, who had led the battle to defend the island nation back in 1942. The general had been held in prison camps since surrendering to the enemy 40 months earlier. At the moment to deal justice to the man responsible for so many American and Filipino deaths had come not a moment too soon for Wainwright. Just as the Nuremberg trials had judged those in Nazi Germany, those deemed responsible for the war in the Far East would be punished for their part in the bloodshed. Along with Yamashita, the wartime Premier General Tojo, who had been so eager to lead his country into battle against the West, would be given a harsh judgment and sentenced to death for his crimes. Meanwhile, as all dreams of empire building gradually disappeared, the Japanese would learn to live alongside the Americans as the occupation of their country began. Japan would now evolve into a new nation where foreigners infiltrated every walk of life and ancient laws and customs were adapted to suit a very different existence. Although many years of struggle lay ahead as the horrors of war slowly started to fade away, Japan, like Germany, would emerge transformed from the ruins of conflict. The Second World War had raged for six bitter years and claimed millions of lives from Europe to Asia and beyond. But as it ended, humanity could finally hope for a better future as the dawn of a new era in world history was about to begin. Author's Note We now live in times of different conflicts, the global threat of suicide bombers and terrorism at its worst. Limited military activity appears mostly to be afflicted by non-manned drones and missiles, war by remote control. I do hope that the history of World War II is never repeated and there is never the threat of nuclear bombing again. There are, however, a lot of these particularly devastating weapons in the world's arsenal and it takes the action of just a few unstable minds to press a few buttons. In the alleged words of Mark Twain, history never repeats itself, but sometimes it rhymes.